Murder in Melbourne by Dulcie Gray. Richard Quayle is flying into Melbourne to ask his long-term girlfriend Anna Matheson to marry him. They had parted on less than amicable terms four months earlier, as Anna wanted to be married and Richard was happy with their relationship as it was. He is a little unsure of his reception, apprehensive that Anna had decided she could live without him during their hiatus. Anna doesn't answer the telephone, and Richard goes to her hotel room to find the door unlocked and Anna on the bed, dead for some hours. We present Richard Herndl as Richard Quayle, with Mary Wimbush, Beverly Dunn, Philip Lever, and Michael Turner in Murder in Melbourne, an adaptation for radio by Dulcie Gray of her own novel. Murder in Melbourne. My name is Richard Quayle. I'm English, though I've lived in Australia most of my life. I'm telling you this story because I want to get it off my chest. Tomorrow I leave Australia to take a job in South Africa. And I want to put the past behind me, once and for all. I'm going to tell it to you in as much detail as I can remember. It all started, as far as I'm concerned, on that day two years ago, when I tried to telephone my girlfriend, Anna Matheson, to say that I was coming to see her in Melbourne. Hello? Hello, is that the Buwara Hotel? Yes. Richard Quayle here, speaking from Sydney. Would you put me through to Miss Anna Matheson, please? One moment. Hello? I asked you to put me through to Miss Matheson's room. She's not answering. Oh, well, go on trying, will you? She's not answering, sir. Okay, okay, I'll wait. I never got through. An hour later, I was at Sydney Airport. Just before 5.30 p.m., I'd settled myself in the plane due to arrive in Melbourne at 7.35. I was really excited at the thought of seeing Anna again. I'd kept my side of the bargain. I hadn't written or tried to see her for four months. I wonder what she'll say when I ask her to marry me, I thought. <laughs> Probably laugh at me. After all, we've been living together for years. She seemed pretty keen on the idea when I last saw her then. Then the air hostess came towards me. Dinner, sir? Yes, please, and a large brandy and ginger ale. Certainly, sir. Uh, look oh, out. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. Oh, that's all right, sister. Dinner for me, too, and uh, I'll have a double whiskey and water. A very fat man squeezed past the air hostess and sat next to me. I'd noticed him earlier, talking to a little wizened guy a few seats ahead of me. He was about 40, broad shoulders, tall, fat as a pig, but very powerfully built. He wore glasses, had a tough red face, and his hair was dark and crew cut. I rather liked him. Uh, well, my name's Guy Brooks. What's yours? Richard Quayle. Not Australian, are you? I was born in England, but I emigrated to Australia in my teens. I live in Sydney. Yeah, me too. Going to Melbourne on business? Uh-uh. Pleasure. What <laughs> a business for me. My father runs a real estate business in Melbourne and another in Sydney. He's in Europe just now, and I'm acting as his stand-in. <laughs> well, that's an odd expression for a businessman to use. My girlfriend is an actress, and she talks like that. Oh, I've had several actress girlfriends. <laughs> <laughs> Businessmen get around, you know. <laughs> what do you do? Pilot on Aussie. Pilot in the war, I suppose. Yes, that's right. I joined up when I was 17. Did my stint and then found out that I wasn't exactly cut out for anything else when the war was over. I'm looking around now for something to do when my retirement comes up. We all of us plan for that. <laughs> We have a pretty tough medical every six months, and there's always a day when we may fail it. Uh, do you know many people in Melbourne? Not many. Haven't been there too often. Just the girlfriend, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, but you did say you were going over for pleasure. That's right, I did. Well, where are you staying? At the Meteor. Oh, it's a nice pub. Clean as a whistle and excellent service. Well, if you feel like it, give me a ring any time. I'll be glad to see you. Uh, here's my card. Oh, yeah. Thanks. G.M. Brooks, the shutter, Torak Road. I may take you up on that. Or do that. Do that, please. I checked in at the meteor and asked the porter if there were any messages. He said there were none, and a snotty little page took me to my room on the first floor. It was a decent room, 
clean and homely, as Brooks had said, with a bathroom off to the left. I went straight to the telephone. Get me the Buona Hotel and hurry. Hello? Hello, is that the Buona Hotel? Yes, sir. Oh, put me through to Miss Anna Matheson, will you? Very good, sir. Well, go on trying, will you? But it was no use. She didn't answer. I took a taxi to the Buona and told the driver to step on it. I was definitely worried now. It was dark by this time with a hot, gusty wind. I couldn't see where we were going, but noticed that at one point we crossed the Yarrow River. The hotel was in a small back street, and frankly, it was a dump. The foyer was badly lit and depressing in the extreme. What was Anna doing living in a place like this? She wasn't pressed for money. The seedy-looking porter was cleaning his nails as I went in, and he went right ahead cleaning them. The faded blonde at the reception desk smiled grimly. Do something for you? Oh, my name is Richard Quayle. I want to see Miss Matheson, please. She's expecting me. Well, you'd better go on up, then. Room 32, third floor. Lift to the left. The number, 32, was fixed in white plastic on the black door, and a do-not-disturb sign was hanging on the door handle. I knocked. No answer. The door was slightly ajar, so I pushed it. The room was in darkness, except for the glow from an electric fire. I groped for the light switch and turned on the light. Anna was lying face downward on the bed, fully clothed. Anna, I said. Anna, wake up. It's Richard. I shook her gently. She rolled onto her back as I shook her. She was dead. I looked at her unbelievingly and took her in my arms. There was a sudden violent crash behind me and I leapt to my feet, scared out of my wits. The window curtains, which were not drawn, billowed away from the open window and I realized that a gust of wind had slammed the bedroom door. I laid Anna gently back on the pillow and kissed her hair. Then I looked round the room. It was the hell of a room, sordid in the extreme, but nothing seemed out of place. Anna's makeup, brush and comb, and a bottle of scent I had given her stood tidily on the cheap dressing table. Her dressing gown was draped neatly over a chair. The wardrobe door was open and the clothes were hanging undisturbed. I felt I wanted to howl like a child. I went to the window and looked out. I couldn't see much. On the other side of the street, a neon sign shone out. Sunshine Cafe, it said. And above the sign, in a room evidently on the first floor, the lights were suddenly switched off. It was then that I noticed the smell in the room. I suppose I'd been too strung up to notice it before. It was a faint but persistent smell of mold. But there was something odd about it. I picked up the telephone. When the girl answered, I said, get me a doctor, Miss Matheson is dead. The girl gasped and said she'd get the manager. No, get a doctor, I shouted, but she cut me off. The manager arrived almost at once, a nervous little Italian with a drawn, swarthy face and large ears. I am the manager. Who are you? What do you do here? I'm Miss Matheson's fiancée. I've just flown in from Sydney to see her and found her dead. Yes, Morta. What for she want to die here? We have the difficult times, my wife and I, and just when things are beginning to look good, this woman comes to die here. You Albergo, no good for the hotel. You'd better ring for a doctor, hadn't you? Why is she not die somewhere else? Ring for a doctor, damn you! What's the matter with this place, for God's sake? I see a doctor, I get one. Pronto, pronto, pronto. Ah, get me Dr. Manton, Phyllis. Tell him to come to room 32. Grazie tanto. Have you got telephones in all the rooms? No, only in two. This one and the one next door. They're all part of the one suite. This room connects with the bathroom next door. You see that room by the wardrobe? Yes. Through there is another bedroom. This room here used to be the sitting room. Anyone there now? Yes. Who? He lives here, but he's away now. What's his name? Leonard. Mr. Leonard. What sort of a chap is he? Oh, he's a traveller. A big man. My wife likes him, Molto Bene, very much. All the women like him. When did he go away? This morning, I think. Well, has he been here long? This time? Oh, four months. Four months? Are you sure? My gentleman, of course I'm sure. It was exactly four months since Anna had left me in Sydney to come to Melbourne. Had she come to see this man, Leonard? 
Was that why I was not to write or phone her? It certainly began to look like it. Though I couldn't believe it, really. The doctor soon arrived and examined Anna. I stood looking out of the window. So what do you think, Dr. Manton? Oh, I don't like the look of it. She's a big, healthy-looking girl. But this young man says she's 27. Well, if she has taken her own life, the police must be in on it. Um, the sooner no. the better. But she couldn't have taken her own life. She wasn't the type. Well, not everyone who commits suicide has suicidal tendencies, you know. It's a very popular misconception. Yeah, she may have been the situation which caused her to despair, a, a dilemma from which she saw no escape and therefore no hope. Yes, but she knew I was coming to see her today. So why today of all days? Mm. Have you ever known her to threaten to kill herself before? Never. Mm. Uh, give me police headquarters, FJ-999. Oh, no police here, Dr. Manton. I know which my hotel reputation ruined. I don't want mine ruined either. Uh. Hello? Uh, Dr. Manton here. Give me D-24. Now, uh, put me through to homicide, please. It was a lie, of course. I mean about her never threatening to kill herself. Our affair hadn't been an easy one all the way through. Anna had wanted marriage, and I was against it. I'd had marriage in a big way with my first wife, and I wasn't looking for more. Within ten minutes, the police arrived, two tall and powerful men. The senior detective was called Transom, and the other man, uh, Brown, I think. They took a story from the manager first and wrote it down. Anna had come to live here four months ago, he said. She seemed to have plenty of money, she was well-liked, very kind, but she wasn't happy. She was good friends with Mr. Leonard from next door. The manager looked at me out of the corner of his eyes as he said this, and I could have kicked him. Then they took a statement from Dr. Manton. Pupils of the eyes dilated. Time of death extremely uncertain. Oh, the fire was on and the window open when Quayle arrived. Hmm, strange. Time of death anything from 12 to 20 hours ago. No, he couldn't put it more exactly. The doctor went. And Transom told Brown to take possession of Anna's tooth glass or any container she could have drunk from and to search the place for sleeping pills, patent medicine and so on. Then he turned to me. I told him all I knew, and also gave him Anna's mother's address in Adelaide. Her father is dead. Her father, dead. Oh, by the way, Mr. Quayle, you'd uh, better stick around Melbourne for a bit. You'll be wanted at the inquest. When will that be? Oh, it all depends on a post-mortem. Might be a matter of days, maybe a few weeks. A few weeks? I thought they were always held at once. Did you? Yeah, then you thought wrong. You'd better get on to Aussie and explain. Hmm? Yes, yes, I will. Now, why don't you cut along? We've, uh, we've got to get your girlfriend out of here. Where... Where will you be taking her? I'm afraid she'll have to go to the mortuary, son. I took a last look at Anna. She looked very beautiful. Very peaceful. Very young. I got the hell out of it. I had a bad night, got up early and tried to shave with shaking hands. It was pouring with rain. I couldn't eat breakfast. I was thinking about Anna all the time. I couldn't help wondering if I were responsible for her death and the thought that she might have committed suicide because of me was nearly driving me out of my mind. Brooks, the fat man on the aircraft, rang soon after breakfast and asked me to lunch. I accepted because, well, I didn't know what I was going to do with myself all day. Then there was a knock at the door. And when I went to it, there were two strange men outside. We're from Homicide. My name's Peter, this is Sergeant Codner. Oh, come in, please. Thanks. We'd like to go over your story again, if you don't mind. Why? Transom wrote down everything I said. I have nothing to add. Last night, there was a chance Miss Matheson died a natural death, or at the worst, committed suicide. Today, we have every reason to believe it was murder. Murder? But how could it be murder? She was poisoned with strychnine. Strychnine? But that just doesn't make sense. I mean, who would want to murder a sweet girl like Anna? That's what we're here to find out, sir. Well, will you have a drink? No, thanks. Uh, no, thanks. Do you mind if I do? Yeah, go ahead. How long have you known Miss Matheson? Tell us everything you know about her. When you met, who her friends were, what she was like, everything. I first met Anna five years ago. We met here in Melbourne. I'd just been divorced by my wife, and I was feeling rather fed up with life in general. It isn't much fun getting a divorce. Anyway, I found I couldn't stick Sydney anymore for a bit, so I came here. I tried to plunge into the mad gay whirl in Melbourne. 
But there isn't a mad gay world in Melbourne, is there? And then I... Then I met Anna. She was vaguely connected with a little theatre. She acted there sometimes. Quite a good actress, too, I'm told. Well, we... We fell for each other. We began meeting all over the place. Melbourne, Sydney, Johannesburg, all over. Anna has... I mean... She had quite a bit of money of her own. This following me around lark went on for about four years. And then four months ago, it stopped. Anna came back here and I went on as usual with my job in Aussie. You say Miss Matheson stopped following you around four months ago? Yes. You didn't have any kind of quarrel, I suppose, sir? Well, yes, we did. Care to tell me what about? Miss Matheson felt the time had come for us to get married. Uh -huh. And you, sir? Well, by yesterday, I got around to thinking she was right. I see, sir. By the way, do you know anything about Leonard, the chap who was living next door to her at the Buona? We're checking on him. Why? Oh, no reason. Ever heard of Felix Milton, sir? No. Why? Miss Matheson was at his house at a party the night before she died. There and then I decided to meet Felix Milton. When I joined Brooks at the restaurant at one o'clock, he'd already heard of Anna's death from the police, who checked on my statement that we'd travelled from Sydney together. One way or another, you've had a tough time, mate. Lucky for you, we talked on that journey. Yes, I suppose so. Well, uh, I, um, I suppose the police will check that you've been in Sydney for some time. What do you mean? Well, Sydney and Melbourne aren't that far apart, especially you flying types, sir. An alibi would come in handy, wouldn't it? I'd rather not talk about it, if you don't mind. Okay. Sorry. By the way, you ever heard of a man called Felix Milton? Yeah, I certainly have. Very odd customer. He lives near me. He throws parties. Plenty of money. I'd like to meet him. Could you arrange it for me? Oh, I expect so. Any special reason? No, I'd, I'd just like to meet him, that's all. Okay, mate, I'll see what I can do. Oh, here's the, uh, the waiter with our food. After lunch, I wandered about Melbourne. Few Sydney men liked Melbourne much and vice versa. The cities are too different. Besides, I wasn't exactly in the mood for sightseeing. I finally found myself outside a gramophone shop when I heard a newsboy shouting, Murder in Melbourne, paper! I bought one. And there, on the front page, was a photo of Anna. And the headline, Murder in Melbourne, Girl Dead in South Yarra Hotel. The photo they'd used was the one she'd had taken especially for me. I went into the gramophone shop. I didn't want a record, but I thought I could be quiet for a moment in one of those cubicles. Anna was a great one for records. A willowy young queer came towards me. I asked him for a selection of light music, and he minced off disapprovingly to fetch them. Twenty minutes later, feeling more in control of myself, I bought a record for appearance sake and told him to send it to the meteor. Well, certainly, sir. What knife? Richard Quayle. Quayle? Did you say Quayle? Yes. Want to make anything of it? <laughs> No, I thought you said Kale. And we have a long-lost cousin called Kale. Richard Kale. The black sheep of the family, you see. Why on earth had he sounded scared at my name? It didn't make sense. And I didn't believe him about his cousin. But there was nothing much I could do about it, so I went back to the hotel. There, there was a note waiting for me from Brooks. It read... You are in luck. Felix Milton has asked you along with me to a party on Sunday night. I'll pick you up at six. On a sudden impulse, I looked up Milton's address in the telephone book. Marion's, 19 Wallaby Road. I got a taxi and told it to go there. We crossed the Yarra River in much the same direction as I'd taken last night. Before reaching the street where the Buona stood, we turned left towards Turak. The houses here were large and pompous. We came to Wallaby Road... And suddenly I got a shock. The young man from the gramophone shop was paying off a taxi halfway up the road. He then opened a small white gate, ran up the garden path, rang a front doorbell and was admitted into the house at once. The name of the house was painted clearly on the small white gate. Marion's. On the Sunday, Brooks picked me up punctually at six and told me we were going to collect an English girlfriend of his, Valerie Harding. He didn't tell me how beautiful she was. 
she was the full treatment. Red hair, green eyes, white skin, big bust, small waist. Mmm, a real dish. She was wearing something red. <laughs> and she was laughing. <laughs> well, really, deaf as well as dumb? Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry, what did you say? <laughs> Nothing sensational. I only asked you what you wanted to drink. Oh, um, uh, whiskey, please. With, uh, water or, a uh, soda? Yes. Steady on, old girl. Mm -hmm. Quail was Anna Matheson's fiance. Oh, now it's my turn to apologize. How stupid of me and how dreadful for you. Forgive me, please. She was so beautiful that I'd have forgiven her anything. We had drinks and then we piled into the car and made for Marion's. We reached it around 7.45. It was dark by this time. Felix Milton came to the door himself. Valerie, you gorgeous creature. Marion welcomes you. And you, Guy Brooks, you lovely, lovely boy. And who is this? A friend. Oh, goody. Felix adores friend is. Good grief. Don't let it worry you. The food and drink makes up for everything. Darling. <laughs> Valerie. Beautiful Valerie and the lovely, lovely guy have brought a delicious friend in. The name is? Richard Quayle. Oh. We'll call him Dicky, shall we? Dicky, Ducky, Richard Quayle. <laughs> Isn't that amusing? How do you do, Felix? Yeah. Richard wants to meet everyone. Of course he does. Everyone, Dicky. Uh, now, uh, this is Betty Wall. Hello. And her very handsome husband, Frank. Hello there. Hello. This is dear little Janie Thomas, the sweetest girl in town. Hello. And this is her current boyfriend, Larry French. How are you? Oh, This is Gordon Frotcham, who works in our best gramophone shop. We have met. Yes, we have. This is Louise Talcott, whom I've known for well over a century. Oh, Felix, what a thing to say. This dear creature is Walter something or the other, such a clever little composer. And this is Walter's angel brother, Jerry. <laughs> well, that will do to be going on with, won't it? Yes, well, indeed. <laughs> now, I'll fetch you an enormous drinky and sit you down by Betty Ward. She'll tell you all about everyone. She's a perfect mind of information. <laughs> well, now, here's your drinky. Thank you. And here's Betty. <laughs> Hello again. See you along. Ah, oh, quite a racket. <laughs> They're always in at Felix's parties. Felix is a kind of cult in Melbourne. Everyone comes here. It's a lovely room, isn't it? Mm, seems beautiful. Mrs. Ward, what's that place through there? Hmm? Oh, that's the Chinese bar. We seem to have got a yen for the Orient. Look at all those knives and spears and things on the wall. Yes, Felix is mad about collecting things. And people, if it comes to that. Mm, so it seems. Um, did you by any chance know the girl Anna Matheson, who was a friend of his and who's just been found dead? Oh, yes, I did. Why? She was my fiancée. Oh, Mr. Quayle, how awful. Oh, I'm so sorry. You must be feeling dreadful. Yes, pretty grim. I hear that she was here the night before she died. Yes, she was. Were you here? Yes. Well, who else was here that night? Oh, dear, I'm not sure that I can remember. Oh, well, why? You're not connecting this house with the murder, are you? Oh, no, of course not. But I, I want to know who her friends in Melbourne were. I'm from Sydney. Oh, oh well, let's see. Um, there was Frank and me. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Barking, but she's not here tonight. Uh, Gordon, Felix himself, of course. Yeah. Janie Thomas, Sue and Bill Saunders, who aren't here either. Uh, Larry French, Valerie Harding, and Guy Brooks. Guy Brooks? Mm. But he never told me he knew Anna. Wait a minute, I met him on the Melbourne train from Sydney the day after that fire. Oh, well, he must have gone up to Sydney for the day. He's got business there, too. Why hadn't Guy told me that he knew Anna? He'd been very keen to make my acquaintance on the aircraft. Why? I looked at Anna's friends. Janie was sweet 17 and all that goes with it. Her boyfriend, Larry French, was small, dark, good-looking, about 24, and slightly too pleased with himself. Betty Ward was pretty and 30-ish, and her husband silent and sunburned. Gordon and Valerie I'd already met. Felix bothered me. There was something phony about him. He made himself out to be a big fool, and I could have sworn he wasn't one. Not by a long chalk. It was at that moment that it happened. I was just saying to Betty... 
Oh, by the way, I suppose you've never come across a chap who lives at the Buona Hotel called Lennon, have you? <coughs> <laughs> My dear, how too stupid. Whoever switched off the lights, please switch them on again immediately. Now, thank you. Now, who played that silly trick? I nearly spilled my drink over my suit. Well, I don't know who switched the lights off, but I switched them on. Oh, thank you, guy. Oh, dear me. Betty's fainted. Hi, quick. Uh, thank you, boy. Help me bring her over to the window. Uh, Richard Doll, there's some brandy on the table behind you. I was kneeling by Betty, and as Frank and Felix carried her to the window, I got to my feet, slipping a little dagger that I'd found on the floor into my pocket. As I did this, I saw that Gordon Frodsham of the gramophone shop had seen what I'd done. He said nothing, however, and the party broke up soon afterwards. Valerie offered to drive me home. As we approached her house, she asked me in for a drink. <laughs> nothing I should like more, I replied. As we went through her door, she suddenly kissed me full on the lips. shouldn't have done that, darling, but the business of the lights going out and Betty fending rather frightened me. Hmm. Do you only kiss men when you're frightened? I thought it was my beautiful brown eyes. <laughs> what? They're rather my type, I'm afraid. Did you mind me kissing you? Mm, why should I? Well, I thought you might when... When? The... When? Well, I, I, I mean, I thought you might so soon after... Well, I mean, Anna was engaged to you, wasn't she? And I... Yes. Think... Yes, Anna was engaged to me. So perhaps I'd better be going. What about your drink? Oh, another time. When shall I see you again? When would you like to? I'll ring you tomorrow. Good night, darling. Good night. Valerie. When I got back to my room at the Meteor, I felt in my pocket for the little dagger... It was gone. Monday was a cloudy, blustery day. I was at Russell Street Police Headquarters by 10 o'clock, having decided to tell Inspector Peters about the dagger. In broad daylight, I could hardly believe it myself, and I, I didn't relish having to describe it to such a stolid individual as Peters. Police Headquarters is a ten-story brick building. Inside, it looks rather like a large newspaper office. I asked for Peters at the inquiry desk, and he came to me almost at once and took me to his small square office in the basement. The going was as rough as I'd feared. Very interesting, Mr. Quayle. But when you saw the dagger on the floor after the lights had been turned on, why did you tell no one? And why didn't you inform the police as soon as you left the party? I don't know. Instinct, I suppose. Instinct? I don't quite follow. Well, after all, there were plenty of curious weapons stuck on the wall, and it could have fallen off, couldn't it? Anyway, I was with a lot of strange people, none of whom I particularly liked, so well, I thought I might as well take it home while I considered what I should do about it. I must admit, it is an unlikely story. You're not believing it yourself. And it was only when I found it had been taken from my pocket that I realised its importance. Besides, I, I'd drunk a fair amount. Miss Matheson's death had given me quite a shock. I see. I'm extremely sorry. I was a damn fool. Now, forgive me if I appear a little dense, but when you say you took Miss Harding home, do you mean to her home or to the media? You're being damned rude. To her home, I take it. How long did you spend with her? Oh, about five minutes. Look, have you found Leonard yet? All in good time. And by the way, Miss Matheson's mother is now in Melbourne. She's staying at the media and get in touch with you. Good day, Mr. Quayle. Oh, hello, Mrs. Ward. Hello. Visiting the police? How did you guess? How are you feeling today? Fine, thank you. Do you often faint? No. Oh, what particular thing sent you off last night? <laughs> well, I've no idea. Fright, I suppose. Fright? Well, the light went out, remember, and I hate the dark. I see. You didn't see the dagger by any chance? Dagger? Well, what dagger? Oh, well, perhaps I imagined it. Uh, would you care to come in here and uh, have a cup of coffee with me? Oh, uh, well, oh, I... come on, Mrs. Ward. Your husband need never know. Come and have a cup of coffee. Go on from where we left off last night. Well, what do you mean? Well, I just asked you if you knew Mr. Leonard. Oh. Oh, yes, so you had. Well? 
Do you? Well, actually, I know very little about him except... Except what? Except that Anna seemed to like him very much. Oh. Did she? What's he do? Oh, he's rather a mystery man. Seems quite well off, and yet he lives in that extraordinary little hotel. Oh, I beg your pardon. I'd forgotten that Anna lived there, too. What does he look like? Oh, he's extremely good-looking. About 45, I should think. Fair hair, blue eyes, sort of square, rather somber face. He's very tall. Mm, sounds all right. Mm, he's quite a man from a woman's point of view. Of course, he drinks, but all the women fall. Has a kind of arrogance which is irresistible. The masses of charm, too, and he's a good talker, very amusing. Mm, all the graces. Yes. Except... Except? <laughs> Except that he doesn't seem awfully happy. There's an extraordinary sort of emptiness in him. Do I sound very whimsy? Not at all. You sound like a very observant and intelligent woman. My dear, it's hmm? absolutely oh. delicious. Oh. A heavenly tete-a-tete -tete in the middle of the day in a squalid little cafe. How to utterly riot us. Felix, if you find it so squalid, why are you here? Because, darlings, your hideout wasn't good enough to deceive your Uncle Felix. I saw you through the window as I passed, and I thought, what would dear Frankie say? So I came straight in to warn you that your grisly little secret is a secret no longer. Felix, you're not being in the least funny. Richard and I met quite by chance. Lovely, lovely chance. I adore it, don't you? Well, by the way, Richard, I've just been to Gordon's shop, and he's just the teensiest bit annoyed with you. I was there when the police called on him, you see. Police? What for? To ask him about a dagger that's missing from my collection. Oh? It was a lovely party last night, Felix. I'm so sorry I fainted. It was very silly of me. No, forget it. I do so hope you enjoyed it, Richard. Oh, I enjoyed it immensely, thank you. I'm so glad. I was so frightfully worried that you might have been bored. I went along to Gordon's record shop, worrying all the time about the dagger. Had it been aimed at me or Betty? Why such a small dagger if any real harm were intended? And was it a coincidence that it happened when Leonard's name was mentioned? The whole incident bewildered me. The shop was very full, and I thought I'd never seen a more fantastic sight. Rows of young men, all with their backs to me, had headphones on, and they were crouching in silence, wriggling and swinging their bottoms to the different rhythms of the records they were hearing. Gordon hurried over to me at once. The police have just gone, Richard. They asked ridiculous questions about a dagger that you and I are supposed to have seen. Of course, I denied it, but... Well, I'm very angry with you. I don't know what the joke is, but, well, it's one I can't show, I'm afraid. You saw that dagger as clearly as I did, Gordon. You saw me put it in my pocket. I deny it completely. And I'll tell you something else, Richard. If you ever play a trick like that on me again, I shall tell the police what Anna told me about you. What Anna told you about me? That's what I said. And now I... I must attend to my customers. What do you mean? What Anna told you about me? Uh, so sorry, Mr. Quayle. There's nothing I can do for you, I'm afraid. Good morning. I went back to the meteor in a flaming temper. At the reception desk, I found a message from Anna's mother. I rang her and invited her along to my room for a drink. Richard, dear. Hello, Mrs. Mather. Good to see you. Isn't it dreadful, Richard? I don't understand that she was such a sweet girl. Who could possibly have wanted to do such a terrible thing? Well, I suppose the police will find out in the end. But it won't bring her back to us, will it? Richard, dear, I want you to know that though I didn't approve of your affair with Anna, I know you did what you thought was right. Anna wrote to me often about you both. Perhaps you'd like to see her last letter. Thanks. Mummy, darling... Richard will be coming over from Sydney to see me soon, and one way and another, our future will be settled then. It's all been such a muddle, but whatever happens, it will have been worth it. I love Richard with all my heart. Wouldn't it be wonderful if he wanted to marry me? But of course he won't. I've told you a little about Jack Leonard, haven't I? I think I'm helping a bit, though I can't get him to meet a friend of mine who is an AA. Alcoholics Anonymous, if you didn't know before. I wish he would, because they do a wonderful job. Perhaps he will later, but at the moment something pretty serious is on his mind, I think, and I may be the cause of it. I found out something rather awful the other day, and Jack has been working on it ever since. 
He says he won't go to the police just yet, which I think he ought to. And he refuses to say much about it because he says, I've, I've tumbled onto something dangerous. He has been away for the last two weeks and I'm frightened. He's so nice, Mummy, I really don't know what I'd have done without him these last few months. Unfortunately, he's beginning to fall for me and that may complicate things. Richard and I will be over to see you soon. Until then, take care of yourself. Lots of love. Bless you. Anna. You showed this letter to the police, of course. Of course, dear. How long will you be staying in Melbourne, Mrs. Madison? Until the police find out. What on earth was Anna doing at a place like the Buona? It's a dump. I mean, she wasn't hard up, was she? Well, I suppose, dear, it must have been because of Mr. Leonard. Because of Leonard? But why? Well, from what Anna told me, they, they met on the plane coming from Sydney four months ago. Well, they got talking, found out they were both unhappy and sort of teamed up. I don't get it. I suppose you've no idea what Anna meant about finding out about something awful. No. Well, I'm wondering if, as Leonard warned her, it did turn out to be something dangerous. Yes, I see what you mean, but... I must say, I wish to God the police could find Leonard. It, it's four days already. Richard, if Anna was so keen to introduce him to friends of hers in Alcoholics Anonymous, must have meant that he drank, mustn't it? No idea. The whole setup worries me. I think I'll go to the Buono this afternoon have another word with the manager about Leonard. So at two o'clock, I took a bus to South Yarra. The Buona Hotel looked even more depressing by day. It was painted dark brown and green, and on the fanlight over the door, the gold lettering had lost three letters and read, Buona Hot. A different porter was in the foyer. Good afternoon. Uh, I... Oh, can I do something for you, sir? My name is Quail. Is Mr. Leonard in? Oh, I'm afraid he's away. Oh, any idea when he'll be coming back? No, sir. Well, I'll leave a message for him if he'll give me some paper. Oh, yeah, here you Oh, are, and, sir. uh, thank you. Tell the manager I'd like to speak to him, would you? Yes, sir. A gentleman to see you, sir. Who is it? Uh, Mr. Quail, sir. Quail? Oh, the man, sir. I'll come. Oh, it's you. What do you want? I want to get in touch with Mr. Leonard. I told you, he's gone away. I gather you don't know when he'll be back. See, that's right. What time did he leave the Buona on the morning of Miss Matheson's death? What time did he leave? That's what I said. I don't know. Do you know, Roger? No, he had gone before I came on duty. No, oh, what time do you come on duty? Seven o'clock. So the night porter would know. Well, he might. When did Leonard come back the last time? The, the last time? The last time. The, the day before, sometime during the afternoon or evening. Madam would not. Oh, then may I ask your wife if she's here? My wife, she is out. I see. Had you ever met Leonard before he came to stay here? Mr. Leonard? No. No, I never met Mr. Leonard before he came to stay here. I see. Well, I'll be back. Tell your wife I'm looking forward to seeing her. Oh, and the night porter, too. I left the hotel and turned to the right up the road. After a few paces, I stopped to tie a shoelace. When I looked back, I saw that the hotel door was slightly open and that someone was watching me through the crack. I walked on until I was out of sight of the Buona, and then I crossed the street and doubled back in my tracks. I had decided to pay a visit to the Sunshine Cafe where the light in the first floor room had been so suddenly turned off on the night of Anna's death. It was an even more depressing place than the Buona and entirely deserted. The walls of the cafe were painted with hideous murals, scarlet-faced sailors walking arm in arm with moronic women under monstrous suns. None of the tables had cloths. A mangy cat played with some newspaper on the floor. I went through the cafe into the kitchen. No one was there. I called out. No one answered. Between the cafe and the kitchen was an uncarpeted staircase and I went up it. On the landing, there were two doors. The one on the right was locked. The one on the left opened into a small and very shabby flat. I went in. It was clean and neat and obviously lived in. On a table in the living room, I saw a pile of letters. The top envelope was clearly addressed, Jack Leonard Esquire, Buona Hotel. I suddenly had the feeling that I was not alone. 
But before I had time to see who was near me, something hit me a tremendous crack on the back of my head, and I passed out cold. When I came to, I found myself lying on the grass verge by the side of a dirt road, looking up at the branches of a gum tree. I was evidently some way out of Melbourne. I sat up. My mouth was dry, my head ached abominably, and my hair was matted where I'd been hit. I tried to stand, which made me very giddy at first, but the feeling wore off after one or two attempts, and I staggered off down the road. Presently, I came to a newly painted, newly built little wooden house, and I had just decided to ask the occupants for help when I noticed that cars were passing at the end of the dirt road, about 50 yards from where I stood. I realized that this must be a main road, and I hobbled towards it. I stepped into the middle of the road and held out my arm. Almost immediately, a car came to a halt. Are you in trouble? Yes. Yes, I've, I, I've had an accident. I fell off my motorbike up the road there. Can you give me a lift? Do be careful, Bill. He doesn't look the sort of person we ought to give a lift to. Where do you want to get to? Melbourne. Okay, hop in. Bill! Ah, shut up. Come on. Just you wait till we get home. Oh, wait. Thanks, awfully. I sat back, thankfully, in the back seat and closed my eyes. I kept them closed. But pretty soon I was listening to every word of that conversation. Seems to have gone to sleep. Good. Well, who shall we have to make up a four tonight, then? I don't give a damn. Betty and Frank? Suits me. Betty's nice that way. Never minds being asked at the last moment. Valerie always wants to be invited days before. Valerie's a very beautiful woman. Oh, I think Betty's far prettier. Okay. What do you think's happened to him? He's in a terrible mess. He told us. Then where's his bike? I better ask him when he wakes up. He might be a murderer. <laughs> might be the King of Spain. Well, Anna got murdered. Poor little Anna. I believe you had a soft spot for Anna. You think I'm woman mad? No, I don't. I just think you get attracted rather often. Bill... I once heard a theory that people are murdered because of the kind of people they are. Do you think that Anna was that sort of a girl? No, I don't. I never could make out what she and Jack Leonard were up to. Do you think they were having an affair? Oh, he's woken up. Uh, nearly in Melbourne now. Where can we take you? Well, I, I'm staying at the Meteor, but uh, please drop me anywhere in town. Oh, we're taking to the Meteor. We're nearly there. Well, this has been awfully good of you. I'm most grateful. What are you going to do about your bike? What bike? The bike you crashed. Oh, oh, that. Uh, yes, of course. Well, I'll, I'll telephone the police and get them to fetch it for me. Sorry, my head's making me feel a bit stupid. Oh, my name is Richard Quayle, by the way. If ever I can return your good Samaritan act, let me know. Here's your pub. Richard Quayle? Wasn't Anna Matheson engaged to a Richard Quayle? Anna was my fiancée. Well, that's a damn strange coincidence. Anna was a friend of ours. So I gathered. You mean you heard what we were saying... Oh, how simply awful. I served you right. Our apologies, Quayle. We're Sue and Bill Saunders, by the way. The senior. Okay. I went upstairs, telephoned Peters at Homicide. He'd gone home, so I left a message for him to ring me back and rang down for a doctor and some dinner. Both the doctor and the dinner arrived simultaneously. The doctor fixed my head with sticking plaster and prescribed bed and rest in case of delayed shock. He seemed to think I was none the worse for the accident. I ate a good dinner, read for a while, and was just going to turn off my light at ten o'clock when... Just a minute. Valerie, what a surprise. Richard, oh, darling, how ghastly. Have I woken you or something? Oh, no, not at all. I was reading. I'll come in. Well, you look cute in that dressing gown, but... Why the plaster, doll? Well, I, uh, I met with an accident this afternoon. Oh. I was on a motorbike and met a car head on. Got thrown into a ditch. Oh, poor Richard, how awful. Well, I, I said I'd telephone you today, honey, but I couldn't. Some friends from Perth descended on me. I've only just got rid of them, so I came along at once. Does the head hurt fearfully? Oh, I'll live. <laughs> do, do you mind if I get back into bed? <laughs> Not at all. No. Go right ahead. No. Mix us a drink, will you, Valerie? I wasn't expecting social calls in this state. You must think me the most forward of women. I'm always telling myself that you, aren't I? I think you're very lovely. And I've given myself a whiskey and soda. How about you? Mm, the same. Mm -hmm. You know, 
You don't look like a motorcyclist to me, Richard. Oh, don't I? Well, you're wrong. I'm the outdoor type entirely. Not <laughs> entirely, sweetie. Thank God. <laughs> well, do your lovely brown eyes, Richard. Cheers. Oh, darling, mm -hmm. the police visited me today. Something about a dagger at Felix's party. They said you'd found it on the floor, pocketed it, lost it, and then reported your loss to them. That's right. But how madly dramatic of you. I mean, Felix has dozens of daggers and things on those walls of his. Must have fallen off one of those hooks. Maybe. Well, don't you think it did? I don't know. Well, I mean to say it's far more likely to have appeared from somewhere simple like that than to have been a matter for the police, isn't it? In normal circumstances, yes. Well, what do you mean? Well, I mean, as you reminded me last night, Anna was my fiancée and someone murdered her. So I'm probably a little suspicious of anything unusual at the moment. And of everybody? I suppose so. Yes. I see. Besides, the dagger has disappeared. But Anna wasn't killed at Felix's house. Perhaps not. Who knows? She was poisoned. And it depends how long the strychnine took to work. Oh. Well, I think I'd better beat it, Richard. You're certainly not in the mood for social calls. Oh, excuse me. Yes? Oh, yeah. No, I'm afraid I can't just at the moment. I've, I've got someone with me. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'll be along at nine. All right. Thanks. Goodbye. That was Detective Inspector Peters. I'm going to see him tomorrow at nine. How thrilling. Don't bother. I'll let myself out. Good night, Valerie. And thanks for calling. Good night. Nine o'clock next morning found me at the police headquarters again. Peter seemed mildly interested in my story about the brew owner and the Sunshine Cafe, but his manner was very offhand, and he kept a silly half-smile on his face all the time I was speaking. After I left him, I went to the coffee shop where I'd taken Betty the day before to sort out a few things in my mind. The police seemed to be getting nowhere and not bothering over much. Just one more routine case to them. Peter's attitude drove me round the bend. I ordered a second cup of coffee and thought back over the past few days. I'd now met several of Anna's Melbourne friends, and I must say I didn't find most of them particularly congenial. Felix and Gordon were queers. Valerie, though beautiful and obviously extremely attractive, had taken that dagger from me. Well, she must have. Brooks I quite liked. Frank and Betty Ward seemed smart and social in the wrong way. And I couldn't quite make out what sort of a woman Betty Ward was. That faint seemed out of character somehow. The Saunders, who had given me a lift yesterday, were simply uninteresting. He was quite a decent chap, but she was a bore and obviously nagged him. Larry French was too young for me and too slick. And only little Janie Thomas seemed to me the kind of friend I should have expected Anna to have. I decided to ask her to lunch. She wasn't at the library where she told me she worked, but she was at home, and she said if she could bring Larry French along, she'd love to join me. Well, of course, I said bring him. I then rang Anna's mother, but she said she'd be spending the day in bed. I had more than an hour on my hands before lunch, and I suddenly decided to see Gordon at his gramophone shop once again, and to insist on him telling me what Anna was supposed to have said to him about me. Gordon wasn't in the shop. But Felix Milton was. Richard Dahl, how do you find? How are you? Where's Gordon? My dear, isn't it too extraordinary? He has the measles. So childish, don't you agree? He couldn't work, though, so I'm here instead. A relieving angel, Dickie, dear. Too amusing. Oh, damn, I wanted to contact him. Will you be seeing him? Not if he's infectious, Dickie. I'm too old for spots. Always was, I'm thankful to say. I've never been handsome, but I've always avoided spots. Do you know his home telephone number? But of course. And he'd love you to ring him. He was saying only yesterday how much he admired you. He said he reveled in your shoulders. Isn't that delicious? Delicious. What's his number? Is it in the book? No. 
Oh, one moment, Richard. Customer. And what can I do for you, sir? Uh, have you got Tito Gobby and Rigoletto? My dear, I do hope so. But I'm a stranger in these parts. Let's have a little hunting, shall we? Are you mad about him? I am. <laughs> I saw him at Covent Garden four years ago. No, oh, I wish I had. <laughs> ah, here we are. Right first go. Now, you know how those headphone things work, do you? Oh, yes. And the turntables? Uh, well, I'm not certain. Oh, I'm sure you're both madly mechanical. I'm not at all. Darling Gordon, who shot this is, has got the measles, poor sweet. He quite forgot to tell me what one does to start them. I suggest you press every knob in sight, and if nothing happens, we'll telephone the fire brigade or something. <laughs> all right. You do the pressing, darling. OK. Well, have a go. You know, Dickie, on second thoughts, I'm not sure that you ought to telephone Gordon. He isn't well, you know. Can't I help you instead? Are you a great friend of his? Of course. Or why else should I be in this disastrous little shop today? We tell each other everything. Then did he by any chance tell you what Anna had told him about me? Oh, yes. Well, what was it? She told him she was frightened of you. Frightened of me? What rubbish. Well, Gordon didn't think it was rubbish. And I'll tell you why she was frightened. She told Gordon that she believed you wanted to kill her. I didn't believe him, of course, but I felt pretty bad even at hearing it. I hurried out of the shop and kept walking until it was time to meet Janie and Larry. Little Janie Thomas looked dazzling. She was obviously in love with Larry, and I began to feel like the odd man out. I also found it impossible to concentrate on anything but what Felix had just said. I knew it was a lie, but it got me down all the same. I tried to pull myself together and heard myself saying brightly in a voice which sounded unreal to me, It's so good of you both to come. Any friend of Anna's is a friend of mine, and I'm trying to get to know you all. Oh, by the way, uh, Felix tells me that Gordon has measles. Oh. Did you know? Yeah. No, how awful. Poor Gordon. Well, if you want to know all Anna's friends, have you met Mrs. Barking yet? She was a great friend. No, uh, is she nice? Oh, she's absolutely sweet. The kindest woman you could imagine. Anna told me in a letter that one of her friends was an AA. Do you know who that could be? Bill Saunders. It's probably why his wife nags at him so. Oh. Of course, she'd hate him to be a drunk, but it annoys her that he's a teetotal. <laughs> she says it makes him conspicuous. <laughs> well, she's a very silly woman in many ways. Yes. Yeah. Look at that row she made the other night. Oh, you mean when Anna got drunk? Shut Anna up. drunk? Oh. When was Anna drunk? I'm sorry, I'm afraid I was talking out of turn. What did you mean? Well, it only happened that once, you know. When? Well, actually, it was the night she was... Oh, I mean, the night she died. What happened? Oh, don't listen to him, Mr. Quayle. He's exaggerating the whole thing. What happened? Well, you know that little Chinese bar at Felix's? Mm -hmm. Well, Anna was in there the night she died having a drink. I don't know now who was in there with her. Do you, Janie? No, I don't. Well, anyway, Mrs. Barking suddenly came running out to say that Anna was having some kind of a fit. Apparently, she was completely tight and sort of rolling about, you know. Anyway, Sue Saunders made such a fuss that Felix arranged for Anna to be taken home. With whom? I can't remember that. Can you, Jane? No. Are you sure you can't remember who besides Mrs. Barking was with her in the bar? Well, Larry wasn't. And Janie wasn't. Because Anna was poisoned with strychnine, you know. What? Oh, no. And what you describe as drunken fit may well have been a strychnine convulsion. My God. Dr. Manton told me that strychnine takes anything from five minutes to a quarter of an hour to have its first effects. Do you know what time she had this fit? It was 1.15 exactly by my watch when Mrs. Barking came out of the bar. How clever of you to notice. Not at all. You just asked me to take you home. So she must have been given the poison about one o'clock. I don't believe she got drunk. It must have been a convulsion. How oh, horrible. Poor Anna. Do either of you two know a chap called Jack Leonard? Well, yes. I do, slightly. He happened to be Janie's boyfriend until Anna came along, so it's rather more than slightly, I should say. How dare you, Larry? Thank you for a lovely lunch, Richard, but I'm afraid I've got an appointment. And looking deathly pale, she left us flat. I took a taxi to Mintona Crescent to call on Mrs. Barking. I was pretty thoughtful, I can tell you. Both Janie Thomas and Betty Ward had obviously been very upset when I mentioned Leonard's name. Why? And why couldn't the police find him? But perhaps they had by this time. 
He didn't seem to be in Milton's set, yet everyone seemed to know him except Bill Saunders, who was evidently the AA man Anna talked about in her letter. Suddenly, I knew what the puzzling smell in Anna's room had been. Peraldehyde. Why hadn't I thought of it before? Peraldehyde, the cure drunks took when they were real, died in the wool drunks. So that's why Leonard had been away. He'd been on a bat and had had a cure. So he must have been in Anna's room on the night of her death. I got so excited at this thought that I nearly turned back and went to Russell Street again. Then I remembered Peter's manner and decided not to bother. Besides, the taxi was already in Mintona Crescent. Mrs. Barking's house was small and gay and the garden beautifully kept and filled with flowers. The house was red brick and the front door was blue. As I went up the garden path, I saw the net curtain at the window to the left of the front door move and a fat white face looked anxiously at me. I rang the bell, but no one answered. I went on ringing. Still no one came. I tried to look in at the window where I'd seen the face. I could see nothing. I tapped on the window pane. No reaction. I went round to the back of the house, knocked on the back door and tried the handle. It was locked. I tried the kitchen windows. They too were locked. I went out of the backyard gate and hid behind a little hedge. Presently the back door was opened and an old black and tan Pekingese waddled furiously towards me, barking wildly. The back door was now opened wide. You naughty girl, come here at once. Good afternoon, Mrs. Barking. Who are you? What do you want? Go away. Go away at once. Come here, Shin Yu. Uh, may I come in? Look, I haven't got the money here. But... You didn't warn me. Go away and leave me alone. I'll send the money wherever you want. Well, I, I don't know what you're talking about, I'm afraid. My name is Richard Quayle. Anna Matheson was my fiance. Oh, goodness gracious. I'm so sorry. Whatever must you think of me? But I'm afraid you must go. They won't let you come in. Who won't let me come in? Who are you frightened of? Can I help you? Oh, no, please, no. Please, go away. No, but look, Mrs. Barking, I'm here now, so you might as well make use of me. Let me in quickly and no one will ever know. Well... Now, quick, quick, we mustn't waste time. Very well. Come in, but quickly. Come into the drawing room. This way. Now, sit down, Mr. Quayle, while I look out of the window. What's the matter with Mrs. Barking? What's worrying you? They're watching the house. But there's no one outside. They said they were watching. But who? Begin at the beginning, Mrs. Barking. I'm being blackmailed. What? They sent me a letter asking for 200 pounds, and someone rang me up in the middle of the night and said that they were watching me and that my telephone line was being tapped. They said I was only to go out of the house when they told me to and to see no one. Well, have you any idea who it could be? None. Was the voice male or female? I couldn't tell. It was a whisper. Have you been to the police? No, I can't. What? But... You see, whoever it is knows something that happened a long time ago and it's something that doesn't affect me but might hurt my daughter, you see. And that mustn't happen. Yes, but you must go to the police. It's him. It's the blackmailer. Oh, Mr. Quayle, what am I to do? I can't stand it. I really can't. <laughs> Mrs. Barking, your callers are Betty Ward and Janie Thomas, but if you take my advice, you'll sit tight and don't let them in. Just let them go away. But now, do as I say, Mrs. Barking. I know what I'm doing. Now, just listen to me. Half an hour later, I let myself out of the back door and walked round into Mintona Crescent. I was struck by the fact that Mrs. Barking's blackmailing had coincided with Anna's death. And I felt there must be some connection. I tried to get some sense out of her about Anna's fit at Felix's party, but the blackmailing had driven every other thought out of her head. I found a taxi and told it to drive me to the meteor. And suddenly I saw that a car that had been moving slowly up the crescent behind me was being driven by Betty Ward with Janie Thomas as passenger. So they'd waited half an hour for me. And now they were following me. In fact, they followed me all the way back to the hotel. When I reached the meteor, I asked the porter to ring through to Mrs. Matheson's room to say that I wanted to send her some flowers and what sort would she like. I was told she was out. Are you sure? Well, certainly I'm sure, sir. Yeah, but I understood she wasn't well. A young gentleman called for and they went out together about lunchtime. What sort of young man? Oh, thin and medium height, horn-rimmed glasses, speckled brown suit, waved his hands about, sir. This sounded like Gordon, but Gordon had measles. Did the young man have spots, I asked. The porter looked astonished, but he said no. 
I then asked him to let me know when Mrs. Matheson came in and went into the hotel writing room and wrote a letter to Peters telling him all I'd managed to find out. I rang for a page boy and told him to take it round to Russell Street. I then ordered some cigarettes and a whiskey and soda and was settling down to do a little more thinking when Valerie and Guy Brooks came into the room. Hello, Angel. How's the head? Fine, thanks. I tried to get you earlier in the day, but you were out. Oh. Guy and I were wondering if you'd like to come to a drive-in with us. There's a good film at Glen Iris with Audrey Hepburn in it, and Guy goes for Audrey in a big way. <laughs> we thought we'd have dinner after in the English Roadhouse. The food's beautiful. Well, thanks. Yes, I'd like that. Oh, well, Valerie pretends I'm mad about Audrey, but not even Audrey can keep me awake at a film. <laughs> I like to snooze and look up at her adorable face in between bouts of somnia, if that's the word. <laughs> <laughs> Flattering to me, isn't he? You can see why I wanted you along, Richard. So we drove out together, and it was a lovely evening. When we parked the car, Guy persuaded me to sit in front with Valerie. She slipped a cool little hand into mine and snuggled down beside me. She smelt wonderful and looked wonderful, and it was warm and companionable having her there beside me. The dinner at the roadhouse was excellent. King prawns, roast beef and Yorkshire pudding washed down with extremely good Australian red wine, coffee with clotted cream and some brandy. We drove back into Melbourne feeling sleek and happy. Guy did the driving, and Valerie and I sat in the back holding hands. Suddenly she spoke. Oh, don't let go home yet. Let go and die. Oh, not on your life, Val. Well. It's time for Uncle to get his beauty sleep. Oh, Richard, please. You don't want to go to bed yet, surely. Uh, well, uh... Please, darling. You needn't stay long. Let's go to Heroes for about an hour and dance. We danced at Heroes for a couple of hours, and then I drove her back in a taxi to her flat. The clock in the foyer of the meteor said ten past three as I walked in. I took my key from the night porter and wandered up the stairs. When I reached my room, I hesitated. For some reason, I had a feeling of fear, almost of panic. I unlocked my door, switched on the light. Everything seemed normal, both in the bedroom and in the bathroom. I undressed slowly and uneasily. I put on my dressing gown and opened the wardrobe door to get a hanger for my suit. The body of a dead man crashed at my feet. I think you have a little explaining to do. Me? What about you? Who is this man? You don't know? Well, of course I don't. You and I are going to have a little talk, Mr. Quayle, and if it's satisfactory, I'm inviting you to a party at Mr. Milton's flat tomorrow night. The next evening, Felix entertained a few friendies to Dindins. The friendies were Janie Thomas, Larry French, Valerie Harding, Guy Brooks, Gordon Frodsham, Sue and Bill Saunders, Frank and Betty Ward, myself and... Kenneth Hodges, a friend of mine who had unexpectedly turned up at the last moment. Although there was plenty to eat and drink, the party took a long time to warm up. Only Felix seemed to be enjoying himself. It's not like Felix gets such a dull party, is it? Oh, we all know each other far too well, I suppose. And no one seems in the party mood, do they, Richard? I'm quite happy. Oh, I like your friend, Kenneth Hodges. What does he do? He works in a bank in Sydney. We were at school together. Hello, Valerie. Richard. Gordon, how are the measles? Oh, my dear, it wasn't measles at all. Isn't it divine? Simply fish. Oh, God. Fish? Or rather, the effects of eating a particular breed of fish to which I'm allergic. Oh, too bad. I do hope you didn't eat any fish when you lunched with Mrs. Matheson yesterday. Mrs. Matheson? Do I know a Mrs. Matheson? Well, that was silly, Gordon. You were seen with her. Who saw me? I did. Felix wants to talk to you. Everybody got a drink, eh? Yeah. Got an orange juice, Bill? Oh, right. Good. Yeah. Now, I want to tell you all how delighted I am to see you here. First of all, of course, because you're friends of mine. And secondly, because exactly a week ago tonight, Anna Matheson was killed. And I'm reliably informed by those divine little navy blue charmers, the police, 
that the suspect is sitting in this room at this moment. Isn't that exciting? So to prevent further trouble, all the doors have been locked. And we're going to have a delicious talk here to find out who killed her. Somebody here now gave Anna strychnine. And the theory is that it was given to her in this house. Perhaps whoever did it would like to confess at once and save all unpleasantness. No? Very well, then. The discussion is thrown open. Come along, Betty, darling. Home. Felix, I'm sorry, but I'm afraid this isn't my idea of a joke. Nor mine. And to show you how serious I feel, I'm going to put all my cards on the table. Ah, that will be Lynette, I expect. Rene, let her in. Mrs. Barton? Yes, J.D. Any objection? No, of course not. Good. Come in, Lynette, dear. Oh, hello, Felix. Now, there's hello, nothing everyone. to fear. We'll look after you. I'm holding a discussion group, and I've just told Frank it's a very serious one. Betty, my love. I especially asked you and Frank to bring Jack Leonard along tonight. He isn't here. Why not? Well, we rang the Buona and the manager said he was away. Indeed. You knew the manager in Italy, Frank, I understand. I? Certainly not. Strange. He claims to know you. I suppose you don't deny that you've been to Italy. Oh, yes, I've been there. Yes, you were there for three years, according to my information, in Milan, chiefly. Anyway, let's leave it for the moment because I want to tell you all a little story. Now, some of you know that Bill Saunders' father bought a large tract of territory in the north several years ago and left it to Bill when he died. He'd bought it dirt cheap, but as you know, well, it was in all the papers, it turned out to be extremely rich in minerals, including uranium. Well, a short while ago, in spite of security precautions, it was discovered that samples of these minerals Photographs of the land, also several important documents are missing. As you can imagine, the authorities took it pretty seriously. Investigations were made, and the suspicion for these thefts has fallen on our dear friend, Gordon Fotchel. Oh, no. How dare you? It's lies, lies, all lies. Sit down, Gordon. I wouldn't be making such an accusation without proof. Proof, in fact, furnished by Anna which may account for her death. I'll sue you for this. Splendid. Now we turn to Frank and the manager of the Buona. Jack Leonard and Frank both knew him in Italy. They'd been taken prisoner in Tobruk and had managed to escape from their prison camps in Italy. They hadn't as yet met, but both were making for the Italian Alps in the hopes of reaching the Swiss border. And both came across the manager who hid them and cared for them in Milan where he was a waiter. Leonard was grateful to him and bought the Buona for him here after the war. Leonard's a drunk, as we all know. And that and his friendship for the proprietor is why he's prepared to live in such a squalid hotel, although he can well afford something better. And that is why, of course, the manager turned a blind eye on some of his behavior. Dear Frank, on the other hand, refused point blank to help him in any way. It isn't true. How perfectly horrible, Frank. And, of course, Jack Leonard's connection with the Buona explained Anna's presence there, too. I don't get it. Well, they were first cousins. Her father and his mother were brother and sister. Anna and Jack met on the plane coming from Sydney to Melbourne three or four months ago and discovered their relationship. Both, if you'll forgive me, Richard, were unhappy people in their way, so they teamed up. Anyway, one day Anna told Jack what she'd found out about Gordon. And he, like a fool, decided to do some snooping on his own instead of going to the police. How had Anna found out about Gordon? Well, they'd become friends through their common love of music. It was Gordon, if you remember, who first brought Anna among us. They dropped into the habit of meeting for tea every day in Gordon's little room at the back of his shop. But one day, Anna got there earlier than usual. And not finding Gordon in the shop itself, she went straight through to the back room without being invited. Gordon was not only surprised, but angry at seeing her. And he hastily bundled some papers into a drawer of his desk. At that moment, a customer arrived. Gordon tried to get Anna out of the little room, but she insisted on staying where she was. He was forced to go and serve the customer. And, of course, Anna opened the drawer 
and found the maps and photographs which are it's now lied. Oh, lied. which are now with the police. Now we come to another and a very dreadful part of this story. Ever since Anna's murder, Lynette Barking has been blackmailed. Yesterday, someone poisoned her little dog she knew by putting strychnine in its drinking water outside the back door. The wicked devil. Oh, oh, there, there, Lynette, it's all right. Unfortunately, although her blackmailers talked to her on the telephone several times, Lynette couldn't recognize the voice, though she does have the feeling that it's familiar. Don't you, darling? Poor little shin, you. Oh, never mind, dear. And that's not all. Jack Leonard was found dead last night. Oh, Jack. In Richard's room at the meteor. Oh, no. No, I don't believe it. Oh, it can't Johnny, be true. Johnny, Johnny, don't cry, don't cry, darling. So it's not very surprising, is it, Betty, that you couldn't contact him at the Buona? But if you knew he was dead, why ask us to bring him today? Well, I didn't know when I asked you, of course. But why pretend that you didn't know a few minutes ago? All right, Inspector. Thank you, Mr. Milton. Inspector? Yes, Lynette, Inspector. Richard's enchanting friend, Kenneth Hodges, here, is really our gallant detective, Inspector Peters, masquerading, so to speak, as one of us. My dear, dear friends, we must now lend an ear to the charming police, Inspector. That's right. Ladies and gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, I must apologize for intruding on you in this way. But although you've not met me before, I'm in charge of this inquiry, and it seemed to me important to be able to study you at my leisure when you were unaware that you were under professional scrutiny. I would now like the answers to some questions. Oh, well, Mr. Milton, please ask your man to send in Sergeant Smith and Sergeant Cardinal, will you? Certainly. Rennie, Rennie, dear boy, march in the sergeants. Very good, sir. Now, come in, Smith. Sergeant Cardinal, not back yet? Uh, no, sir. All right. Now for the questions. On the occasion of Mr. Quayle's first visit here, a small silver dagger was thrown at him or, or at Mrs. Ward. Mr. Quayle pocketed the dagger, but it has since disappeared. Can anyone here throw any light on this? A dagger? How extraordinary. A dagger. So that's what it was. What was, Mrs. Ward? Uh, that's why I fainted, Inspector. Mr. Quayle and I were having a conversation about something... I don't remember now what. About but... Mr. Leonard, I understand. Oh, was it... Yes, well, we were talking to each other when I suddenly thought I saw something flashing towards me. I, I thought it was a knife and I screamed. Uh, the lights went out and I fainted. Why didn't you say anything about the dagger when you came to? Well, I was frightened and one doesn't always behave coherently when one's frightened. Uh, besides, I couldn't see the dagger anywhere and I thought I must have just imagined it. I suppose you told your husband later. Well, no. No? Oh, very well, thank you, Mrs. Wood. Now, Mr. Frodsham... Mr. Quayle tells me that when he first met you in your shop, you were so frightened when he mentioned his name that you were almost unable to speak. Now, why was this? You'd better ask Richard. Me? Why the hell should I know? Very well, Richard, if you want to play it that way. Inspector, if you must know, Anna Matheson had told me that she was afraid of Richard Quayle's return because she thought he wanted to kill her. Oh, filthy little... Easy, easy, you... easy. We'll deal with everything in its turn. Now, Mr. Brooks, you flew to Sydney and back on the day of Miss Matheson's death. Did you have any special reason for this trip on that day? Well, uh, it was a routine trip, though recently I've been sending the cables to my father regarding Bill Saunders' land from our Sydney office, not our Melbourne office. In the uh, circumstances, I felt it was safer. Quite. Now, Miss Thomas, why have you recently left your job at the library where you've been working for over a year? My mother wanted me to. Why? She doesn't want me to work, really. Yet she allowed you to work for a year. Why the sudden decision? The reason's a personal, Inspector. It may have escaped your notice, Miss Thomas, but this is a police murder inquiry. Now, why did your mother ask you to leave your job? Well, she caught me coming into the house at about four o'clock one morning after she'd seen me going to bed. She was very angry. What connection had that with your job? None. Where'd you been, then? I'd rather not, sir. Come along, Miss Thomas. Well, I'd gone to meet Jack Leonard. Janie! But he wasn't where I'd been told he would be. Where you'd been told he would be? Didn't he arrange the meeting himself? No. Well, who did? Who arranged the meeting, Miss Thomas? It was I, Inspector. Betty! Really, Mrs. Ward? Or why was that? Well, Jack asked me to. He said he couldn't do it himself as he was hiding from the police and he was afraid they'd trace a telephone call. How did he get in touch with you? 
Well, I just happened to run into him near the Buona. He was disguised, but not very well, and I recognized him. He, he told me he was in trouble and that only Janie could help him. Thank you, Mrs. Ward. But he didn't turn up at your rendezvous, Miss Thomas. No, he didn't. But when Mother found out that I'd gone to meet him, she was furious. She said she couldn't trust me anymore, and that except with her permission, she wouldn't let me out of the house. You see, she'd always disapproved of Jack. She had, in fact, made me break off my engagement with him. Which night was this rendezvous, Miss Thomas? Last Monday. Last Monday? That was the night I first heard the voice of my blackmailer. Precisely. Were you jealous of Miss Matheson, Miss Thomas? Jealous of Anna? Why should I be? Perhaps because Leonard found her attractive and was living in the next room to her, the Buana. This is monstrous. Don't answer that, Janie. You don't have to. Quite right, Mr. French. He doesn't have to. That would make it easier if she did. Inspector, what's all this got to do with Anna's death? You're not seriously suggesting that I'm Janie... not suggesting anything, Mr. Quayle. Yet. But I'm investigating two murders. And unless they're the work of a homicidal maniac, it is probable that the killer or killers had a motive. In this case, there were two main lines for us to pursue. The political and the emotional. Emotional? Why not? The two victims were emotionally involved with each other and also with some of the present company. Miss Matheson with you, for instance, and uh, Mr. Leonard with Miss Thomas. And with me. This is barking. There's no need to say anything about that. But my affair with him was years ago. And even if he was the blackmailer, he's dead now. We don't know that he was the blackmailer, Mrs. Barking. Oh. Oh, dear. But in any case, the blackmailer won't worry anyone again, I assure you. Well, how do you know? Because when I arrest Miss Matheson's killer, I shall be arresting the blackmailer, too. My God. But we're not quite ready to arrest anybody yet. I've still got too many suspects. All of you, in fact, who were here at Mr. Milton's party when Miss Matheson was poisoned. Oh, oh, why must it be someone who was here? It could have been Jack Leonard or any one of the Buona. Quite right, Mr. Ward. It could even have been Mr. X. Mr. X? Mm, I always call the rank outsider, Mr. X. But the favorite must be someone who was at the party. Inspector, are you satisfied that the killer's motive was emotional? No. Now, if it's any comfort to you, Mr. Quayle, I think Miss Matheson died because of the information she picked up in the gramophone shop. Inspector, I've had enough of your insinuations. I want my lawyer. There'll be plenty of time for lawyers if and when I decide to charge you, Mr. Frodsham. Meanwhile, why did you pretend to have measles yesterday? I don't have to answer that. No, sir, but if the explanation is an innocent one, you'd be well advised to do so. I wanted an excuse to be away from my shop. Why? Well, if you must know... I wanted to warn Anna's mother against Richard Quayle. Anna had been scared of him. I took Mrs. Matheson out to lunch to warn him. And persuaded her to get hold of the key to Mr. Quayle's room at the Meteor on the pretext of having left some gloves behind there and to join you in a search of the room. What were you hoping to find? The... The poison, of course. Ah, another amateur detective. Was this your own idea or did someone put you up to it? Well, Mr. Frodsham? I won't answer that. Mrs. Matheson says she didn't return the room key to the desk after your search, did you? I... I can't remember. You killed Leonard, didn't you? No. You poisoned him in the hotel bedroom in order to frame Mr. Quayle. I didn't, I tell you. I don't know anything about it. Well, that at least is patently untrue. Mr. Smith, ring the station, will you, and find out what's keeping Codner. Yes, sir. There's a phone in the hall. Oh, thank you, sir. Miss Thomas, was Frodsham in the bar here with Miss Matheson when she was taken ill? I don't know. He had been earlier, but I'd already left the bar when she had her attack. Oh, I see. And you wouldn't know if uh, Mrs. Ward was there either? I don't know about the time of the attack, but she was still in there when I left the bar. Oh, what do you say, Mrs. Ward? Were you there at the time? No. But you were, Betty. You were standing beside her when I left the bar to get help. Well, Annette, I told you before I was not there. You're imagining but it, Betty. When did you tell her before, Mrs. Ward? Well, we discussed it after we were first questioned by Sergeant Codner. Did you? Oh, well, the memory can play odd tricks at times. Uh, talking of which, Mrs. Barking, have you remembered where you put the weed killer that you told Sergeant Codner was missing? No, Inspector. I can't find it anywhere. Sergeant Codner's just arrived, sir. Ah, oh, good. Uh, sorry to be in so long, sir. But you know what these experts are like. Uh, that's his report, sir. Oh, thank you. Mrs. Ward, 
I must ask you to accompany me to the police station. But why? What's she done? While you've been here this evening, Mr. Ward, we've carried out tests on your wife's typewriter. Our expert reports that it was the machine used to type the letter blackmailing Mrs. Barking. Betty, how could you? I don't believe oh. it. Anyway, it doesn't prove she killed anybody. Whether it does or not, blackmail is still a felony. I'm sorry, Mr. Ward. Come along, Mrs. Ward. You too, Mr. Frodsham. I'll come along with you, Betty, darling. It's all nonsense. Yeah, we'll soon get you out. I didn't do it! I didn't do it! I didn't do it! Come on, Betty, just tell me. But she had. She confessed to both murders and the blackmailing the next day. When did you first suspect her? Well, then I noticed the discrepancy between Mrs. Barking's and Mrs. Ward's accounts of who was in the Chinese bar at the crucial time. But that could have been just... just vagueness. Agreed. But I had a feeling they might have discussed the original police questioning between them, and if Mrs. Ward was guilty of the murders, she would want at all costs to keep Mrs. Barking from further contact with the police. And how better than by blackmailing her? That was why I tried to provoke a quarrel between them about it, if you remember. Yes. That worked. Mrs. Ward let slip that they had discussed the questioning. And the typewriter evidence was, of course, the last piece in that corner of the jigsaw. That was very smart of you. Yes, but why was the little dog killed? Uh, to terrorize Mrs. Barking still further. It was a miscalculation on Mrs. Ward's part, as it happened. It brought Mrs. Barking straight to us. In fact, it was the killing of the dog that pinned the murders on Mrs. Ward. Ironical, isn't it? She got the poison from Mrs. Barking, incidentally. From Mrs. Barking? Yes, the missing weed killer, remember? But why did Betty Ward do it? Oh, well, that's where Felix Milton comes into it, really. What? Oh, don't, don't, don't misunderstand me. Milton's insecurity. No. Yes, he's oh. quite a bright boy. As I told you, the murder of your fiancé was political. What do you mean that Betty Ward was mixed up in this secret agent racket? That's right. She was Frodsham's boss. But we only found that out after her arrest... My bet is that she allowed herself to get involved for the money, and excitement maybe, and then couldn't get out if she wanted to. Yes, what about Frodsham? Same story, money too. He's an inveterate gambler, and an unlucky one. Mrs. Ward set him up in the gramophone shop, paid his debts, and he found himself involved in the spiring as a quid pro quo. Hey, incidentally, they used the sleeves of LP records for passing on their information. Oh, yes, ingenious, wasn't it? Milton had had his eye on Frodsham for some time. Hence the spectacular way in which he cultivated his acquaintance. In fact, we already knew everything that Miss Matheson found out by chance at the shop. But then why wasn't Frodsham arrested? Well, he thought that in time he might lead us to a high up in the organization. But before he did, he had, of course, told Mrs. Ward about the incident in the shop, and she got orders to put Miss Matheson out of the way. And later, of course, Leonard, too, when she found out that he knew as well. My God. And that dagger at the party... Was that meant for me? Well, not to kill you, I don't suppose, but if possible, to scare you off being too inquisitive about Leonard. Yes, but Betty couldn't have thrown that. She was standing next to me. Ah, it was Frodsham. The only prints on it when it reappeared on Milton's wall were yours and his. We're holding him as an accessory to both murders, by the way. And which of them knocked me out at the Sunshine Cafe? Neither. It was Leonard. Leonard? Yes. You see, he'd been to Miss Matheson's room on the night of her murder, and so foolishly, but understandably, he was hiding from the police. He wasn't likely to welcome your discovery of his hideout, was he? But how do you know? Well, I mean, I guessed that Leonard had been in her room, but, but what makes you so sure? Well, Leonard was a drunk, and there was a strong smell of peraldehyde in the room. Yes, I noticed that. And then the manager of the Buona came clean after Leonard's death and handed us a letter left with him by Leonard before he went to your room at the Meteor. It was only to be given us in the event of anything happening to Leonard. Well, what did it say? It said he had a telephone call, purposing to come from you and urging him to meet you with the meteor. He was suspicious, but he was in love with Anna Matheson, and he wanted to meet you to see if you were serious about her. I see. It seems that on the night of Miss Matheson's death, he had arrived back from Sydney, where he'd been having a cure. Well, he hadn't seen her for a couple of weeks, so he went straight along to her room. Mm -hmm. And this was about uh, 10 p.m. He knocked on her door, but she was out. So he went to bed, but although very tired, he couldn't sleep, and so he took some strong sleeping pills. Now, between 2.15 and 2.30... He awoke with the conviction that something terrible had happened to Miss Matheson. He was still very drugged, but he went along to her room. He knocked and again got no answer. He tried the door and it was open. Miss Matheson was lying on the floor. The floor? Yeah. But he realized she was dead. He picked her up, carried her to her bed. Oh. He was horrified by her expression, remembered shutting her eyes and mouth. He decided to call a doctor, but as his hand went out to the phone, it rang. 
A voice he didn't recognize asked if he was Leonard, and when he said he was, the voice went on, What are you doing in Miss Matheson's room? She's dead, isn't she? He was so surprised that he said yes. The voice then said, You've killed her, haven't you? And then the telephone went dead. Leonard completely lost his head. He rushed out of the room, hung the Do Not Disturb card on the door in the hopes of delaying the discovery of Anna's body, packed some things and left the Buono immediately. Well, naturally, when Miss Matheson's death was reported, the manager phoned him at his office. Leonard arranged to meet him and told him the whole story. The manager, who, as you know, had reason to be very grateful to him, believed him and fixed him up at the Sunshine Cafe. Was the telephone call in Anna's room from Betty? Yes, of course. She wanted to know if the poison had worked. Poor Anna. Poor darling Anna. Yes, indeed. And Leonard's death? Well, Mrs. Ward and Frodsham waited for him in your room of the hotel. Frodsham hasn't come clean yet, but he must have been there to get the body into the cupboard. He's been supposing I'd come in. He'd probably have done the same for you. <laughs> then it was a bit of luck for me that I went to the cinema with Brooks and Valerie. It was indeed. And you know, I thought for a while that they would have been part of the frame-up. <laughs> I think I owe them an apology. <laughs> I think you do. <laughs> well, come and have a drink, Mr. Quayle. Oh. I'm sure you need one. <laughs> I'm off duty and the case is solved. Yes, the case was solved. But the fact that Anna was killed was really my fault. If I hadn't left her four months alone in Melbourne two years ago, lonely and unhappy, she would never have got herself mixed up with such a set. That's why I'm going away tomorrow. I had to wait till Ozzie retired me. But now I want to put the past behind me. I suppose I'm just not cut out for matrimony. That was Richard Handel as Richard Quayle, with Mary Wimbush as Valerie Harding, Michael Turner as Detective Inspector Peters, Beverly Dunn as Betty Ward, and Philip Lever as Felix Milton, in Murder in Melbourne by Dulcie Gray. The rest of the cast was as follows. Bruce Stewart as Guy Brooks, Paddy Turner as Janie Thomas, Geoffrey Hodgson as Gordon Frodgson, Brenda Dunwich as Mrs. Lynette Barking, Ralph Hallett as the manager of the Buona Hotel, Leela Blake as Sue Saunders, Robert Hewitt as Bill Saunders, Shirley Cameron as Mrs. Matheson, Peter Noel Cook as Larry French, Keith Williams as Dr. Manton and Frank Ward, Tom Watson as Detective Transom. Other parts played by Nigel Anthony and members of the cast. The production was by Audrey Cameron. investigates double negative by john penn with john castle the last of three classic thrillers by john penn featuring detective superintendent thorne and detective sergeant abbott the mysterious disappearance of a number of young women leads the police into a series of extraordinary exposures double negative by john penn dramatized by melville jones with john castle as thorne andrew branch as abbott Michael Cochran as Dr. Avery, Benjamin Whitrow as Professor Quentin Woods, and Jonathan Taffler as Peter Cousins. The action of the play takes place in and around Oxford. Cousins and Tim's, Peter Cousins' phone, can I help you? No, I'm afraid Mr. Cousins is out of the office at the moment, but he should be back any minute. Oh, well, if you'd like to give me details of the property, I... I'm Kate Minden, and I... Oh, I see. Of course. No, I understand. Well, I'm sure he'd be pleased to handle the sale. Yes, North Oxford is a popular area. Right, I'll tell him you'll call again after the weekend. Thank you. Chauvinist. Why does it always rain for the weekend? It's someone's law, isn't it? 
Everyone deserted you? I'll let the girls go. They were just sitting looking at the clock. Friday night fever. I can almost remember it. But you stayed. Commendable loyalty in my office manager. I thought you might bring the photographs. And you were right. You have a gift. I know. I'm wasted here. <laughs> Amazing. What? You even make that bungalow in Wheatley look attractive. Oh, I'm proud of that one. It was a challenge. I got in all of the garden and none of the motorway. Cut for you. Mm, two sugars. I'll put these in the folders. Leave it. Monday will do. But I stay. You work too hard. I've told you before. Not really. Anyway, I enjoy it. I know. I noticed. Kate, I've been giving some thought to your future here. Oh, have you? Yes. And I believe you'd make an excellent partner. But... Business partner, of course. Although if it wasn't for your boyfriend in Reading... You really think it's a possibility? Yes. I'll try to get something down in writing over the weekend, what's involved and so on, if you're interested. Of course I'm interested. I'm delighted. Good. Well, why don't we celebrate? I'll buy you a real drink, but in this boring instant... No, sorry, I have to get off. Oh, shame. Off of that lucky fellow in Reading, is it? Well, something like that. I hope he appreciates you. Look, at least let me give you a lift into town. Save you getting wet. No need to bother, Peter, really. It's no bother. It's a pleasure, Kate. You know that. Well, it's out of your way. Not at all. I'm off to the cottage for the weekend. Away from it all. That'll be nice. Very. I'll take you there one day. Oh, don't look so worried. All respectable and above board. Trust me, Kate. After all, we are going to be partners. I thought you said this was a shortcut, Abbott. It usually works, sir. Must be roadworks. Must it. Yeah, it's history, Sergeant. What is? This. Oxford was not built for the motor car. Not on a wet Friday evening. Where are they all going? Home to their loved ones, Abbott. Unlike some of us. Come on, sir. It's my first weekend off since Christmas. Well deserved, I'm sure. What will you do? Go away. Weekend break. Quite reasonable. Somewhere exotic? Chipping Camden. Very adventurous. Must be all of 30 miles away. Lovely, though. Oh, there's nothing like our Cotswolds at this time of the year. Think of me, turning over this art theft business. Telling the chief constable we've made nil progress in several thousand carefully selected words. You're not enjoying this one, are you, sir? Ten out of ten, out of <laughs> Crimes without victims. Boring. What about the owners of the paintings? Am I supposed to bleed because one rich collector steals from another? Who loses? The insurance company. <laughs> Damn, they never lose. <laughs> oh, that last movement... Round here, the gallery's just past the corner. Nowhere to park. Oh, for God's sake, use the double yellow line, Sergeant. Oh, but last if time... If you I... get a ticket, send it to the Chief Constable. At least we'll be wasting our time at his expense. Yeah. Call for you, Mr. Cousin. Oh, who is it? I said I didn't want any calls. Uh, she didn't say. Any sign of Kate yet? No, not yet. Well, where the hell is she? Shall I put the call through? Yeah, right. Uh, Peter Cousins here. Can I help? Oh, no, I'm afraid not. I don't know where she is. She hasn't contacted us yet. No, I'm sure she will. She's very conscientious. No, well, perhaps it's the traffic or she could be ill, I suppose. I'll get her to call you, shall I? Right. And that's an Abingdon number. And, and who shall I say is... Hello? Hello? Mind if I join you? Sir? Uh, of course not. But I'm not lively company, but... Oh, bad, was it, sir? Not good. We have to try harder. Get a result. Painstaking investigation. Every cliche in the book. You left out attention to detail. I don't know why he doesn't just switch on a recorded message. Oh, uh, pass the sauce, will you, sir? A plateful of chips drowned in gravy and sauce. Yeah. Weekend away seems to have sharpened your appetite. Right, it's great. We did a lot of walking. Good. You can do some more this afternoon round the art dealers and antique shops. Here, yeah, have a long list. Oh, right. What's this? Oh, oh, good. There's one in Summertown. I'm calling at the estate agents, too. Buying a house? Well, I just passed it on. Missing girl, not turned up for work. On Monday, thousands don't turn up for work. Oh, seems to be a bit more to it than that, sir. There it's better a... be more to it, Sergeant. Your time is precious to me at the moment. Don't waste it. Yes, I know. So I hope you don't think I'm wasting your time, Sergeant. Not at all, sir. 
Now, you say you've contacted her landlady? Yes, Kate left there Friday morning and hasn't been back. Is that unusual? Not really, it seems. She was away most weekends. With this boyfriend in Reading? I suppose so. Only suppose? Well... Yes, sir? You see, I don't know if there really is a boyfriend. Oh? It had become a sort of a joke. She never denied it. Or confirmed it? No. In fact, she didn't expand much on the subject at all. Shy, perhaps? No, I, I don't think that. What, then? You'd better tell me, sir. It was just an area of her life she didn't want to talk about, I suppose. You don't know much about her life outside of work, do you, sir? No. Why should I? <laughs> Quite. But it doesn't give us much to go on if she doesn't turn up. I suppose not. Well, I shouldn't worry yet. Probably a simple explanation usually is. But it's so unlike her. Kate's conscientious, reliable. This is quite out of character. That's why I'm so concerned. Yeah, I understand. Well, uh, we'll circulate a description. And if I could take this photograph. Very striking-looking girl, isn't she? That hair. Yes. She's beautiful. And you took this, you say? Yes, Sergeant, for publicity purposes. You know, staff line-ups in the local papers, that sort of thing. Oh, I see. Uh, well, we'll keep in touch, Mr Cousins, and you'll let us know if she turns up here. Of course. Hope to God she does. And in the meantime, if you remember anything else, friends, places you might have gone, anything like that, you'll give me a ring? Of course. Funny, isn't it? How little you really know about people. People you think you're close to. Yes, sir. It is quite odd. They do know we're coming, I hope. I don't want to spend the afternoon hanging around a bus station. Yes, sir, I spoke to the traffic manager. Good. If she caught a bus to Reading, the driver should remember her, especially if this photograph is a true likeness. The girls in the office say it is. That's about all they did say. Afraid so. Mm, she kept herself to herself. And she'd been there nearly a year. True. Something of a loner. The landlady said the same. You know what these bed sits are like. Pay the rent and nobody really cares if you're dead or alive. And she did confirm she was away every weekend. Ah, the elusive boyfriend. Yeah, I suppose so. Only suppose, Abbott. Oh, no one ever saw him. Cousins thinks it could have been an office joke. But she was going to Reading last Friday when Cousins dropped her at the bus station. That's what I'm assuming. That's why we need to check. So, Cousins was the last person to see her, then? Yes. And I've checked all the hospitals in a 30-mile radius. She's not been in an accident. Check the morgue. Of course, but I thought you said I wasn't... I did. I'm sure Miss Kate Minden has simply gone off on some private pleasure trail. But... It has been four days. Cousins have started pestering me. Not just you, Abbott. Word has reached our beloved leader. Oh, no. Hence, Merivale's decision that I can be spared for a few hours from the world of fine art. He wants a result here as well. My God, Abbott. Aren't bus stations depressing places? Long lines of people staring into space. Well, off you go. Talk to our traffic manager, friend. Well? Uh, he says the driver's over there. Stand seven. Come on, then. Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, it's seven, here we are. Excuse me. You can't get on here, you have to Police. What? Police. Detective Sergeant Abbott, and this is Detective Superintendent Thorne. Oh. You'd better come on, then. Thank you. Right. So, how can I help you? We understand you took out the 5.30 to Reading last Friday, is that correct? Yeah, that's right. Bitch of a night, wasn't it? Tipping it down, hate driving in those conditions. Just have a look at this photograph, please. Ah. Hmm. Recognise her? Oh, yeah. I remember. <laughs> Who wouldn't? Real looker, isn't she? So she was a passenger on your bus last night? Oh, Friday. no, not on my bus, not to Reading. But you said you remember her? Yeah, I do. I thought to myself, you'll get that lovely air of yours all wet standing out in the rain. Standing? Standing where? Well, out there at the Abingdon stop where she always stood. Always? Oh, well, yeah, regular's clockwork. Friday night. Often past her there. You see, I go out ten minutes before the Abingdon. Bus, and she and was then... definitely there last Friday. Yeah, like I say, in the rain. And so I remember. Who was driving the Abingdon bus last Friday? Do you remember? Friday. Uh, let's see. Yeah, that would have been Dickie Marshall. <laughs> you check with him. He'll remember her all right. No doubt about that. Here you are, Gov. Two teas with sugar. Yes. Hardly a productive afternoon. No, sir. Except we know she didn't go to Reading. Not by bus, anyway. Nor to Abingdon. Not last Friday. But that's where she usually went. She was quite a regular. All we've established is that she was waiting at the Abingdon stop at about 5.30, but she wasn't there when the bus arrived ten minutes later. Yeah. Do you think someone gave her a lift? I don't know. Perhaps she just got fed up standing in the rain. And went off somewhere. Caught why, a later bus. Why not? That's what I would have done. Yeah. But then what? Speculation, Abbott. 
let's stick to what we know. Which is? Two copies. That Kate Minden commuted to Abingdon at the weekends. And not to the boyfriend in Reading. Hmm. But what she does in Abingdon, we... Hey, wait a minute, there was a call. What call? Cousins mentioned it. There'd been a call for her on Monday morning from someone in Abingdon. But they didn't leave a name. Very helpful. But there was a number. I think it's in the file. For God's sake, why haven't you checked it out? Well, Make Cousins assumed it was probably one of her clients. But he wasn't sure. No. I would have thought with so little to go on, you might have followed up on a possible lead, however small. I suppose I was concentrating on the boyfriend in Reading, that angle. Sorry, sir. The boyfriend could be in Abingdon. It could have been him on the phone. Oh, no. You sound very certain. It was a woman. Cousins said it was a woman. Right. Drink up and let's move, Sergeant. Yeah. We'll go by the bypass. It'll be quicker. The bypass? We're going to Abingdon, Abbott. I'll call up on the radio, and by the time we get there, we shall have the address to match the number in your file, OK? <clears throat> Let's hope she's in. There's someone coming. Good afternoon, Mrs. Richards. Yes, uh, who is it? Detective Superintendent Thorne, and this is Detective Sergeant Abbott. Oh, yes, of course. I, I was expecting you sooner or later. Really? Oh, yes. May we come in for a moment? Well, I have to meet Zelda soon. Zelda? My granddaughter. I made her from school. So we won't keep you long, Mrs. Richards. Oh, better come through. Thank you very much. Uh, this way, please. Uh, oh, oh uh, mind the bike. <laughs> Boy, oh, I'm sorry about the mess. Uh, Zelda's had all her pace now. Oh, I know what it's like, Mrs. Richards. I've got a six-year-old. Oh, have you? Yeah. Zelda's seven and a half. Oh. Good as gold, really. You wouldn't know she was in the house. She lives with you? Yes. I thought you knew. I found out somehow. May we, uh, sit down? Oh. There are some questions. I'm sorry, of course. I'm, I'm in such a state. I'm so worried. Just, uh, uh, put the books on the floor. Abbott. Yes, sir? Books. On the floor. Oh, yes, sir. She is all right, isn't she? Nothing has happened to her, has it? Happened to who, Mrs. Richards? To Kate, of course. Well, that is why you're here, isn't it? May I ask why you're so concerned about Miss Minden? Concerned? My daughter goes missing, and I'm not supposed... Well, yes, I... I thought you must know. Otherwise, why are you here? You made a call to your daughter's office on Monday morning, Mrs. Richards? Oh, yes. She told me never to call, but I was so worried. I... Do you know why she told you she didn't want you to call? Because they didn't know about Zelda. That's why I haven't been to the police myself. I just kept hoping from minute to minute. Is Zelda Kate's daughter? Yes. Yes. Why does it have to be a secret, Mrs. Richards? Well, I know it must sound stupid, but Kate insisted. She said, if you're a single parent, employers don't take you seriously. She's very ambitious, you see. So you look after Zelda whilst your daughter acts out the life of a single woman in Oxford. Okay, it's very conscientious. She comes home every weekend. And I love Zelda. This is her picture, you see? She's my life now, Superintendent. No. Since my husband died. Nearly two years ago. Ah, oh, she's very pretty. <laughs> And Zelda's father? Oh, dead. He's dead. So you and your daughter are both widows? Yes. Well, that's why we set up house together. I hope this doesn't sound tactless, Mrs. Richards, but I have to ask if we were to find Kate. Does your daughter have anyone else in her life? A special friend, perhaps? No, or a... uh, she didn't want that. Not after... Not after what she'd been through. Oh, of course, but she's young, attractive. I wondered whether she mentioned anyone to you. Oh, I'm sure there's plenty you'd like to take up with her. That bath, for one. Peter Cousins? Yes, he's asked her out, but she puts him off. But there's no one else, you're sure? I told you. Why'd you ask that? What's happened? You tell me, what's happened? She's all right, isn't she? Please tell me she's all right. Well, I'm not convinced. Not by that charade. But if the girl is really ambitious, it makes sense. You know what it's like for working mothers and a single parent... The world to... is full of single parents, Abbott. Hardly a rare species. So why else would she be so secretive? I don't know. Besides, I don't suppose it matters. What? Kate Minden is playing some kind of a game, isn't she? It doesn't seem out of character that she should decide to take herself off somewhere. But it might have got her into trouble. Danger, even. <laughs> you think she might be lying in a ditch somewhere? It's possible. Of course it's possible, but is it probable? Some bloke could have picked her up at the bus stop. One of the things we know for certain about Kate Minden is that she's intelligent and disciplined. She doesn't sound the sort to take lifts from strange men in the middle of Oxford on a busy Friday evening, does she? 
So what do we do next? You, Sergeant, not we. I can't spend more time on this, not on a missing person. It's back to missing paintings, far more important in Merivale's eyes. But if it was more serious... I'm sure, I hope, it won't be. Difficult to know what more I can do at the moment. One, find out about the late Mr. Minden. Two, obtain details from the marriage certificate. His family, friends, might give you a lead where she could have gone. Hmm, sounds like a lot of paperwork. Well, you asked what you should do. Painstaking investigation, attention to detail. And no shortcuts, no shortcuts. Play it by the book. Hmm. Haven't you finished that yet? Yeah, nearly there. How many sees in Picasso? Just the one. And only one K in Constable. What? Joke. Ah. Oh. Yes? Oh, then. Um, sorry, sir. Urgent file for Sergeant Abbott. Oh. From the Met. Thanks, Harry. Okay. Aha, here we are. And there he is. Stephen Wayne Minden. Oh, nasty looking piece of work, isn't he? Oh, I knew it was all a charade. Widowed indeed. Oh, I suppose he was taken from her, in a manner of speaking. Yes, not interred, but interned. Released on parole four weeks ago, only served three years. You yeah, know how they shovel them out. Good for home office statistics. Yeah, there was a lot of money on that job. None of it recovered. Quite, so perhaps Kate thought it was time for a reconciliation. Well, they were separated before he went inside. Their friends from the old days told me that. Maybe but they also told you how ambitious she was, tight with money, didn't they? Yes, but all put aside for the little girl. So perhaps she wants to send Zelda to Rodine. Oh, I agree it fits. She couldn't tell anybody, so she just takes off after the money. And I've no doubt she'll come back for Zelda in a few days' time and they'll all live happily ever after. Yeah. Sir, you're right then, sir. Nobody's in ditches. And we must be grateful for that. Right, Abbott, pass what you've got onto the Met. Yeah. They can try chasing the money. We have other priorities, I'm afraid. Mm, art treasures. At least I can tell Merivale we seem to have got a result with the Minden girl, can't I? Yes, I suppose so. Come on, come on. And about time, Brian Doyle. About time. You made it, then? What's it look like? What did he tell him this time? That I was going to see Sarah to discuss the biology essay. <laughs> we'll have our own biology lesson, eh? In Copley Wood. Oh, stop it, Brian. Don't talk like that. You know you like it. Come oh, here. Not now. Someone could see us. Come on. Just take a beer. Just a pint or two. Get me going. Nasty rough, aren't I? You should listen to your dad, you know. If we're going somewhere, let's go. I, I've got to get back. Right. Dying for it, aren't you? Well, jump up then. You know where to hang on. That's it. Nice and tight. <laughs> Morning, sir. Have you got a minute? Not really, Abbott, but come in anyway. I'm up to my eyes in Van Dyke's. Yes, what is it? Another missing girl, sir. Sergeant Morris oh, of Columbia God's just called sake, up. Oh, for sake, Abbott. If you're going to pester me every time some restless adolescent goes missing... Yes, she is, too. What? An adolescent, almost 17. Well, they always are. It's a restless age. They end up sleeping in cardboard boxes in London. It's a sad fact of life, man. I do know that, sir. Yes, well... I'm sorry, but... I wouldn't have bothered you with it, but there are similarities. Similarities? That's why Sergeant Morris at Columbury got onto us. Oh, at least he's one of our brighter country cousins. He was struck by the physical similarities too, look, sir. Hmm. Pretty girl. Who is she? Mary Rush, only daughter, very respectable family. That doesn't mean Mary shares their moral outlook, does it? She was doing her A-levels. Quiet, steady worker. I think you should hear what Morris told me. All right, tell me about it. She went out a couple of evenings ago to see a school friend. At least, that's what she told her dad. But it wasn't the truth. No. It seems she was going out with a local yobbo, Brian Doyle. He's got a bit of minor form. Raves, drugs, punch-ups, that sort of stuff. Ah, oh, yes. One of the new rural pursuits. So what does friend Doyle say for himself? He admits picking her up. Says they went to Copley Wood. It's a local beauty spot. I had a picnic there once. With banana sandwiches, I'm sure. Get to the point, Abbott. What happened in Copley Wood? Doyle says they had a quarrel and she ran off. Is that all? Yes. The local police have searched the wood, no sign of her. No sign of a struggle. 
Neighbours say that Doyle came back at the time he said. I see. She just vanished in the wood. Is that what you're saying? Sergeant Morris can't make any sense of it. That's why he got into us. That and, as I say, the similarity with Kate Minden. The long hair. The long auburn hair, yes. Morris remembered Kate Minden's photograph. We circulated it to all stations. Coincidence, Abbott. Besides, we can explain why Kate Minton disappeared. We think we can, but we could be wrong, sir. No one has seen her for ten days now. And you think we're wrong? That I'm wrong? Well, I, I don't know. I'm just not sure. If it will put your mind at rest, I think we could clear this one up pretty quickly. How? Doyle. He needs leaning on. Morris wouldn't know how to handle that. I think if Doyle was asked the right questions in the right way, he could tell us exactly why he quarrelled with Mary Rush. Look, how many more times I've told you everything? No, I don't think so, Mr Doyle. I have. No, I want to go away right, you know. But why should she run away? What did you do to Mary Rush, Mr Doyle? Nothing. She ran away from nothing? Just a quarrel. I told old Chubby Chops Morris. You told who? Old Morris. I told Sergeant Morris that we had a quarrel. What about? I said, what about? Tell me what you argued about. Well, she didn't want... Well, she said it wasn't... What didn't she want? Tell me. You know. Sex. She didn't want you to have sex with her. Is that it, Mr. Doyle? Yes. Had sex with a lot of girls, have you? Had you made love to Mary before? An easy lay, was she? Well? No, not all the way, you know. I see. She was a virgin, was she? Well, I don't know. Yes, I suppose so. So you tried to rape her, didn't you? No, it wasn't and like that. And she resisted, fought and screamed, didn't oh. she? That's when you lost control, when you tried to silence her. Did you put your hands over her mouth? Is that what you did, Mr. I didn't, Doyle? I didn't do anything. You're strong, aren't you? Wouldn't take much to stop her, to shut her up, to oh, shut her up for good, keep wrong. her quiet, stop her saying anything. No, I told you how it was. You've got no right to say... I have every right. Don't you forget that boy. <sighs> Abbott. Just remind me what Mr. Doyle told Sergeant Morris in his original statement. Uh, here we are. Uh, we kissed and fooled about a bit, but she got a bit edgy. That's how it was. Be quiet. Carry on, Albert. She said she thought someone was watching us. Who was watching you? Did you see anyone? No. I told her she was just imagining it. And according to you, that's when she ran off? Yes. And didn't you run after her? Well, not for a bit. I thought she was just messing about. And then? Well, after a minute or two, I went looking for her. But she'd vanished into thin air. You asking us to believe that? Well, the woods are thick there. You can hide easy. That's what you thought she was doing, playing hide and seek? After you just tried to rape her? I didn't. Don't you say that. So where had she gone then, Doyle? I don't know. Well, perhaps in a car. Car? I told Sergeant Morris. I thought I might have heard a car drive off. Thought you might have. You're making that up, aren't you? It's rubbish. No. It was faint, but I'm pretty sure... Well, she might have got in it. On the other hand, she might not. She might still be in Copley Wood, exactly where you left her. There, there you go, sir. Pint of that special. Oh, uh, thank you, Albert. Hmm, nice place, this. Yeah. Mary and I come out here for a drink some weekends. Oh, that's good. Shame you're driving, Albert. Yes, sir. Well, at least the lemonade's cold. I needed that. Well, what do we make of our yobbo friend? He didn't admit to anything, did he? Oh, hardly expected him to, did you? I really thought... Look we were at the facts. Get... They've been through Copley Wood with a tooth comb. Not a thing. There are several neighbours who report Doyle coming home on his motorbike at the time he said, acting and looking quite normal. Hardly the demeanour of a man who just raped, murdered and buried Mary Rush. So what did happen, sir? Well, probably like you said, he went too far, she got scared and ran off. And then? Who can say? <sighs> it seems she comes from a strict home, very religious parents. Perhaps she felt ashamed, dirty, couldn't face them. Mm -hmm. I expect she'll show up in a day or two, they usually do, you know. So, just another teenage runner, then? Mm. And no connection with Kate Minden? Not even with the physical similarities? Good figures, the long red hair? Well, there's nothing else to link them, is there? And they both had reasons to take off, Kate to find her former husband... And Mary Rush? What was she running from? Her parents have it. Domestic restraints. You wait until your daughter grows up a bit. Oh, thanks. Now, two disappearances are probably coincidence. Show me a third, and I'll begin to get worried. Just try to keep the weight off it for a day or two, Mrs. James. Nothing broken. Excuse me, Dr. Avery, can you take a call? Uh, who is it, Nurse? Linda Jackson. All right. Um, if you just carry on with the bandaging. Uh, I won't be a moment. <clears throat> Linda, I thought I told you... No, no, don't worry. I, I guess it must be important. 
<laughs> well, that is important. Yeah, got it. Um, turn down a regular two. Yeah, regular two. And put on the bottom shelf. Fine. I'll get a bottle of wine on the way home. Hmm? Uh, what time is your tutorial? Who, who's it with? Oh, Quentin Woods, eh? Well, don't drink too much of his sherry. You know how he fancies you. Yeah, bye, darling. See you later. Please, just a small one. Not driving, are you? Only a bike. Well, then. There you are. One modest tot. Thank you. Oh, hardly modest. Shallow draughts intoxicate the brain. And drinking largely sobers us again. <laughs> Pope? Yes, well done. Your erudition never fails to delight me, <laughs> Linda Jackson. I'll drink to it and your research project. <laughs> oh. You really think it's taking shape? Absolutely. In fact, I'm very impressed. Yours is an incisive and original mind. Well, I... Beauty, too. A rare combination, my dear. That's the sherry talking, I think. Oh, you're far too modest. I, I believe you have a very bright future. Possibly even here, in this college. The research fellowship? You think there's a chance? Oh, yes, indeed I do. Of all my postgraduate students, you, my dear Linda, are the shining star. I am whispering your glory at high table. Notice is being taken. I hadn't dared to hope. <laughs> I'd give anything to stay in Oxford. Well, I'll do what I can, trust me. You're very kind. It's my pleasure. Uh, please don't think me rude, but I really should go. Oh, uh, so soon? If you'd finished with my essays. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, they're, um, <clears throat> they're on the table uh, somewhere. Oh, here we are. Thank you. Oh, this is new, isn't it? When did you take this? Mm -hmm. The baby? Um, yes, yeah, amusing, isn't it? Do, do you like it? <laughs> yes, it's fun. Wasn't <laughs> it hard, though? Well, uh, well, getting the child to keep still, you mean, to keep looking at the camera. And to tolerate that huge satin bow round his middle. Oh, yes, she loved it. I, I must have a way with children. <laughs> Who is it? Uh, my granddaughter. I hate to admit. Granddaughter? Mm. You hardly seem old enough. No, oh, kind of you, my dear, but I... I fear so, time's winged chariot hurrying near and all that. For all of us, Linda, even for you. <laughs> time's winged chariot. Dr. Avery? Yes, please. Detective Superintendent Thorne, this is Detective Sergeant Abbott. Uh, come in, please. Uh, in there, if you would. You're the one in charge, aren't you? The missing that's girls? Right. I read it in the papers, so that's why I specifically asked for you. I understand your concern, Doctor, but there may be no connection. If I could just establish some facts, perhaps. Yes, of course. I'm so sorry. Uh, please do sit down. Oh, thank you, sir. I I'm just not thinking straight. I I've been up all night just walking around looking for her. I, I thought perhaps she'd had an accident, been knocked off a bike or something. But she hasn't. We've checked. So where is she? I have to ask you this, Dr. Avery. You hadn't quarrelled with your fiancé, had you? She might... No. We were planning a celebration dinner. What were you celebrating? Um, my birthday. I see. We've been looking forward to it. You see, I, I sleep at the hospital most nights when I get any sleep. But not last night? No, I have a couple of days off. And when you're not at the hospital, you share this flat with Miss Jackson, is that it? Yes, Helps Linda with the rent. I'm sure. Who else lives in the house, do you know? The landlord. Well, well landlady, actually. A, a Miss Foyle. Just her? No, she, she has a companion, Miss Gower. They have the upstairs between them. Have you asked if either of them saw Linda come or go yesterday? No, I, I didn't think to. I, well, we don't have much to do with them. Abbott, yes, perhaps you could just nip upstairs. Yes, sir. When did you last see your fiancé, Dr. Avery? We spoke on the telephone yesterday afternoon. And she seemed perfectly normal, not stressed. Quite the opposite. She left instructions about dinner. We joked a bit about Quentin. Quentin? Uh, Quentin Woods, her director of studies. She had a tutorial with him. Did she go to it? Have you checked? Yes, of course. It was the first thing I thought of. But perhaps he kept her late, talking. Did he often do that? Well, a bit. Talking about her work, you mean? That and other things. What other things? Oh, I don't know. Does it matter? It might. It's no secret. I, I think Quentin fancies Linda, you, you know, in a harmless sort of way. And you didn't mind? No, not really. I mean, he's old enough to be her father. And last night, was there any talking? No. He said she left properly, anxious to get home. At least that's what he said. 
but she never got here. It's sugar, Sergeant. Two, please, oh, Miss Garvey. Oh, sweet tooth, I see. Yeah. <laughs> there. Oh, uh, thank you. Mm hmm. Mm. It's lovely. Darjeeling. Oh. Oh, I'm sorry we can't be more help, Sergeant, but we really don't pry into other people's business, do we, Betty? Certainly not. I just thought you might have noticed Miss Jackson leaving the house. I was engaged in the back garden all the afternoon. I would have seen nothing. Oh, we're very keen gardeners, you see. You could really imagine you were out in the country. And yeah, back. yeah, I'm sure. Um, how old do you know Miss Jackson and Dr. Avery? Hardly at all. Mm -hmm. They're perfectly satisfactory tenants. That's all we ask. Oh, of course. So you were happy to have them in the house? An old house like this requires a deal of looking after, Sergeant. We have to rent out the flat economic necessity. Oh, and we've been so lucky with our tenants. We had a visiting professor from America, Maudlin, charming man. Yeah. And now the young doctor and Miss Jackson. She's a lovely girl, you know. Uh, quite striking, I understand. Tall, mm. long auburn hair. Yes. Oh, I do hope she's all right. One does read such dreadful things. Rightful. And I shall need photographs of all three girls. Right, sir. You've arranged to have extra lines opened and manned? Yes, sir, from 6.30. Good. Someone in this area must have seen one of them. The reward might help, sir. The local papers will splash it tonight. A thousand pounds might stir the odd memory. Yes. Cousins must be really fond of Kate Minden to offer that sort of money. And if we find her, we won't be far from the others. I was wrong, Abbott, wasn't I? Badly wrong, complacent. As you said, it looked like coincidence until the third. And Linda Jackson is different. There's no evidence she had any reason to disappear. She had everything going for her. Well, perhaps this television appeal will turn something up. I hope so, Abbott. Three disappearances, three lookalikes. There's a pattern now, you see. And that's not good, is it? It suggests planning. Planning. And I'm beginning to see obsession. Someone who's dangerously unbalanced. We need to find these girls quickly. Good evening, sir. See what you started out there? My God, the power of television. Well, you came across very well, sir. Natural star quality, fluent. Yes, everything. thank you, Abbott. Anything useful turned up? Yeah, a couple. I've got the details here. We've had the usual cranks, of course. Uh, of course. And dozens of reported sightings from the breadth of the land, no doubt. Oh, they mean well. I expect so. Well, there are two so far, you said. Yeah, a retired headmistress says she saw Kate waiting at the bus oh, stop. Oh, come on, Abbott, we know that. The two bus drivers... Hang on, so there's more. She also saw a car stop and pick Kate up. Did she know? Yeah. That's better. But the driver? Did mm. she see the driver? Oh, yeah, that's the problem. You see, she was waiting on the other side of the road trying to cross. Uh, you remember what the traffic was like that yes. night? Well, she remembers Kate at the stop. Uh, when she saw a picture on the television tonight, it came back to her. And? She noticed a car pull up, but then one of those big R ticks stopped in front of her. By the time it moved on, Kate and the car are gone. And she didn't get sight of the driver? No, it was raining. The windows were all misted up. The car, then? She's not very good on cars, I'm afraid. Oh, she must have noticed something, damn it all. She thought it was blue, blue or green. A great help. Well, I'll go and see her, of course, but I don't think she'll do much better. At least we know it was a car. She was picked up. Yeah, true. Then, perhaps... Doyle wasn't lying when he said, I thought I might have heard a car drive off. Perhaps Mary Rush did go off in a car. But Linda, why should she get into a car so close to home? And what happened to her bike? Oh, I don't know if we're much further on, Abbott. Yeah. And the second call? Ah, oh, well, he wouldn't give his name, but uh, someone wanted the reward money, the thousand pounds. Well, there'll be lots of nutters claiming that. Yeah, of course, but he knows Kate Minden all right. Details he gave me about her and so on. Look. I see. Now, that is interesting. Is he coming in? No, oh, no, refused. We, or that is you, have got to go to him. He'll be in the, uh, this pub. We found it on the map just here. Look, uh, I've got directions. Just you, he said. Take anyone with you and he won't talk. And you have to take the cash with you. Draw it from petty cash to her. I told him it didn't work like that. And what did our mysterious friend say? Take it or leave it. Well, I think I'd better take it, don't you? Oh, come, of course. Keep up. No, 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 no. You stay here. Monitor the calls. But, sir, he could be dangerous. That's all right, Abbott. I'm a policeman, remember? I got the distinct impression he didn't like policemen. No, I don't suppose he would. Not if he's who I think he is. <laughs> Mind if I join you? <laughs> Detective Superintendent Thorne. You by yourself, like I said. Quite alone. You better be. I don't trust you bastards. Not always seen eye to eye with the law, have you? Mr. Minden. 
How the hell did you know I've who I... have seen your mugshot. Good likeness. Once you sniffed money, I thought you might call. So, where is it? Oh, really, Mr. Minden. Information first. Now, where is your wife, Kate? There. The whore. Look at her. Certainly looks like her. Well, of course it bleeding is. I should know, shouldn't I? Miss High and Mighty C always was. Now look at her like that. All trussed up like some bloody chicken. <laughs> I didn't know she was into that stuff. Never let on to me, the bitch. How do you know about these pictures of your wife? Oh, I didn't. But why? Look, I've been in prison, haven't I? Cooped up. Not set my eyes on a woman. So you were just browsing, is that it? Snuffling in the porn trough? Look, don't you stop preaching How do I know me? these photographs are recent? Well, it's this month's edition. Just out. Look at the date. That doesn't mean the pictures are new, does it? Your wife might have posed for these a long time ago. Oh, no. Not when she was with me, she didn't. Not when she was my wife. I'd have sorted her oh, out. Oh, you're a man of stern morality, Mr Minden. Grievous bodily harm is one thing, but you... I don't have to listen to this. I want the money. Sit down, Minden. That's better. The reward was for information leading to the whereabouts of your wife. These pictures don't tell us where she is, do they? Well, find out who took them, then you'll know. Possibly, and then, and only then, will we consider the matter of the thousand pounds. You sod. What really matters to you, the money or your missing wife? For all I know, you might have met up with her since coming out. You might... You're mad, you Just leave your address with me, Mr Minden. I'm sure your parole officer would like it too. Oh, and, um... I'll give you a receipt for your magazine. I should have known better than to trust a pig. Take my advice, Mr. Minden. Try to keep out of trouble. Bastard. It's in Clapham, south side of the common, he said. Right, well, we'll be there about 3.30, fix it for then. Yeah, they don't just publish girly mags. Uh, he was very keen to tell me that, was Mr. Sharp. Probably thought we were the vice squad. <laughs> <laughs> he said the Kate Minden set of pics came in about three weeks ago. Which was when she disappeared? Yeah. But why should she turn to that? I mean, it seems way out of character. I agree. We know she was ambitious for Zelda, but not enough to prostitute herself. Do you think she was forced? Possibly, and that worries me. And what about Minden? I mean, was that just coincidence, him picking up that magazine? Well, I don't think he has the guile for anything too complicated, but I could be wrong. I just don't see what connects these three girls. Apart, that is, from their physical similarities. Two from the city, one out in the sticks, different lifestyles, no point of contact. That we know about. Indeed. Someone knew all three. But who? Doyle? Uh, he's always boasting about his reputation with the ladies. I can't see him mixing in Linda's circle, can you? Don's, doctor's son? Hardly, but we must rule nothing out. All we know for certain is that Peter Cousins admits to being with Kate just before she vanished and that Brian Doyle was with Mary Rush and that tutor chap... Clinton Woods. Right, he was the last one to see Linda. That we know about. Unless she did make it home, in which case Paul Avery comes into the frame. Yes, Something struck me about the good doctor. He was evasive over one point. Did you notice? No, afraid not, sir. Just a small thing. When I asked him what their celebration dinner was for, he hesitated before saying it was his birthday. I wonder why. He had a lot in his mind, didn't he? Not thinking straight. Probably. However, I think we have to check them out, all of them. Let's find out where they were, who they were with, when all three girls disappeared. Right, sir. Get back to Sergeant Morrison Cullenbury. Might be quite a bit tougher this time round. He didn't take kindly to Doyle calling him chubby. He can interview Doyle. <laughs> you can go back and see Mr Cousins. Have a word with Avery, too. Oh, what about Quentin Woods? I'll see uh, Uncle Quentin. A morning in the groves of Academia, but very good for me. One hesitates to criticise a fellow academic, I contend that Professor Wellsberg has not only misinterpreted the poem, but misinterpreted his misinterpretation. <laughs> right, well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. We shall resume the entertainment in the same place, same time next week. Uh, thank you, Dr Woods. Very impressive, Dr. Woods, if I may say. Stimulating. Oh, thank you. I don't believe I've seen you at one of my lectures before. Are you a mature student, Mr... Sadly not. No, this is a unique occasion. The North Sagas, is that your field? I'm afraid not. Sir, that's my field. Oh, I see. A somewhat unorthodox approach, if I might say. I didn't want to take up too much of your valuable time. How considerate, but I fear you may be wasting your valuable time. I really can add nothing more. Yes, I've seen your statement. I'm desperately concerned, of course. Of course. He's a most talented student. Attractive, too. Yeah, as you say, uh, attractive, too. However, after Miss Jackson left my I've house... I've not come to ask about Miss Jackson. I beg your pardon? The other two girls. You know about them? Right. 
know about the case uh, from the papers. Please look at these photographs for me. Look, I don't Please. see why... Well? Have you seen either or both of those girls before? No. Sure? Positive. And now, if you'll excuse me... I'd like you to do one more thing for me, Dr. Woods. Well? I want you to try to remember where you were and who you were with on two specific occasions. Oh, this is silly. Perhaps. Yeah. And tricky. So if I just tell you the dates and times now, I'll call back in a day or two to see if you've remembered. I'll come to your house, shall I? Out of office hours? But you surely don't think I had anything to do with Kate's disappearance? All the others. We have to check everything, Mr. Cousins. Well, I dare say, but I was very fond of Kate. I am very fond of Kate. Even though... Yes. Even though. What do you tell me about her past? That doesn't change anything, Sergeant. Of course. Uh, perhaps if I could just ask you to think back, sir. Where were you at the times I've mentioned? Well, it's very difficult, Sergeant. Can you remember where you were at a particular time a week or so ago? It's my job to remember, sir. Well, I'll try. Tell me again. Saturday 17th, fortnight ago. Let's see now. Saturday the 17th. Here we are. I worked in the morning, looked at a couple of properties. Where? Um, both in North Oxford. May I have the addresses? Yes, but I'm sure the owners will recall my visit. I'm sure they will. And in the afternoon? That's easy. I went to the cottage. I go most weekends. Alone? Yes, Sergeant. Alone. This cottage, sir, where is it? Aston St Mary. You know it? Oh, it's a lovely spot, yeah. It's one of my favourite Cotswold villages. I have a flat in town, but I need to escape from time to time. Tell me, sir, Aston St Mary, uh, how far would that be from Copley Wood? From Copley Wood? Oh, not far. Three or four miles, perhaps. Oh, really? As close as that. And the evening Linda went missing, he said he was in his flat? Yes, but alone. Stayed in all night. A solitary man, our Mr Cousins. Not married, no girlfriends. Did he tell you that? No, the girl's in the office. But he likes women, you say? Well, they say. He really does fancy Kate, they reckon. Enough to snatch her away. And Mary, and Linda. He certainly doesn't come across as a weirdo. Neither did Crippin. But he was near Columbury when Mary Rush vanished in Copley Wood. Brian Doyle was nearer, and he can't account for his movements when the two others disappeared. Morris has talked to him? Yes, claims to have been out on the town, drinking. Which town? Oxford. He doesn't deny that. Then he could have been... It's possible. What about Dr Avery? What did he have to say for himself? Junior hospital doctors raced around like scalded cats. He was on duty officially on every occasion, but uh, if he'd disappeared for half an hour, no one would have noticed... It's like a madhouse, there. Eh? Oh, very encouraging. Round here, Robert. Why? Two miles to Clapham. Uh, one thing, though. You were right about his birthday. What? I checked with the hospital administrator. Avery's birthday is in two months' time. Well done, Abbott. Now, why the hell should he lie about that? I don't know, sir. Doesn't make much sense, does it? Nothing makes much sense at the moment. But once we find out who took those photographs... All our printing is done here, Superintendent, on these machines. If we could go somewhere quieter, Mr. Sharp. Oh, yes, of course. Come into the office. Thank you. I thought you'd like to see the whole setup. Not at the moment. Oh, well, please do sit down. Thank you. On the telephone, I was led to believe... What did you lead Mr. Sharp to believe, Sergeant? Nothing, sir. Just asked about the pornographic pictures. I did explain that particular magazine is a very small part of our business. Not a part I take any pride in, but market forces, you know, there does regrettably seem to be a demand. You publish obscene material, Mr. Sharp. Well, I There are laws which cover that. I haven't broken them, really. I no, have Perhaps not. My colleagues in the vice squad would know. But surely if you're totally it. honest with me, Mr. Sharp, if I can rely on your full cooperation, there may be no need to involve them. Who sent you the pictures we're interested in? Calls himself Brown. Speak up. Brown. J.P. Brown. Really? How unusual. The, the slides were unsolicited. Most of our material reaches us like that. But you must have an address to pay him. Let me guess. An accommodation address. A box number. Afraid so. Uh, a box number in Oxford. Well, if you give it to us, I dare say we'll track it down. And I shall want the original slides. Not that I expect much from them. They'll have been well handled. Yes, I... I put them ready for you. Yeah. And, uh... The new ones. New ones? What new ones? This morning's post, just after I'd spoken to the sergeant. From the same source, J.P. Brown? Yes. Here we are. Uh, same girl, but with another girl. Uh, you'll see, I'll put the slide in the light box for you. There. A tableau. That's what we call it when What's there's that? more than... What you call it? Yes. 
That's a merry rush, though, isn't it? We tight. I shall need to take these slides. Of course. I confess I would have used them. You see, Mr. Brown's work is of a high technical quality, although it does uh, lack animation. Good God, man, of course it lacks animation. Look at the expressions in their eyes. Those wretched girls are out of their minds. I'm sorry? Drugged, Mr. Sharp. Heavily sedated in some way. Oh, dear, I didn't realise. Believe me, I would never tarnish our reputation. If you wish to preserve one shred of your tattered reputation, Mr. Sharp, you will do two things for me instantly. Of course, anything. Send payment for these new slides in the usual way to this accommodation address. Yes, yes, I will. And if you receive any more material from J.P. Brown, you will contact me on this number. I understand. But do you think there will be more? Oh, I think there might. Another girl. I see. Am I to be told what this is all about? No. I wouldn't want you to compromise your integrity. You despise me, Superintendent, don't you? You can redeem yourself, Mr. Sharp. Send that money to J.P. Brown and you will help us apprehend a degenerate and dangerous man. You might even be saving someone's life. You're just in time, James. Closing up soon. Mr. Hunter. That's me. I suggest you close up now. We'll wait. Hey, what? Oh, I see. Chief Superintendent Thorne and this is Detective Sergeant Abbott. So, what can I do for you, gents? We'd like a description of one of your customers. Get dozens in here for fags, A newspapers. special customer, one that uses this accommodation address. Well, I do that for quite a few people, too. We're only interested in one, Mr. J.P. Brown. So? You do have a customer of that name? Yes, I think so. Only think? A lot of people pick up mail here. But you keep records? Not really. Accounts, of course, all strictly kosher. But we know J.P. Brown used your services recently. Didn't he, Mr. Hunter? Could be. So what yeah. does he look like, this Mr. Brown? Hard to say. Nothing special. Come on, you can do better than that. Height. Tall or short? Medium, I'd say. Medium height. Not fat, not thin. What about accent? Any accent? Never spoke much. Just handed over the package. Well, not much to talk about, is there? You're telling us nothing, Hunter. Sorry. I'd like to help, if I could. Well, you can, and you will. Oh? From tomorrow, there will be several plainclothes officers here out in the back. When Brown shows up, as he will, sooner or later, you will identify him to the officers. Is that clear? Can you do that? I mean, can you make me? Would you rather I called in the VAT inspectors and the forward squad to examine your accounts, Mr Hunter? Would you like that? Oh, you're not going to eat that sausage, sir? Hmm? No, take it. Oh, oh. I've suddenly lost my appetite. Mm. Oh, something in the paper, is it? United lost again. Never bothered an evening one. How could he be so bloody stupid? Who? Oh. Look. Where? That headline, Missing Girls, New Lead. He assured me he'd say nothing. And Chief Constable Merivale promised that an arrest was imminent in the case of the three missing local girls. He revealed that officers had uncovered a link between the girls and a pornography racket. What has Merivale got for a brain, mushy peas? If Brown reads this, he won't go anywhere near Hunter, will he? Not if he's got any sense, he won't. Coming. On time. You're a punctual man, Mr. Brown. <laughs> I hope you don't mind me phoning, but well, I thought we ought to have a little chat, eh? Come through to the back. It's nice and private there. I got a nice drop of scotch. Oh. Oh. God. Well, let's have the light here. Right. Uh huh. Not one blow, but several. Mm. I can cover the spill of the fact. Ah, yes. uh, the seventh cavalry, too late as always. <laughs> Lesion right here. Yeah. Compound fracture. Yeah. Yeah. They're in here, sir. Good morning, Thorne. You knew the deceased, they told me. Not a good friend, I hope. He could have been a useful one. What have you got so far? Uh, almost everything. 
I can tell you how, when, and where, but not, I fear, who. So? Time of death between 10 p.m. and midnight, stopped from behind with a blunt object. You still call them blunt objects, do you? Several blows. It was only a small man. It didn't require great strength. And he was put off guard, I should say, the drink. Glasses on the table. Uh, spits in a cosy chair. Poor sod. I don't think the autopsy will tell me much more. We'll take him away when you finish. Right. Albert, I'll carry on here. You get the house to house going. Someone in the street might have noticed something last night. Not a good word to say for him. No one in the street. They reckon he was up to all sorts of shady fiddles. My guess is that Hunter was going in for a spot of extortion. He saw the newspaper article and put two and two together. You know, it'd be in character from what the neighbours told me. But they saw nothing. Nothing of Brown. All inside watching the box, weren't they? But this lady opposite... Ah, uh, Mrs Fleming. She was sure about a car? Oh, yes. She went to bed about 11. As she was drawing the curtain, she saw this car pulling away. Could have been anyone in the street. She said it was a car she didn't recognise. She knows most of them. An observant lady. Bit of a nosy park, I'm all right. Well, I thank the Lord for curtain twitches. And she is certain that it was a Ford Escort. Yeah, convinced. The son-in-law has one. So, what do we have? A green or blue Ford Escort. It's hard to tell the difference in the dark. But that was what the retired headmistress thought as well. The car that picked Kate Minden up at the bus stop, that was blue or green. It does sound as if it might be the same car. Perhaps Doyle was right. It could have been the same car that took Mary Rush away. And this time we do have a bit more, the number. Uh, not much of it. She's pretty sure it was an F, Bridge, and the first number was a four, but that's all. That could be enough. How many blue or green escorts with those characteristics are registered in Oxfordshire, Abbott? God knows. God and Swansea, get onto them. Their computer will give you a list. Yeah, but... I mean, it would take forever to check them all out, and the car might have been registered of anywhere. Of course, but have you got a better idea? No. No, I suppose not. In the meantime, we shall need to check again on the whereabouts of Mrs. Cousins, Doyle, Avery and Woods. They shouldn't have any problems remembering where they were last night, should they? Sir, aren't we forgetting Steve Minden? He's got form, he's out there somewhere. Oh, no, I've not forgotten. I saw him as the most likely contender. I put out an APB on him. That's why I know he didn't kill Hunter. How can you be sure? He spent last night in the cells at Banbury Police Station, arrested after a pub brawl. Wonderful, isn't it? He was the one I suspected most. So... Until we have anything further to go on, we'd better eliminate the others. You sure you don't want a cup? No, thank you, Dr. Avery. You don't mind if I do? I shan't stay awake without the caffeine. Please. I haven't slept much the last week. No, they work you too hard. And the worry. If I close my eyes, I keep... Think... We're doing all we can, Dr. Avery. Yeah. In the paper, it said you were going to make an arrest. I would have thought by uh, now... There have been a I'm... few setbacks. I'm sorry. I'm sorry to have to ask you more questions, but it is necessary. If it will help, Linda. I hope it will. So, if you would just tell me where you were last night, between nine and midnight. Me? Why should that have any... Please. At the hospital. I, I was on duty until this morning. You were there all night? You never left? Correct. Oh, well, well no, that's not strictly true. Please be strictly true, Dr. Avery. Well, we take breaks. We have to. I, I just took a stroll to get a breath of fresh air. We have... Um, where did you stroll? Um, just in the grounds. Uh, it, it was a warm night, and I kept thinking of Linda. How long were you away? About half an hour, I suppose. What time was this? Uh, well, I'm not sure. Uh, must have been about 11. Casualty was quiet when I got back, so the pubs couldn't have shut. Do you have a car, Dr. Avery? Mm-hmm. Where do you keep it? Well, at the hospital. Parking's hopeless here. The landlady has the use of the garage. What make? Well, nothing very grand. Not at my salary. A Ford. An Escort? <laughs> no, a Fiesta. A clapped-out Fiesta. I've checked, sir, and Doyle definitely doesn't have a car. Just his motorbike. But... But what? His dad has a blue Escort. F. Reg? No, much older, eh? I suppose our curtain twitcher could have been mistaken. She only got a glimpse. Oh, she seems so certain. I reckon, too, she can tell a fiesta from an escort. I'll check with her again, but she didn't have any doubts. Left here, under the bridge. And Doyle was out in the piss again. Well, he never seems to do anything else. A terrible hangover. Couldn't remember much about last night. He'll remember if I get hold of him. Not that I really see him behind this. It's all too clever, the photographs, accommodation address. That's all beyond Doyle. What about Quentin Woods? Conference in London, three days devoted to Anglo-Saxon heroic verse. Really? Oh, they're in with me. It went last night about eight o'clock. Not in a blue escort, by any chance? By train, or so his housekeeper said. Which leaves just cousins. Yeah. 
I don't see him in this. Why put up a thousand pounds of his own money? Would you do that if he was guilty? I would. That's just what I would have done, Abbott. Oh, I don't know. He doesn't come across like that. You'll see. Mm, perhaps. If his office is right, he ought to be at a site meeting about an hour put down, Abbott. Yeah, I'll do better than that, sir. I'm sorry, Sergeant, but a lot of money is involved here. This had better be important. It's sir, I assure you. Yes, well. This is Mr. Carson, Superintendent. This is really very embarrassing, Superintendent, being hauled out in the middle of a site meeting. I dare say, Mr. Cousins, but this is now a murder inquiry. We won't keep you long. Yes, of course, I'm sorry. You're sure this man, Hunter, was connected with Kate and the other girls in some way? Yes. But how can I help? Simply by telling us where you were late last night, sir. Oh, not that again. I'm not stupid, and I know you have to suspect everyone... But don't you understand what I feel about Kate? I suppose I'm half in love with her. Not that I said anything, but I will, when you find her. If you would just tell us, sir, last night... I stayed in the flat, and before you ask, I was alone. And you were in all evening? Yes, nursing a cold. Really? Seems to have cleared up? Yes, it does. You must let me know what pills you take. Look, is there anything else? They're waiting for me. There is a recession. Do you have a car with you, Mr. Cousins? Yes. The red one over there. Why? Nothing. Well, we mustn't detain you. Nice spats they're building here. Expensive. We're handling the sales. Is that why you have a camera with you? Glossy pictures for the brochure? Yes, something like that. I use it all the time. Keen on photography, then, are you, Mr. Cousins? I know a bit about it. Helps in this job. Yes, I expect it does. Never know what might turn up worth photographing. There you are. Come away from there. What are you doing? Playing? Then what you got there? Leave it. Oh, get out of that water, you stupid animal. Come on. Oh. oh, no. Oh, my God. bit more complicated, this one, Thorne. More of a professional challenge. Another friend of yours? No. There's no doubt it is Kate Minden, sir. No, I'm afraid not. We'll bring her mother in, do a formal identification. We'll try and tidy her up a bit, but she'll still look a mess, I'm afraid. Bad facial scarring. What caused it? Do you know yet? Some sort of acid, probably fuming nitric. Or hydrochloric. Possibly, I suppose. What makes you think of that? It's used regularly in photographic processing. <laughs> Yeah, it's as if she's been scalped. Oh, why should anyone do that? You're sure she was dead before she was put in the river? Absolutely. No water in the lungs, you see. And apart from the acid burns, no marks of violence, no sexual abuse. So what killed her? My surmise at this stage is heart failure. Heart failure? Probably induced by the acid attack. You see, she suffered from a heart abnormality. The sort of thing you find after a childhood attack of rheumatic fever. Perhaps that explains her passion for success, her thriftiness. She wanted to ensure her child was provided for. Poor little Zelda. She was vulnerable, certainly, and a massive shock to the How system. She a struggle. She, she tried to get away or something. Um, when she died, whoever was keeping her panicked and dumped the body in the river. But why go to the bother of shearing off the hair? Yeah. Whoever did this must be mad, crazy. They don't always have reasons, do they? Oh, but they do, according to their own deranged logic. The hair is significant in some way, I'm sure of that. I'll confirm all this for you in my report. Oh, there's one more thing you should know... She had been massively sedated. I expected that. Any idea what with? Not one of the major tranquilizers. Mm. Cover her up, Sergeant. You know, I'll never get used to this. Never. Nah. Poor kid. Oh, oh, Dr. Avery. I'm sorry to disturb you, but I knew you were in. Good morning, ladies. Uh, will you come in? Uh, uh, no. We were just going out shopping when we heard the news on the radio. What news? Well, they found the body of one of those poor girls... What? ...in the river. Yes. Oh, no. Who? Did, did they say? Did they, did they say who it was? No, but we thought you should know. I, I mean, I'm sure it wasn't your... your Miss Jackson, but... Yes, but it could be, couldn't it? Let's not mm. pretend. Now, the police. Well, they would know, you see. 
Well, they came here, didn't they? The, the, the ones in charge. Of course, I, I was going to... We have the car out. We can drive you there. Yes. It won't take a moment. It would put your mind at rest, wouldn't it? For God's sake, what's happened? I was going to contact you, Dr. Avery. It isn't Linda. I know, of course, that it's still terrible. But I'm afraid it means she's in great danger. We have to find her and Mary Rush. I can't have anything less than your full cooperation. So stop lying to me, Dr. Avery. What do you mean, lying? It wasn't your birthday, was it, the day Linda vanished? Oh, that. No, I, I'm sorry, but there was a reason. Tell me. Well, Linda and I, you see, we're, we're married. We have been for a year, and it was our anniversary. Why the secret? Money. Linda's grants and bursaries would have been affected by a change in her status. I suppose it must seem a bit of a cheat, but well, we could Quite afford... Quite a practice deception. Is there anything else you've been deceiving me about? No. Did you take photographs of your wife, Dr. Avery, of an intimate kind? No, of course I did. Why, of course? Is that so shocking to you? Oh, Linda hated having a photograph taken. Well, you know, so, some people are like you that. You mean you tried it and she wouldn't cooperate? No. But, but I knew she had a thing about it, she told me. I mean, she once had a minor row with her tutor over it. With Quentin Woods? Yes. He's a camera freak and he wanted her to pose for him. I mean, nothing sinister, just a steward old portrait, but she wouldn't. I see. Sir, I've got something. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't well, that's all right, Sergeant. Dr. Avery's just going. Oh, yes. The ladies will be waiting for me. We know where to find you if we need you. Look, you still can't think that Goodbye, I... Doctor. a bit green about the gills. I must see Woods as soon as he's back from London. Really? So, what have you got for me, Albert? The list from Swansea. Well? I got a team checking out the details. I thought it would take forever, but no, as soon as we got to the seas... As in sea for cousins? Yeah. But he's got a golf. He also has a sister, and she lives with Mum and Dad in Wanted. And? She owns a blue escort. F registered, 468 and so on. But if it's her car... Wait got a PC to call at the house, crime prevention stuff. The girl's away at college. She leaves the car at home in turn time. So, cousins could have had access to a blue escort. But why should he bother? He's got a perfectly good car of his own. But it's a connection, isn't it? I know it could be a coincidence, but what else have we got? Nothing much. And he admits he was besotted with Kate, and he takes photographs. And he's a loner. He doesn't seem to have girlfriends. Perhaps he, he can't form relationships. The other girls, well, they're lookalikes, aren't they? Kate rebuffed him, so he finds substitutes. Well, it makes some kind of sense. We can also establish a link with Columbry. He could have spotted Mary Rush there, followed her. But, Linda, we can't tie him in with Linda Jackson. I think I can. I've been back to check. Check what? The house opposite is for sale. I noticed when I was interviewing the two old ladies upstairs, I saw the sign out of their window. One of Cousin's properties, right? Right. So he must have been there. And that's when he could have noticed Linda, the long auburn hair. Another one for his collection. You see, sir? Circumstantial, but it does fit. Kate's dead. Murdered by some pervert. It's about bloody time you found him. Believe me, Mr Cousins, I understand your distress. Do you? You have a funny way of showing it with your constant snide insinuations. Well, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but I never drive my sister's car. I am not holding two girls captive in either my flat or my cottage. And if you don't believe me, go and search. I never said I didn't believe you. And another thing. I did not visit that house we're selling. I don't deal with that part of the city. May I ask who did? I can check the file. Could it have been Kate Minden? Just a minute. Yes, it was. Kate did all the work over there. Could that be important? It might be. Thank you for your help, Mr. Cousins. Is that all, then? For the moment. You find him, Inspector. Because if I find him, I'll kill him with my bare hands. And you needn't come and call on me, then, because I'll come down to your office and I'll boast about it. Sherry, Superintendent. No, thank you, sir. You, Sergeant? Uh, no, not for me, thank you. Then I shall drink alone. I need it. These conferences can be extremely tiresome. And you've only just come back, sir? About 20 minutes ago. The train was late, of course. Did you stay in London overnight? Mm, in my club. It's very peaceful there. People would remember you, I dare say. <laughs> well, you'll have to ask them, won't you? You must play these silly games. The other dates I left with you. Have you been able to... I've taken advice, Thorne, for personal reasons and to avoid embarrassment to, uh, shall we say, 
A lady friend, I don't care to discuss my movements with you. I'm under no obligation to do so. This is a murder inquiry, Dr. Woods. Two deaths. I would have thought that outweighed any worries about your sordid little peccadilloes. How dare you talk to Your reputation as a womanizer is hardly a state secret. I think you better Did leave. you exercise your charm on Linda Jackson? Did she rebuff you, is that it? I'm going to call my solicitor. You may well need him. I understand you had an argument with Linda because she refused to let you take her photograph. No. No, 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 it wasn't like that. You, you, you can't believe that. Please. Tell us how it was then, sir. I'm a keen photographer. I specialise in portraiture. Linda has a wonderful bone structure, so I simply asked her to sit for me. But she refused? Yes, but, I mean, there was no argument. I, I, I made a little joke of it. Did you? It was a genuine interest. I take photography seriously. I mean, look around you. This is all my work. Yes. Very impressive. This picture of the baby. Yes, my granddaughter. Do you like it? It's most unusual. Abbott, does this remind you of anything? No, I don't think so. Hang on, that bow. The satin bow. Very distinctive knot, isn't it? Remember the first pictures? The ones of Kate alone? She was trussed up in a satin cord, wasn't she? Of course, and the knot. I'm sure it was the same. Do you ever send any of your photographs away to specialist magazines, sir? Pornographic magazines? That's an appalling question, Superintendent. But I had to ask it, sir. How did you get the idea to present the baby like this, tied in a bow like a chocolate box? Please, sir, it's very important. I, I can't pretend it was an original idea. Several years ago, I saw a similar picture in a photographer's window in Reading. I bought the print. Do you still have it? Uh, somewhere. I, I could try and find it for you. If it's urgent. It could be. Yes. Well, it might take several hours. I'll leave you my number. Please let me know as soon as you find it. I'm trying to do these checks on the tranquilizer prescriptions, but you know how doctors hand them out like sweeties. It could take forever. We don't have forever. We have to find those girls quickly. What about the car numbers? Uh, I pulled them off that once we found Cousin Sister. And get them on it. I don't think Cousin's fits. Well, who do you think does fit? I'm not sure if we're looking for one man, even. To abduct and hold three girls. That needs more than one person, Abbott. I suppose one could be a woman. But this J.P. Brown character could have a wife, a girlfriend, you know, someone besotted by him. Thorn here. Yes, put him through. It's Quentin Woods. Morning, sir. You do? Excellent. Yes. Yes, I've got that. And just the name Vic? Thank you. I'm very grateful to you, sir. That's the address of the photographic studio, is it? Yes. The original was the work of a photographer who simply signed himself Vic, so Wood says. We'll need a car, Abbott. All right, sir. Oh, what about Uncle Quentin? Are we forgetting about him? I right? think so, for the moment, anyway. He did letch after women. He was the last one to see Linda, and he wouldn't say where he was. Oh, yes, a uh, car for Superintendent Thorne immediately, please. But as far as we know, he doesn't own a Ford Escort. He didn't know Mary Rush or Kate Minden. He was hardly likely to be concealing two women in a house we visited. And he's a distinguished professional man. Yes, I was quizzing, sir. Touché. But if you're talking of doctors, your theorising must have brought you round to Dr Avery. Well, I admit it had crossed my mind. He could get hold of the drugs. He could have seen Kate at the house opposite, or she might have visited the hospital. Because of her heart condition? Yeah. Uh, it struck me too. But where could Avery detain three women? And where's the connection with Mary Rush? No. I think we're better employed tracking Vic in Reading. It's our one lucky break in this investigation, those photographs of Kate and of the baby. I'm nearly convinced they're taken by the same person. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry to disturb what? you. Oh, uh, do forgive me. It's always so quiet in the afternoons. Did you just want to browse, or were you looking for a particular title? Uh, neither, I'm afraid. We're police officers. I see. Superintendent. How can I help you? I'm Sylvia Turk, by the way. Turk Books, that's me. How long have you had this bookshop, Mrs. Turk? Oh, forever. Well, nearly ten years. Others come and go in this street. I just carry on. The photographic shop next door, how long has that been for sale? Over a year. But can you wonder in the present economic climate... 
To think we were once a nation of shopkeepers, Superintendent. It looks in a pretty poor state. What happened to it? Surely you remember. It was a terrible tragedy. The police were all over the place. Oh, once the fire brigade had finished. A fire? An accident? Oh, no one seemed to be sure. In the end, the coroner plumped for accidental death. Who died in the fire, Mrs. Turk? Mr. Stein, the owner. Such a nice old man. He often used to pop in for a chat. He lived over the studio. Was Mr. Stein's first name Victor? Oh, no. Richard. Richard David Stein. You must be thinking of his assistant. That was Vic. Brilliant photographer, Vic. Everybody said so. That's why the business flourished. It was such a pity they quarrelled and over such a silly thing. Who quarrelled? Vic and Mr. Stein, of course. So where's Vic gone now? I don't know. I've never seen her again. Her? Vic was a woman? Oh, sorry. Didn't you know that? Yes. Middle-aged lady. Not much to look at. Not interested in men, I imagine. But wonderful with a camera. This quarrel, what was it about? <laughs> Such a stupid thing. I suppose one shouldn't laugh, but you have to see the funny side of it. Of what, Mrs. Turk? Well, Mr. Stein told me the story in confidence, of course. It seems that one day they were working in the studio and he tripped over something. He clutched at Vic to steady himself, as one does... And to his great embarrassment, he pulled her wig off. So striking it was, too. Lovely reddish colour. Well, more auburn, I should say. I'd never guessed, though I suppose it was a bit at odds with the rest of her appearance. How did Vic react? Furious. You see, poor Mr. Stein was so overcome, he burst into laughter. Well, he couldn't help himself. You know, nervous laughter. Vic stormed out. She never worked for him again. How long after that did the fire take place? Oh, quite soon. A few weeks, at the very most. If Vic was a woman, that would explain why the girls were off guard. Why they might have got into a car with a stranger. And it took no great strength to kill Hunter. Or perhaps as a male accomplice. You said two people. Yes. But a man? No, 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 I don't think so. Hair, yeah, the photography. There has to be a connection. I'm sure of it, but proof. To find evidence, that could take months. We don't have that time. You saw what happened to Kate. How long before another body turns up? Vic. Oh, she could be anywhere. It's been over a year. The car numbers. Perhaps you'll find something there. Oh, that's this evening written off. Hmm. Won't go down well at home, either. I said we go out for a drive. Really? Yeah, often do on a summer evening, you know. Broadway Hill, Copley Woods, Burford. Yeah, I promise What did you Mary. say, Albert? I was just thinking, well, we might Copley go... Copley Woods? You said you'd drive out to Copley Woods? Yeah, people do. It's lovely out Brilliant, there. Brilliant, Albert. Do you know what you are? You're quite brilliant. You do understand, Mr. Cousins, that if need be, I shall deny this meeting ever took place. Deny ever being in this pub. Yes. You've made it very clear. You see, I remember what you said. What you'd do if you ever found Kate's killer. Well, I believe I have. What? But I can't prove it. But surely... My superior is a cautious man. He wants more evidence before I can ask for search warrants. But by then, it well, it might be too late. Well, you're not asking me to strangle anyone with my bare hands. Did I really say that? You did, in a heat of the moment, I expect. I wouldn't, of course. Couldn't. No, I don't believe you would, Mr. Cousins. But you think you can do this? If it goes wrong... If it goes wrong, or if you're wrong, then I will have caused great distress to an innocent person. Yes, I realise that. And I can't help you. You'll be on your own. I don't see you had any choice, sir. It's not too late, Albert. This is against all regulation, so you can get out of the car and walk away. <sighs> I gave up over promotion a long time ago, if sir. If this goes wrong, you could be joining the three million unemployed. I saw Kate Minden on that slab, sir. It's worth the risk. How did you persuade Cousins? I didn't have to. I think he really perhaps did love Kate. What time was he going to be there? Ten. He'll be in the car park and see us arrive. Then it's up to him. I hope your information is reliable, Abbott. It's nearly ten now. I think so. With a neighbour like that, you don't need community policing. I'm glad you don't live next to me. He looks sir. Look, garage doors. Good. Yes, we're in business. Green Escort. Got it. It was on the list, of course, just as you said. And only the driver. That's very good. 
Right, Albert. Now, not too close. Keep well back. Mr. Kingdon Customer Services, please. Mr. Kingdon Customer Services. I can just see them, sir. Two bays away. He's close now. Uh, good morning. I understand you wanted to see me. I'm the manager. Good morning, sir. Police. Oh, dear. What's the problem? No problem. Just routine. We're doing a general security review. Supermarket break-ins are on the increase uh, locally. And... Really? We've had no trouble. I assure you we run... <laughs> Sounds as if you've got some now. Come on, Abbott. Yes. How dare you? You did that deliberately. I'll you got in some... my bloody way, you silly cow. That's enough of that. I'm a police officer. Uh, just move along, ladies and gentlemen. Please stand back. If you're a policeman, then arrest this lout. He deliberately attacked me. Old bag was in my way. That's no excuse for violence. Violence? I tripped over a stupid trolley. I just grabbed that up. That's not true. It's Miss Foyle, isn't it? Yes. But how did you know? Don't you remember I came to see you a week or so ago about Linda Jackson? Oh, yes. Lucky for you we were here, Miss Foyle. If you'd like to take Miss Foyle to the manager's office, Abbott. Sir. What for? Just so we can take a statement. There could be a case for prosecution here, common assault. Assault? What are you talking about? And you, young man, will come with me, quietly. I'm not sure if I want to be bothered with this. I need to get back. I'm afraid I must insist, Miss Foyle. Violence cannot be tolerated. Violence? It was an accident, wasn't it? How the hell was I supposed to know she was wearing a bloody wig? Abbott, will you tell the manager not to let anyone in here? Right, sir. You were very convincing. Quite the larger lark, Mr. Cousins. When I grabbed her hair and it came off, I nearly carried on. Put my hands round her throat. But it still doesn't take us all the way. I'm sure she's Vic. I know she has a car that matches the description and she has an accomplice, Miss Gower. And you can tie her in with two other girls. Linda lived in the same house and Kate came to the house opposite. They would have seen her then. And Mary Rush. I can explain that as well, thanks to Sergeant Abbott. Huh? Well, you see, if Abbott goes for evening drives to Copley Woods, then why not Miss Foyle and Miss Gower? They're country types, fresh air and gardening. I'm sure that's where they saw Mary, running in distress away from her boyfriend. <sighs> She'd be grateful for a lift in that state, wouldn't she? Yes, from two kind, middle-aged ladies... They might even have been watching her for days. And she fitted their requirements with her long auburn hair. Well, you'll find Mary now, won't you? Her and Linda. Poor Kate. I'm sorry, Mr. Cousins. Very sorry. But I could still have got it all horribly wrong, even now. Well, we'll soon know. What do I do when we get there? Stay in the car. I've bent enough rules for one day. Yes? Miss Gower? Yes. Police. Uh, May I come in a moment? Uh, well, it's not really very convenient. Just for a moment? Uh, Thank you. Um... I expect you know I'm heading the investigation into the death of Kate Minden, as well as the two missing girls. My sergeant called on you, I believe, Sergeant uh, Abbott. Uh, yes, about poor Miss Jackson. Oh, I'm afraid there was very little we could tell him. Indeed. We're still a long way from finding them, I have to say. Oh, dear. So we have to double-check everything. Look everywhere, that is, in any way connected with the case. You understand that, I'm oh, sure. Well, yes, but... Uh, this I... house is connected with the case. Linda Jackson lived here. Oh, yes, in, in the downstairs flat. I know. Illogical, really, but my superiors do insist. It won't take me more than a few moments. Purely routine. Uh, Shall we start down here? Oh, no. Uh, no, it, it, it's not convenient now, and it's pointless anyway. I agree, but that's the way the system works, I'm afraid. We just have to plod on. Now, shall we start in the kitchen? I warrant. A search warrant, you must get one. Oh, I hardly think we need be as formal as that, Miss Gower. Do we? <sighs> I was so sure. So sure. Nothing. You looked everywhere, sir. Everywhere. Every room, every cupboard. She seemed so nervous, particularly when I asked to see the attic room. But nothing, nothing there. You said room. Attic. Room. Yes. There are two parallel. We sell a lot of these houses. You're sure? Yes. There'd be a connecting door. 
There was a screen against the wall. The door will be behind it. This time you're coming too to help with regulations. <laughs> I had no idea. <laughs> it's locked. The key, Miss Garn. Now. Oh, I've got it. I didn't know. <laughs> Stand by. <laughs> Mr. Cousins. <laughs> the light. Oh, here. Oh, God. Miss Jackson? Mary? I didn't want to. She made me. She did. Nothing. I'll tell you nothing. You're not obliged to. Did Sergeant Abbott tell you that, Miss Boyle? I did, sir. Your friend, Miss Gower, has been most cooperative. Told us everything. You forced her, she said. Bullied her. I can believe that. You can believe what you like. An accident, she says. Kate tried to escape. A struggle. Was it like that? Never mind. Linda and Mary will be able to tell us in due course. Once they've recovered from what you did to them, drugged, bound, degraded, what have they ever done to you, Miss Foyle? Tell me that. Help me to understand. You? What could you know? How they flaunted their beauty, abused it. How did they abuse it, Miss Foyle? To amuse men. Men like you. Because that's all you see. It's all you want, isn't it? The rest of us are filth, lower than the animals. Girls like that. Don't expect me to cry for them, because now they know what it's like to be ugly, to be used. No, Miss Foyle, I don't understand. But fortunately, I don't need to. I can leave that to others. Nice out here. You've got to admit it. One of your better ideas. Oh, I needed the fresh air after that venom, that hatred. It must have been about here they picked up Mary Rush. Yes, poor kid. They'll be all right. Oh, in time. Physically, anyway, the bruises will heal, the hair will grow. But mentally, who knows what scars will be left on the mind. Uh, Miss Gar's statement gives us all the details, anyway. She was very much the submissive partner did what she was told. She admits driving the car to hunt a shop, but she just waited outside, and she insists Kate's death was heart failure. Do you believe her? Uh, I might if it wasn't for the acid, the sculpt hair. That was Miss Foyle, or Vic, as she used to be. That one could be capable of anything. There's such hatred there, more than I've seen for a long time. But it's calculating and controlled. Not insane, then? Oh, I don't know. Such a fine line. She's got a coldly rational side to her. Look at the way they brazenly drove Avery to see me the morning that Kate was found in the river. Yeah, why did they do that? Oh, so he would confirm for them that it was Kate's body. I see. Oh, very calculating. That sounds sane enough to me. They hated Kate's beauty and destroyed it, driven by an obsession. Pornography is the key. I don't understand that part of it. It degraded the beauty she both envied and hated. And if you think about it, it gave her power over men. I've no doubt we shall have a belly full of psychiatrist reports before we finish, but my guess is the incident with Stein, the wig, and setting fire to his shop tipped her over the edge, ignited the paranoia. So she is mad, then? Well, beyond reason, anyway. We'd better get back. It's getting cold. And the chief constable will be wanting our report. Ah. Oh, um. What are you going to tell him, sir? About cousins? That business in the supermarket? I shall gloss over it, Abbott. Not confuse him with details. After all, he's got something to tell the press. Take their mind off the art thefts. Will we get away with it, sir? <laughs> Why not, Abbott? We got a result, didn't we? We got a result. John Castle played Thorn. Andrew Branch, Abbott, 
Jonathan Taffler, Peter Cousins, Michael Cochran, Dr Avery, and Benjamin Whitrow, Quentin Woods, in Double Negative by John Penn. Brian Doyle was Matthew Morgan, Kate Minden, Jane Whittenshaw, Steve Minden, David Holt, Mrs Richards and Mrs Turk, Kate Binchy, Hurst, Philip Anthony, Mary Rush, Teresa Gallagher, Linda Jackson, Sandra James Young, Miss Foyle, Diana Payan, Miss Gower, Jill Graham, the pathologist and Mr Sharp, John Baddeley. The play was dramatised by Melville Jones from John Penn's novel Outrageous Exposure. The director was Martin Jenkins. The Four Just Men is a detective thriller published in 1905 by the British writer Edgar Wallace when the Foreign Secretary Sir Philip Ramon receives a threatening, greenish-grey letter signed Four Just Men. He remains determined to see his aliens' extradition bill made law. A device in the members' smokeroom and a sudden magnesium flash that could easily have been nitroglycerine leave Scotland Yard baffled. Even Fleet Street cannot identify the elusive Manfred, Gonzales, Piercart and their a four just men dedicated to punishing by death those whom conventional justice cannot touch. <laughs> We present The Four Just Men by Edgar Wallace. Adapted for radio by Colin Davis. In the Café des Nations in Cadiz in 1906, four mysterious characters meet to plot a path of terror to London. The Four Just Men, Part One. <laughs> ah, these Russians are droll. Who is it this time? The governor of one of the southern provinces. Huh? Let me see. Killed? Ah, who ever killed a man with a bomb? Oh. Uh, yes, yes, I know it's been done, Leon, but so clumsy, so primitive, mm. so very much like undermining a city wall that it may fall and slay, amongst others, your enemy. Exactly. The prince was severely injured and the would-be assassin lost an arm. Leon doesn't approve of it either, do you, my friend? Mm -hmm. If I remember rightly, you have a conscience in these matters. You know I used a bomb only once. And not by my wish. Yeah. You remember surely, Pocard. Mm. I advised against it. It was a miserable little matter. And I was in Madrid and they came to me some men from a factory in Barcelona. They said what they were going to do and I was horror-stricken. I begged them almost on my knees to use some other method. My children, I said, you are playing with something that even chemists are afraid to handle. Mm. If the owner of the factory is a bad man, then by all means exterminate him. But shoot him. Wait on him after he has dined and is slow and dull and present a petition with the right hand and with the left. So. <laughs> but they would listen to nothing I had to say. I remember several people died. Mm. And the principal witness at the trial of these experts in explosives was the man for whom the bomb was intended. <laughs> it was your right. <laughs> Precisely. <laughs> uh, hmm. You are not laughing, Terry? I do not profess to be a great man like you, senores. Half the time I don't understand what you are talking about. You speak of governments and kings and constitutions, causes. If a man does me an injury, I smash his head. I do not know how to say this, but you kill people without hating them. Men who have not hurt you, that is not my way. Your way, my dear Terry, is a fool's way. You kill for benefit, we kill for justice, which lifts us out of the rock of professional slayers. No. When we see an unjust man oppressing his fellows, when we see an evil thing done against the good God and against man, and know that by the laws of man this evildoer will escape punishment, we punish. Listen, Terry. Once there was a girl, young and beautiful up in the north, and a priest, a priest, you understand? 
the parents winked at it because it is done so often. But the girl, she was filled with loathing and shame. She would not go a second time. No. So he trapped her and kept her in a house. And then when the bloom was gone off her, turned her out and I found her. She was nothing to me, but I said, here is a wrong that the law cannot right. Uh, so, one night, I called on the priest. Said I wanted him to come to a dying traveler. He would not have come, but I told him that the dying man was rich, was a great person. Uh, he mounted the horse I had brought, and we rode to a little house on the mountain. I locked the door, and he turned around so, trapped, and he knew it. What are you going to do, he said. I am going to kill you, senor, I said, and he believed me. I told him the story of the girl. He screamed when I moved towards him, but he might as well have saved his breath. <laughs> Let me see a priest, he begged, and I handed him a mirror. <laughs> <laughs> bueno, bueno. They found him on the road next day without a mark to show how he died. Perfect, perfect. Listen, if you can kill as you say you can, why have you sent for me? I was happy at Jerez, working at the wine factory. There is a girl there. When I received your message, I thought I should like to kill you. Understand I am happy, and the old life is forgotten. Perry, listen. It is not for you to inquire the wherefore and the why. We know who you are and what you are. We know even more than the police about you. We could send you to the Garotteri. Madre mia. We need a fourth man. We would have wished to have had one animated by no other desire than to see justice done. A man like ourselves. But failing that, we must have a criminal, a murderer, if you like. One whom we can, at a word, send to his death if he fails us. Do you understand, Terry? Yes. But who are you? You would do better to ask who we were, my friend. We were the three. Now we are once again the four just men. It was early autumn, October the 14th to be precise. The editor called me in. Me. Hardly been on the daily megaphone for three weeks. Never had a story, not a real one. And he wants to see me. I thought, what have I done? Or what have I not done, more likely? So, up I go. In the office, shut the door, ready to face the music. He was sitting at his desk, reading the Times. Welby was with him, the foreign editor. A famous man, will be. Hmm. Yes, Gov? You read the Times, Carter. Well, if I can't sleep, no. <laughs> Well done, lad. Yes, well thank done. you, Jim. Yep. Sorry, Archie. Well, not reading the Times can sometimes be a mistake, Carter. Just because they can't tell a good story from a garden fete, eh, Jim? <laughs> Have a look at this, Carter. Uh, where, Gov? Bottom of the page, short paragraph. Foreign secretary, threatening letters. Down at the bottom. Oh, doubt if it's much of a story. Blimey, 50 quid reward for information? <laughs> That's not bad, is it? Know the Foreign Secretary, do you, Carter? Know Sir Philip Ramon? No, of course I don't, Gov. Well, go and get to know him. Make an appointment. Go down Portland Place and get the story of that little paragraph, eh? I want to know who's threatening him, why and what for. All right? Well, yeah, all right, Gov. <laughs> but why me? Never ask why, lad. Not in this game, anyway. Someone gives you a break, you take it. Ford's at the palace, Green's at the Old Bailey, Trout's on holiday. You're the only man I've got free, Carter. That's why. Right, hop it, son. Don't let the grass grow. Oh, yeah, sugar, sugar. Oh, oh and uh, Carter, huh? if you could get a copy of one of those letters... Uh, do me best, Gov. I, I mean, I'll try to remember to ask, Gov. Thanks, Gov. Thanks a million. So, that's how I got it. The first real story I'd ever had. You know, at that time, I was so green, I thought you could just walk in and demand an interview with the Foreign Secretary. Well, as it turned out, 
Invincible ignorance and a bit of cheek actually paid off. Uh, Your Excellency, uh, that's you, is it, sir? It is. Oh, yes, of course. Sorry, sir. Um, the bill that you're about to pass through the British Parliament is an unjust one. Well, what bill is that, sir? The Aliens Extradition Political Offences Bill. Oh. We have to pass it as a result of the insecurity of the succession in Spain. It's absolutely imperative, you see, that neither this nor any other country should harbour propagandists like this Garcia fellow, who are attempting even now from the security of these shores to set the whole continent of Europe ablaze. Yes, of course. <clears throat> uh, your bill is calculated to hand over to a corrupt and vengeful government men who now find an asylum in your country from the persecution of despots and tyrants. We know that in England, opinion is divided and that on your strength and yours alone depends the passing into law of this bill. Therefore, it grieves us to warn you that unless your government withdraws the bill, it will be necessary to remove you. Signed, the four just men. Blimey. You have heard of them? Well, I can't say I have, sir. Well, they sound a... Well, a rum lot. The four just men are known in every country under the sun. Oh. Individually, we should like very much to know who they are. Rightly or wrongly, they consider that justice as meted out here on Earth is inadequate and have set themselves about correcting the law. And they were the people who assassinated General Trelovich, the leader of the Serbian regicides. Oh. They hanged the French army supplier, Conrad, in the Place de la Concorde with a hundred policemen within call. What? They shot Herman Lebois, the poet philosopher, in his study for corrupting the youth of the world with his reasoning. Here is a list of some of the crimes. Oh, uh, thank you, sir. Uh, is this uh, secret information, sir? Until now, yes. You may retain the list, however. The activities of these men must now be made public all over the world. But, um, well, it says here one of the four died. Correct. Two years ago, after the shooting of Le Bois, by some hitch in their almost perfect arrangements, uh, one of the four was driven to bay in a cafe in Bordeaux. Before he was killed, he shot a sergeant de Ville and two other policemen. <laughs> He was photographed and the print circulated throughout Europe, but who he was and what he was, even what nationality he was, is a mystery to this day. So, there aren't actually four of them anymore, then? They may have recruited another. They may be working shorthanded. We can't tell, I'm sorry to say. So, you see, I have decided to make this public through the press in order that the danger of this sinister force should be recognised. Mm. And my second reason is that the public may, in its knowledge assist those responsible for the maintenance of law and order, and by their vigilance prevent the committal of further unlawful acts. <laughs> Did Ramon really say that? Well, it's word for word, sir. Honest, Governor. Better be, son. Now, now, of come along, he's... Archie. Stop teasing the boy. He's done well. I didn't think the Foreign Secretary would see him, I'll tell you that. For a first story, lad, this one's got all the makings of a scoop. Funny old cove, this Ramon, though. Hey, well be. He never drops his guard, never drops his dignity, never wavers. What one calls a strong character, I believe. Yes, well, he'll need to be this time, won't he? With this bunch threatening to bump him off? Oh, he won't back down. Not if I know Ramon. You mark me, Archie. Come hell or high water, Ramon will not back down. It was, though I say it myself, as a result of my story in the megaphone that Sir Philip Ramon and his bill became big news overnight. The crowds that came out to cheer him next day when he was driven to Downing Street for the cabinet meeting were the biggest he'd ever attracted in his life. He wasn't a popular man, Ramon, but he was in peril. And there's nothing that brings out the British public in greater numbers than the chance of getting a sight of a man who is about to be done away with. Good luck, Sir Philip! No show and show! Yeah. 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 
we have every excuse for dropping the bills. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There are matters of far greater importance. Breakweight's unemployed bill must go for a start. Yes. Mm-hmm. And what the country will say to that, heaven knows. No, no, no. For goodness. It shall go through, Prime Minister. I insist oh, on that. I am determined. Uh, we are breaking faith with the Cortes. We are breaking faith with France. We are breaking faith with every country in the Union. I have promised the passage of this measure, and we must go through with it, uh, even though there are a thousand just men and a thousand threats. Forgive me for saying so, Ramon. But I can't help feeling you're rather indiscreet to give particulars as you did to the press. Yes. I, 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 I know we agreed you should have a free hand, but somehow I did not think you would be quite, well, well quite so candid. My yes. discussion in the matter, Sir George, is not a matter that I care to discuss, thank you. Very well. I met a chap for lunch at the Carlton, though. He has rather convinced me there is something to be feared. I've just come back from South America, seen some of the work done by these men. Oh, really, sir? No, 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 no. Do listen. President or something, one of those... Rotten little republics. About eight months ago, they hanged him. Oh, Lord, Ma- no. Most extraordinary thing in the world. They-, they took him out of bed in the middle of the night, gagged him, blindfolded him, c- carried him to the public jail, gained admission, and hanged him on the public gallows. And they escaped. Guy, old chap, are they done in there? <coughs> Close my division in five minutes. Have to vote, I suppose, or be elected for, after all. <coughs> Not even time for a spot of thought of a case, uh, right? I say, guess who? Uh, just a minute. I say, I say. The foreign secretary, eh? Didn't expect to see him tonight. I say, Ramon, look here. Well, what's all this about uh, threatening letters, eh? Well, speaking as one who gets uh, two or three every day of his life. Oh, go to the table, man, for God's sake. God, beast of temper, the man's got beast of temper. In the old days when Basco there was a young member... Uh, Funny, I thought Basco'd pair. What? I said I thought old Basco'd pair. Oh, so did I. Usually pairs. Saves a chap coming in for division. But as I was saying, in the old days... Uh, when... Ah, division. Come on, guy. Save the old days for later, huh? I know what I'd do if I were Ramon. Go to the police, I would. I say, some gentleman dropped this. What? what? <laughs> well, it's letter. I don't need my eyeglass. What is it? To the members of the House of Commons. Oh. Company prospectus. I get hundreds. Only the other day. Oh, too thin for a prospectus. Oh, Peyton medicine, then. Well, I'll be damned. What? What is it? Well, letter. Citizens, as well as it. Citizens. Good God. What? Well, it's signed before just men. Um. Are you going in, gentlemen? Um, uh, no, no thanks, Bates. We'll give this one a miss. Go on, uh, old chap, anyone, go on. <laughs> the citizens, uh, we have informed Sir Philip Ramon that unless he withdraws his aliens' extradition bill, we will surely slay him. He's loath to take this extreme step, but knowing he's otherwise honest and brave. Ramon, brave? Man's in a blue funk. <clears throat> so... We are asking members of the Mother of Parliaments uh, to use their every influence to, to force the withdrawal of the bill. As an earnest that our intention is no idle one, we beg you to search beneath the table near the recess in this room. Near the recess? I say. There you will find... A machine sufficiently charged to destroy the, the, the greater portion of this building? Good. Will! Will, what, what are you doing? I'm something. What? Stand back. It's some sort of black box. Well, you, just, just a minute. There's a postscript. Come on, man. What's it say? Now, we've not placed either detonator or fuse in the machine. It may therefore be handled with impunity. Oh. Here comes Leon. Oh, excuse me. Quite on time. Excuse me. Thank you. Thank you. Ah, oh, my friends. It is good to see you. You had a successful mission, Leon. We saw it in the evening papers. Indeed. But there was nearly trouble. What? As I went in, I heard someone say, I thought Basco had paired. One of the members almost came up and spoke. A lucky escape, you know. Oh, are the two close for comfort? Was it a hoax? 
Commissioner? No, it was just as the letter described it, Prime Minister. Even to the absence of fuses. Was it really enough? Enough to, to wreck the House of Commons, sir. It's very, very serious. Oh. Very, very serious. Well, at least we know they're in London, these four just men, whoever they may be. Look, we've said so much to the press commissioner, we may as well continue. Right, sir. Give them the whole text of this letter. And we'll offer a reward, I think. £1,000 for the arrest of the man who left this thing. And a, a free pardon and a reward to any accomplice. Yes, sir. I'll see to it, sir. Very good. Oh, oh uh, have your people found how the machine was introduced, Commissioner? Uh, no, sir. I've interviewed all my officers separately. They remember seeing no stranger either entering or leaving the house. Oh. Thank you, thank you, Commissioner. Sir? Tell me, who have you got on the case? Uh, one of my best men, sir. Huh? Detective Superintendent Falmouth. Falmouth. Very good. Thank you, thank you. Prime Minister. I'm sorry, Commissioner, but I must be blunt. Oh, you always are, Falmouth. You can't catch men when you haven't got the slightest idea who or what you're looking for, I sir. I know that. For the sake of argument. There might be women, for all we know. There might be black men, Chinamen, tall, short. Why, we don't even know their nationality, sir. They've committed crimes in almost every country in the world. They're not French because they killed a man in Paris, or American because they strangled Judge Anderson. Very well, Falmouth. Point taken. Are you seeing, Sir Philip? This afternoon, sir. Uh. I shall do my best, sir. But I'll say it again. We have very little to go on. So, do you think there's any danger, Superintendent? No, no. Not real danger, Sir Philip. No. Uh, you wonder why I still go ahead with the bill I expect in the light of what danger there is? <laughs> yes, sir. Well, it will surprise you to learn, whatever you may say, that I do not know of the danger, nor can I imagine it. What death will be, what pangs or peace it may bring, I have no conception. You see, I argue with Epictetus that the fear of death is by way of being an impertinent assumption of a knowledge of a hereafter and that we have no reason to believe it is in any worse condition than our present. In spite of the fact that I have a weak heart, I'm not afraid to die, Superintendent, but I am afraid of dying. Do you understand? Uh, quite so, sir. On the other hand, if I cannot imagine the exact process of dissolution, I can imagine and have experienced the result of breaking faith with other foreign ministries and I've certainly no intention of laying up a store of future embarrassments for fear of something that may, after all, be comparatively trifling. Indeed. I have taken all possible precautions, sir. I hope you won't mind for a week or two being followed about by some of my men. I want you to allow two or three officers to remain in your house whilst you're there. And, of course, there will be quite a number on duty here at the Foreign Office. I... Uh, Trust that meets with your approval, sir. Of course, Superintendent. I'm most grateful to you. Thank you, sir. We'll do our best for you. So, the four just men are given a warning and the Foreign Secretary had dug in his heels. One side or the other was going to have to back down and it wasn't going to be Sir Philip Ramon. Oh, no, he made sure of that when he went to the House of Commons on the 1st of November. And so, if the House will permit... I hereby give notice that, notwithstanding the threats that have been received by myself, threats that I would be ashamed to bow the knee before and will not ever do so, I beg to move the second reading of my bill, the Aliens Extradition Political Offences Bill, on Tuesday week, or to be exact, in ten days' time. Here we are, gentlemen. Our new business premises. Ah, oh, excuse me. I'm sorry. So, we are the Fine Arts Reproduction Syndicate of Carnaby Street, London, England. We are in business, gentlemen, as of now. Excellent. They are. You, tell me, how long am I to be kept here? What? That is the third time he has asked today. Hablas, Spanish. Speak Spanish. 
I am tired of this English language you speak all the time. I cannot understand it any more than I can understand you. You will wait here until the work is finished, Terry. We have told you that. Why do you keep me a prisoner? If I am one of you, why do you not let me walk alone in the streets? Why can't I read the newspapers? I want to know who you are. You speak to me in Spanish, but you are not of the country, I know. You want me to kill, but you will not say how. Senor, restrain your impatience, I beg of you. I assure you once again that we do not kill for gain. <laughs> These two gentlemen each have fortunes exceeding six million pesetas. And I am even richer. We kill because we are each sufferers through acts of injustice for which the law gave us no remedy. If, if we killed you, huh? it would be the first act of its kind. Me? Kill me? Yes, you. It would be new work for us, for we have never slain except for justice. There is always a fear of betrayal in any accomplice, my dear Terry. We choose you most carefully. Now understand, not a hair of your head will be harmed if you are faithful. And you will receive a reward. Remember the girl in her ass. Mikaelina. So, that being understood, we will give you more freedom. In a few days we shall all return to Spain. They call you the silent man in the prison at Granada. Si. We shall believe that you will remain so. Huh? Por supuesto, señor. Soy un hombre sincero, eh? Now, what of Garcia? For a man who, so far as he knows, is to be returned to Spain in ten days' time and face his death, he seems unaffected. Ah. He's a fine old man. I saw him Sunday night speaking in Whitechapel. Fiery he was, oratorical, eloquent for the rights of man. Uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a Mirabeau, a Bright. Mm -hmm. And the audience was composed of cockney youths who were only there to boast that they had stood in the temple of anarchism. Ah. An element of bathos comes into all things, does it not? Indeed. Do you remember Judge Anderson? Of course. Oh, yes. The half-dark room with the flickering lamp. I had just sentenced him to death, I remember. <laughs> And they are crept into the room from the kitchen below. <laughs> the smell of frying onions. <laughs> Extraordinary. No, 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 no. <laughs> Going back to the matter we have on our hands, there is no more to be done till the day. Nothing. By the way, when we were taking our exercise walk, Teddy was most interested in the wanted posters everywhere. Asked why so many people were reading them. I had to find a lie on the spur of the moment. I told him it was a lottery. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> we will leave you to amuse him some more, Leon. Quacca and I have a few experiments to make upstairs. Excellent. Beautiful. The multumin parvo of explosives. Someday we may want to use more of this. It makes an abominable smell. Oh, I never noticed these things. Now, for the sake of safety... Ah. Does that neutralize the elements? It is now as harmless as a cup of chocolate. Mm. Ah. I'm not a nervous man, but this is the first comfortable moment I've had for two days. Yeah. And now, the box. Ah. It is in the safe, my friend. I shall get it for you. Ah, yes. Here it is. Now, if Terry is the workman he says he is, we have in here the bait that shall lure Sir Philip Ramon to his death. Very ingenious, my dear man, Fred. Very ingenious. <laughs> Excuse me, Gus. It's just what... I've had an idea, Gus. Oh, yes, Carter. What was it? It's about that reward notice for tonight's edition. Want to add a thousand pounds of your own, do you, Carter? One way to make a name, I suppose. No, 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 Gus. It, it just struck me that, well, like, this notice is in English, isn't it? Aye. And it occurred to me that, well, one or two of these four just men might not speak English, if you get my drift. Not a bad idea, Carter. Yes, not bad at all. Right. What we need is translations. French, Italian, German... Uh, Spanish, sir? Yes, all right. Do Spanish as well. Who knows? 
Well, what are you hanging about for? Uh, Come get, on, get a move get, on! Get back, so, though I say it myself, it was really thanks to me that the next day the announcement of the reward appeared in a megaphone in five languages. That announcement was to bear fruit only a few days later, and with consequences that none of us could ever have guessed. Archie! Ah, oh, <laughs> evening, Chief. Yeah, it's late for you, is it not? Been to dinner, Archie. Oh. Thought I'd look by, though. See my hard-working editor. <laughs> there seems to be so much in the wind these days. Thought I'd best keep up with the news on these four just men. Hmm? How goes it? Oh, it's going all right, Chief. Oh. There's not much to tell, I'm afraid. We've got our best reporter on the job, of course. A young chap by the name of Carter. He's going to be a very big name. What's the popular feeling? I, I don't think anyone really believes anything will happen, Chief. What? Nothing happened? When they've already managed to plant a bomb in the Houses of Parliament? Well, if you want my opinion, I mean my personal opinion, that is, I don't think they'll bring it off. You don't? I think the four just men have struck a snag this time. Now, if they hadn't warned Ramon, they might have done something. But forewarned, well... I don't see it. Well, the bill comes up in, what is it, eight days' time. We shall uh, see then, one way or the other. <laughs> anyway, I'm off home now. Get some sleep. Uh, night, Archie. Uh, night, Chief. Night. night. <laughs> argumentative old... Still, when you own the Daily Megaphone, you can be as argumentative as you like, I suppose. Right. Now... I wonder... Let's have some light. Oh, what the... I say, Baines! What is it, sir? Oh, send for the electrician, will you, Baines? One of the fuses has gone up here. Yes, sir. Well, swear to God, I want to. All right. Oh, have I got a match? Uh, let's light a candle. <coughs> Look at the damage. What an abominable smell. Oh, my God. <coughs> Are you all right, sir? Oh, I'm sent for the electrician. Good grief, sir. What's that? What's it look like, Baines? Well, oh, some kind of black box hanging down from a light, sir. Nasty smelling. Fumes coming out of it. Yes. Hang on. Wait a minute. And a letter left on my desk. To the editor. Good God. What, sir? The gum on this envelope. It's still wet. Mess. No, have you not finished that yet? Nearly. It was only the mother and father of a mess, wasn't it? I'm refixing the globes now. Curious looking contraption, that box thing. If you ask me. Well, I'm not asking you anything. Finish your work. Right. Come! Uh, the editor of the Daily Megaphone, is it? Aye. Uh, Detective Superintendent Falmer, sir, from Scotland Yard. Oh, come in, Superintendent. <laughs> You're remarkably quick in coming. Um, do sit down, please. Thank you, sir. So... Right, that's it, then. You can have some light back. See you on the candles, won't it? All right. There. Oh, okay. I'm off, then. Do you want me to dispose of that black thing, uh, sir? No, no, leave it. Right, you are, sir. Right. Now, Superintendent. Get down to business, shall we, sir? There was a note, I gather, oh. left on your desk, sir. Uh, Yes, here. Thank you. Now, let's see. Honoured, sir? Huh. Nice and polite, aren't <laughs> they, these chaps? When you turned on your light this evening, you probably imagined you were a victim of one of those outrages to which you are fond of referring. We owe you an apology for any annoyance we may have caused you. Exceedingly polite, I'd say. Uh, the removal of your lamp, the substitution of a plug... Connected with a small charge of magnesium powder is the cause of your discomfiture. We ask you to believe that it would have been as simple to have connected a charge of nitroglycerine and thus have made you your own executioner. Good God. We have arranged this as evidence of our intention to carry out our promise in respect of the Aliens Extradition Act. I see. There is no power on earth that can save Sir Philip Ramon from destruction. I ask you, great medium, throw weight, call on government, etc., etc. Ah, 
You will thus save the lives of many inoffensive people who have found an asylum in your country, and also the life of a minister of the crown, whose only offence, in our eyes, is his zealousness in an unrighteous cause. The four just men. I've seen the hall porters, the messengers, everyone on duty at the time. No one can explain the coming or going of our mysterious visitor. Where are the windows open, sir? No, no, all three were shut and fastened. Now, this envelope, sir. It is the one the letter came in? Yes. Why? Interesting, isn't it, that the gum was still wet when you discovered it? Meaning what, Superintendent? Meaning, sir, that the man who wrote this letter must have left his room no longer than a minute or two before you arrived. <laughs> you see, Poincar, you ask to see the editor. They take you to the offices and you explain your business to someone. They are very sorry. They cannot help. You know, very, very polite, but not to the extent of seeing you off the premises. So, wandering about, that is uh, finding your way out. You come across the editor's office and knowing he's away, you slip in and then then you make your arrangements, <laughs> slip out, and uh, voila! Et voila! And use for your envelope a gum that will not dry under an hour, and you heighten the mystery. Ah, yes. The envelope just fastened is an irresistible attraction to the English detective. Irresistible! <laughs> irresistible! <laughs> uh, Driver, cabby, we will get down here if you don't mind. But I thought you said Pembridge Garden, sir. I did, my friend. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Ah, Manfred, what car? Leon. Where is Terry? Terry has made his escape. What? Escape? But how? Manfred, this morning before you left, you gave him some newspapers. Indeed, but they were English papers and he does not speak the language. The pictures seem to amuse him. You gave him, amongst others, the megaphone. Yes, indeed. Oh. Ah, indeed. Offer of a reward and a free pardon was in it, and it was printed in Spanish. Ugh, the unruchlich. Very ingenious on the part of the megaphone. We went for a walk this afternoon. We passed along Regent Street. He stopped every few seconds to look in the shops, when suddenly we had been staring at the window of a photographer's. I missed him. I have been seeking him ever since. I take all the blame. No, no, no. It is too late to talk of blame. We underrated the cutting of Monsieur and the enterprise of the English newspaper. So, what to do? Change plans, strike now or leave? I, I have a car parked not far from here. No, 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 we cannot leave. And to strike now would be unfair to Ramon. He still has two days and must receive another and final warning. Then, my friends, we must find Terry. If Terry has not gone to the police, where would he go? To the office of the newspaper, naturally. Of course! Leon! Your motor car will be useful now. Come on. What the devil? I'm sorry, sir. This gentleman just barged in, sir. I see, editor. Please. All right, Baines. Right, sir. I'm the editor. What do you want? Hey, speak, editor. He, go. I beg your pardon. Well, anything you say to me can be said in front of Mr. Welby. Thank you, thank you. Now, what's your name? Yo me llamo Miguel Terry of Jerez. I, I, one of four just men. Oh, my God. Very well. But I don't know the name Terry. Where do you come from? From Jerez, Andalusia. Where have you come from now? What part of London? Oh, I not know, senores. Uh, their houses, streets, people. It's London. I, I was to kill a man. Hmm? Minister. They did not tell me how. They? Who? The other three. Yes, yes, but their names, their names. There is reward. Pardon. I want before I tell anything. If you are one of the four, you shall have your reward. You shall have some of it now. Huh? Carter! Carter! What is it, Gav? 
Carter, go to the compositing room and tell the printer not to allow his men to leave until I give orders. Yeah, all right, I'm sure. Now, tell me all you know. Reward. Oh. Pardon. For God's sake, man, make haste. You'll receive your reward and your pardon. Now, tell us, who are the four just men? Huh? Who are the other three? Where are they to be found? Here, gentlemen. Oh, God, Stay God. where you are, Sherry, or I will shoot you. Now, gentlemen, I am one of the four just men. The other two are outside. We are all masked, and you will see nothing. I am sorry to say. How did you get here? And what do you want? How I came here, your doorman will explain when he recovers consciousness. What? Why I am here is because I wish to save our lives. Not an unreasonable wish. If Teddy speaks, we may be dead men. So I am going to prevent him from speaking. I have no quarrel with either of you gentlemen, but if you hinder me, I shall kill you too. Oh, good Lord. As for you, Teddy, you would have betrayed your comrades. You would have thwarted a great purpose. Therefore, you should die. No, 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 no by God, God's no. God's sake, sir! Do not force me to kill you too, sir! You shall not commit a cold-blooded murder, What's nonetheless. What's the use, Archie? He means it. We can do nothing. You can do something. Say you are busy. Go away. I'm busy. Prince is waiting, sir. When you're ready. Now, what can we do? You can save this man's life. How? Give me your word of honour that you will allow us both to depart and will neither raise the alarm nor leave this room for a quarter of an hour. But how do I know that the murder you contemplate will not be committed as soon as you get clear? Yes. How do I know that as soon as I have left this room, you will not raise an alarm? I shall have given my word, sir. Yes, and I mine. And my word has never been broken. Very well, I agree. But under protest. However, I warn you, your arrest and punishment is inevitable. I regret, sir, that I cannot agree with you. Nothing is inevitable save death. Come, Terry. Uh, on my word as a caballero, I will not harm you. See, bingo, bingo. Uh, look here, sir. Will you write us an article about yourselves? Oh, you needn't give any embarrassing particulars, of course. Just something of your aspirations, your, your reasons. Sir, I recognise in you an artist. The article will be delivered tomorrow. I bid you good night. With a week to go before Sir Philip Ramon's bill was due to come before the house, two of the four just men had been seen, and one of them had even given us his name. But where they were hiding, and how they intended to carry out their deadly threat, remained a mystery to us all. <laughs> present the second and final part of The Four Just Men by Edgar Wallace, adapted for radio by Colin Davis. In 1906, four men from different parts of the world band together to right wrongs over which the law has no jurisdiction. One of their number has been killed in a previous exploit, and they've recruited a rather dubious replacement, Terry, a common criminal from Spain, who doesn't quite have the pure dedication to justice his three compatriots display. They've threatened to kill the British Foreign Secretary, Sir Philip Ramon, because of a bill he's about to introduce to Parliament. The Aliens Extradition Bill will force political refugees to return to their home countries where they will face prison or even death. The four just men regard the bill as unjust and will do all in their power to prevent Sir Philip Ramon taking it forward, even risking their own capture. Blood-red placards. Horse newsboys and banner headlines told the world the next day how near the four just men had come to being caught. 
people stopped talking about wars and famines and everyday murders and concentrated their minds upon the topic of the hour. Would the four just men carry out their promise and slaughter the Secretary of State for Foreign Affairs on the very next day? Downing Street, Superintendent? Leave this house and actually live in Downing Street? Uh, yes, sir, just for a couple of days. The other morning you objected to one of my men being in the breakfast room of your house in Portland Place. Later, on the way to Downing Street, he complained about a plainclothes officer driving in your carriage. Well, Sir Philip, in Downing Street I promise you you shan't even see the plainclothes officers. Is that not fair exchange for the sake of your personal security? Yes, I suppose so. At 44 Downing Street, sir, we'll have 60 men surrounding your quarters. You won't be bothered by them. Very well, very well. I wonder you haven't an iron safe to lock me in, Superintendent. Oh, <laughs> if I had one, sir, I'd use it, I can assure you. Good day, Superintendent. Good day, Sir Philip. Yes? The draft of your speech, sir, introducing the second reading of the extradition bill. Oh, thank you, Giles. We are pretty sure to meet with opposition, sir, especially in view of all the fuss. However, Mainland has sent out a three-line whip. It expects a majority of 36, at least. And what about my unknown friends? What do the blackguards call themselves? The four just men? We've heard nothing more than you have read, sir. We know who Terry is, but we can't place his three companions. They give me until tomorrow night to recant, you know. You've heard from them again? In the briefest of notes, that's all. And otherwise? Otherwise? Otherwise they will keep their promise, I presume. I want you to quite understand, Terry, that we bear you no ill will for what you have done in presenting yourself at the office of the megaphone newspaper. Senor. I think, and Mr. Poicard thinks, that Senor Gonzalez did right to spare your life and bring you back to us. D'accord. So, tomorrow night, you will do as you agreed to do. If the necessity exists, then you will go. Where? Where in the name of heaven? I have told them my name. They will know who I am. They, they will find that out by writing to the police in Spain. Where am I to go? Harry, you betrayed yourself. That is your punishment. But trust us, we will find a place for you in New Spain under other skies. And the girl at Heret shall be there waiting for you. You will swear that? I promise it. And now, you know what is expected of you tomorrow night, what you have to do. Oh, yes. There must be no hitch, no bungling. You and I, Poacar and Gonzalez, will kill this unjust man in a way that the world will never guess. Such an executioner shall appall mankind. A swift death, a sure death, a death that will creep through cracks, that will pass by the guards unnoticed. Why, there never has been such a thing done, such... My friend, my friend. Uh, uh, friend. <laughs> I am sorry. For the moment I had forgotten the cause and the end... In the strangeness of the means. It is understandable, my friend. Indeed it is, and perfectly so. <sighs> yes, indeed. To work. I am going up to survey the land. You have sight of it? Dimly, yes. The houses of Parliament you see are there, uh. about a mile distant. Ah. And Downing Street is to the right. Uh -huh. But it's... Just a jumble of roofs from here. What is Terry up to now? Practicing what he's to do. Ah, very wise, as he must work in the dark. Mm. Come, let us go down. Hey. Bueno. All is ready, senores. Good. Good. Excellent, Terry. <laughs> Everything. <laughs> Let me find your minister of state. Give me a minute's speech with him, and the next minute, he dies. <laughs> yes. <sighs> no, 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 stop. Stop. Don't look like that. In the name of God, no, don't, don't. Like what, Terry? I cannot say. Only, it's 
like the judge of Granada. And he says, let the thing be done. If we look so, it is because we are judges. And not judges alone, but executioners of our own judgments. I thought you would have been pleased. We are pleased, Terry. You have done well, my friend. Bueno. Bueno. Pray God that we are successful. So, our compliment is what, Falmouth? 44 Downing Street is full, Commissioner. Practically a man in every room. I've got four of our best men on the roof, men in the basement, men in the kitchen. The servants, what about them? Oh, Sir Philip has brought his own people up from the country, sir. I shall be glad when tomorrow is over, all the same. Final arrangements? No change, sir. Sir Philip went to Downing Street half an hour ago. He is to remain there all day, tomorrow, until half past eight in the evening. Mm -hmm. He goes over to the House of Commons at nine to move the reading of the bill, returns to number 44 at eleven. Good. I've given orders for the traffic to be diverted along the embankment between a quarter to nine and a quarter past, and the same at eleven. Good, sir. Four closed carriages will drive from Downing Street to the house. Uh, Sir Philip will drive down in a motor car immediately after. Absolutely right, sir. Come. Visitor for you, sir. Spanish chief of police. Ah, Senor de Silva. Pleased to meet you, sir. Senor. I'm sorry to bring you over to England. But we thought we might be able to get you to help us in our search for this Signor Terry. Luckily, I was in Paris, Commissioner. It is not so far. I know this Terry. He is not a good criminal. I was astonished to learn that he had joined these four just men. Your people send us some most interesting information, Signor de Silva. However, they omitted to say... Well, it really isn't of very great importance. But what is Terry's trade? Terry's trade... Let me remember. Ah, yes. I don't know for certain, but I have an idea it is something to do with robber. His first crime was stealing robber. But if you want to know for certain... No, no, no. It really isn't at all important. At 12 o'clock on the 10th of November, the day before the bill was due to go before the house... Detective Inspector Falmouth left Scotland Yard and went to 44 Downing Street, where the Foreign Secretary had now been installed. He allowed himself little hope at this late stage of catching the four just men. One thing, and one thing alone, gave him some comfort, and that was a brief note that had been received by Sir Philip Ramon. One more warning you shall receive, so that... We may be assured it shall not go astray. Our next and last message shall be delivered into your hands by one of us in person. You know, I can't help thinking, sir, it's the first bit of good news we've had on this case. How can it possibly be good news? (sighs) These four just men, they always do what they say they'll do. I see. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, I didn't mean that. I know what you meant, Superintendent. They will attempt to deliver a last warning in person, and in doing so will almost certainly overreach even their brilliant selves. Is that correct? Yes, sir, that's correct. And do you wonder if you should not perhaps relax your vigilance a little so as to lure at least one of the four to destruction? You want to use me as bait. I had thought, sir. I understand perfectly. I also recall that you once told me there was no danger in this business, at least no real danger. Indeed, I did, sir. However, there is this one. Now, you will remember that in placing their explosive device in the House of Commons, one of their number expertly impersonated an elderly member of Parliament, a Mr. Basco. Men who are capable of such ingenuity, such disguises, are really outside the ordinary run of criminals. One of them is evidently an artist at that sort of thing. And he is the man that I am afraid of today. I'm tired of all this. Detectives, disguises, masked murderers. It's like a melodrama. Your arrangements are to be kept secret, I suppose, Mr. Falmouth? Oh, yes, sir, absolutely. No one knows except you and your secretary, myself and the commissioner. Nothing in writing? No, sir, not even to the prime minister. Now... If you'll excuse me, sir. You're going, Mr. I Thomas. must see the commissioner. I shall be less than half an hour, sir. And in the meantime, may I suggest that you do not leave your room? Very well, Superintendent. Gillespie! Sir? My muffler and goggles. Yes, sir. 
I've had an uncomfortable feeling these last few days, sir, a sort of instinctive feeling that I have been watched and followed so that I am now using a motor car for travel. Uh, they can't follow that without attracting some notice. Most ingenious, Superintendent. Your motoring equipment, sir. Thank you, Gillespie. Uh, these goggles are the only disguise I've ever had to adopt. And I don't mind telling you, sir, it's the first time in my 25 years in the force that I have ever felt I was playing the fool, like a stage detective. Uh, your muffler, sir. Uh, thank you, Gillespie. Now, if you'll excuse me, sir. Of course, Gillespie, keep your eyes peeled, and don't you relax for a second. Right, sir. Nothing. Nothing to worry about, nothing at all. I'm taking the consequence too much for granted, all these threats, these promises... There's no certainty that they will keep their word. Ha! It's impossible that they should. Come in. Oh, hello, Superintendent. Back already. I thought I had better leave this in your care, sir. What is it? It is something which would mean absolute disaster if by chance it was found in my possession, sir. You would greatly oblige me by keeping it on your desk until I return. Of course, Mr. Falmouth. Thank you, sir. Half an hour, then. Department A, CID, Scotland Yard. Hmm. Some confidential report, I presume. And Sir Philip returned to his thoughts of the extradition bill and the threat from the four just men. He came finally to a decision. I'll go through with it. I am determined to go through with it. Yes? Sir Philip, do you wish your townhouse to be closed? Of course, close the house in Portland Place. Yes, completely. I will not risk the safety of my servants if some outbreak should occur there as well as here. It's only for a day or two. And you'll let them know when you want it back? Yes, of course. Thank you. Thank you. Come in. Ah, Mr. Falmouth. Nobody been, sir. If by that you mean have the four delivered their ultimatum in person, I can comfort your mind. They have not. Uh, well, thank God for that anyway. What do you mean? Well, I have been in some dread, as I have just received a cable from America, mm -hmm. from one of Pinkerton's chaps. They've been on the trail of these four just men for years. They take it very seriously, sir. Look. Hmm. One Roman against the following. Drinking coffee in any form, opening letters or parcels using soap. <laughs> really, this is preposterous. <laughs> You've read the postscript, sir? Well, <laughs> oh, yes. Sending two men over by the Lucania to watch. Uh, afraid they will arrive too late. My God. Indeed, sir. Excuse me, sir. What is it, Giles? I think, sir, that the four just men have admitted their failure. Their what? Admitted defeat, sir. How do you work that out, young man? Well, sir, I've been studying that article they wrote for the megaphone. Yes. And it's perfectly clear if you look, sir. Yes, sir. There, you see... They emphasise that if the least hitch occurs in any of their plans, they acknowledge defeat. Mm -hmm. They go on... Uh, unless our warning can be handed to Sir Philip by two o'clock this afternoon, our arrangements will be allowed to lapse and the execution plan will be forgone. You think I haven't read all that? Well, don't you see, sir? It means they must have admitted defeat because it's gone two o'clock. In fact, it's nearly half past. What? He's right, sir. It is half past two. <laughs> He's right. But it could be a ruse to take us off our guard. Oh, I doubt that, sir. I am a firm believer in the honesty of these men, and I am convinced that if they have failed to deliver their message, they will not trouble us again, sir. What is it, Gillespie? Uh, telegram, sir. From the editor of the megaphone. Thank you. Sir. Good God. What is it? What does it say? You can read what it says, Sir Philip. As to what it means. Just received telegram handed in Charing Cross, 1.52 p.m. Begins, we have delivered our last message to Foreign Secretary, signed the four. Is this true? What? Well, I can tell you what this means, my dear Falmouth. Your noble four are liars and brackets as well as murderers. It also means, I hope, an end to your ridiculous faith in their honesty. 
Nobody came after I left, sir. Nobody. And you've seen no person beside your secretary, my assistant, and myself? Nobody has come within a dozen yards of me. So where does that leave us? God knows. Anyway, you'd better take back your precious documents, Mr. Falmouth, before I forget. What is that, sir? I'm afraid the shock of finding yourself deceived in your estimate of my persecutors has dazed you, Superintendent. These are your papers. I really must ask the Commissioner to send me an officer who has a better appreciation of the criminal mind and a less childlike faith in the honour of murderers. As to that, sir, you must do as you think best. I have discharged my duty to my own satisfaction, and I have no more critical taskmaster than myself. But I remain most anxious to know what you mean by saying I handed any papers into your care. I am referring, sir, to this package which you return to leave in my charge. Sir, I did not return. I left no papers in your hands. But may I, sir? This is the message, sir. The last warning of the four just men. We allow you until tomorrow evening to reconsider your position in the matter of the aliens' extradition bill. If by six o'clock no announcement is made in the afternoon newspapers of your withdrawing this measure, we shall have no other course to pursue but to fulfil our promise. You will die at eight in the evening. Just an hour before you are due to present the second reading of the bill, sir. The man who delivered this, who I took to be you. Who was he? One of the four just men in disguise. They have kept their promise. Gillespie! Sir? Do you remember my going out? Yes, sir, but both times. Damn, both times. How long had I been gone the first time before I returned? Five minutes, sir. And how was I dressed? In your motoring cave, sir. I wore my muffler and goggles, I suppose? Yes, sir. I thought so. Did I return to my car? Yes, sir. Did you notice the number? Yes, sir. Right. Find out the registered owner of this car. When you have, go to the owner, ask him to explain his movements, and if necessary, take him into custody. Yes, sir. It's as I thought, Sir Philip. The man you saw was one of the four impersonating me. Oh, aye, he chose his time admirably. Even my own men were deceived. They obtained a car similar in build and colour to mine, watched their opportunity, and drove to Downing Street a few minutes after I left. Sir! Yes, Gillespie, what is it now, man? The car number, sir. There's got to be some mistake. Why? Because the number was A17164. That's of your own car, sir. So, I might ask the Right Honourable the Prime Minister whether it is the intention of His Majesty's Government to proceed with this aliens extradition. Yes, it is. Has not Thanks considered, in view of the extraordinary conditions this bill has called into life, the advisability of postponing its introduction. That is likely to prevent my right honourable friend, who is unfortunately not in his place tonight, from moving the second reading of the bill tomorrow. Ah, Carter, come in. I want to make sure you're ready for the big day tomorrow. Shut the door, sit down. Yes, Gov. Right, then. First things first. Uh, my landlady's going to give me a call at six, sir. Mm. I'll be in Downing Street by seven to be sure of getting a good position. Don't be a fool, Carter. You won't get near Downing Street. Sorry, Gov. There won't be anyone allowed in Downing Street, except the police. Oh. Or in any of the streets nearby. It won't stand a chance. Oh. What you need are these. Keys, Gov. That's right. Open a flat in Whitehall, overlooking Downing Street. You'll see everything from there. It's what we call a vantage point, Carter. All the papers have one near Downing Street, so you won't be alone. So, about three o'clock that afternoon, I left the megaphone, had a cup of tea, and went over to the flat in Whitehall. I was feeling great, because it was me, not Trout or Green or Jenkins, that was getting the big news next day. And what's more, though I wasn't to know this at the time, I wasn't even going to have to wait till then for a good story. Because my lucky stars had something in store for me that very evening. Paper, 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 sir. 
Come at Omegaphone, sir. Both, if you wouldn't mind, my friend. Mind, sir? Mind what a gentleman reads? Why, none of my business, to be sure, sir. <laughs> there you are. Oh, oh, thank you very much, sir. Oh, good, good night, sir. Good night. All just men, all the ladies. Come at Megaphone, take them. Well, anything of interest? Mm, uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> What, my friend? What have you found? An intriguing little piece here, Leon. It talks of the deadly foreign anarchist, as if we were taking bread from the mouths of the homemade <laughs> variety. Thank you. Okay, what's the matter? I have been robbed. What? what? Robbed, Leon, robbed. My watch is gone, which does not matter, but I have also lost my pocketbook oh. and the notes I made for the guidance of Terry. Oh. That matters a great deal. Oh, my, a common thief, most likely, in view of the watch. Indeed. No, nothing else has gone. Uh, it may, as you say, have been a pickpocket. With luck, he will drop the notebook down the nearest train. Yeah. But if it were a police agent... Ori, was there anything in the book that identifies us? No, no, nothing. But unless the police are blind, they would understand the calculations and the plans, of course. Oh, it may not come into their hands at all, gentlemen. But if it does and the thief can recognize us, we are in a fix. So, we must act with speed, must we not? We must act with great speed, my friend. D'accord. Get off! Ah, well, I never. Billy Marks. Not been caught red-handed, have we, Billy? <coughs> All right, constable, put him down. <coughs> All right, sir. Oh, thank you very much. Much obliged to you. Well, now, Billy, what have we got this time? Uh, gold watch, half a chain, gold, three purses, two handkerchiefs and a red morocco pocketbook, Sarge. Quite a good day's work, Billy. All right, let's take a look at this look. What's this? I mean, the gold, well, I can understand, Billy. But a notebook, and already written it. What's it say? You mean you don't know? You nicked it. God. Let's see. Oh, looks like a list of streets. And a lot of funny little symbols that don't mean a thing to me. Let's have a look, Sarge. Yeah. Well, son? No. Will not leave DS except to Hus. Traff. Diverted in bank. Embankment? Mm -hmm. uh, 80 poles inside DS. Uh, hold on. What? Well, DS, Sarge. So? Well, I just thought, Sarge, could be that case in the paper. You know, for Foreign Secretary threatening letters. So, and what's DS got to do with that? Well, I'm not sure, but well, it could stand for Downing Street, Sarge, couldn't it? Right, Billy. Up you get. Stand from the yard to see you. Huh? Thank you, Sergeant. Shut the door and leave us alone, will you? Sir? Hello, Billy. Ah, oh, Mr. Falmouth, sir. <laughs> Look, I wasn't in that Oxton affair, honest. Easy, Billy, easy. I don't want you for anything. And if you'll answer my questions truthfully, you may get off the prison charge and get a reward into the bargain. A reward? What do you mean? We think the man you took this notebook from was one of the four just men. Blimey. Oh, you've heard of them? Yeah, yeah, I have. So what did he look like, Billy? His clothes? His face? Oh, come on, Mr. Falmer. I don't go looking a chap in the face when I'm nicking his watch, do I? You cursed dolt, Mark. You had one of the four just men in your hands and you, you didn't even take the trouble to look at him. I wasn't to know, Mr. Falmer. All right, all right. So you don't remember his face. However, do you think it possible that if you were to see him in the street, it might come back to you, Billy? Eh? Well, now... I mean, this chap might have some little trick of walking, maybe. Some way of holding his hands, you know? Now, what do you think? It's possible. We'd have to let you out, of course. Yeah, yeah, you bet. And a reward, you said, Mr. Falmouth. You did say a reward. Oh, Billy, Billy, Billy. I heard Harry Moss came out last week. He'd done three years and ten lashes, I hear. He'd love to know who stitched them up. Don't you think, Billy? Yeah, of course, Mr. Falmouth. We'll talk about the reward later, eh? When I've found you this geezer. About half past four, I left the flat in Whitehall to go and tell my landlady that I wouldn't be home that night. I told her I couldn't stop for tea, but she wouldn't hear of it. Which is why I didn't get back to town till gone nine o'clock that night. And how I came to be changing trains on the underground at Charing Cross. Excuse me. 
Do you have the time? No, I ain't got a watch, mate. Uh, hey! Please. Mr. Falmouth wants you. You're to come with me at once. What's he want? There's been an arrest. You're needed to identify the man. Back on the train, quick. No, 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 listen. If Mr. Falmer thinks he's arrested the four just men, he's got another thing coming. I mean, I've tracked this bloke down like he asked me to, and I've been following him for an hour. I'm going to lose him if I come with you, eh? Hey! Do as I tell you, Billy oh, Marks. God. Get on the train, quick. Yeah, yeah. All right, all right. I couldn't believe my ears. As soon as I heard it, I was back on the train next compartment, with my ear pressed to the partition, listening like hell. Pull up the window on your side. What? Do what? as you're told, Billy. Yeah. All right, all right. Look, what's the game? Think we wouldn't spot you, Billy. Eh? Why, as soon as we lost the notebook, we knew what would happen. What? We were ready for you, Billy, waiting. We even let you find us, Billy Marks. Yeah, but Gary's nothing to do with me. It wasn't my idea. It was... Good night, Billy. Sleep well. What you doing? Where the hell's he gone? Help! Oh, uh, uh. Hey, over here, quickly! Uh, what's up with you, son? There's a man in there, in the next compartment. I think he's been murdered. He's been what? All right, uh, all right. I'll take a look. Don't you run away, mind. Oh, you're joking. I'm a journalist. Uh, oh. <coughs> Blimey! <coughs> Is he dead? <coughs> What's that smell? <laughs> it's almonds. <laughs> it's like almonds. Oh, right, Baines, I'm off. Tell the printers they can go ahead, right? Certainly, sir. I'll no, do no, that no, right away. Wait, wait. Carter, what are you doing here? Thought you were having an early night. I was, Gav. But there's been a development. I thought I might just catch the morning's editions with it. Huh? Police had a lead. A pickpocket, supposed oh, to have yes. seen the four just men, or oh, one of them at any rate. Anyway, they sent him out to look for them, and they got him. Who oh, got him? The four just men on the underground. They did him in with prussic acid fumes. Prussic acid? I was coming back from my lodgings. I heard it in the next compartment. I heard him kill a man. You what? I was there when they opened the door. Th this bloke was lying there, the reform with this, this broken glass bottle by his head. Well, the gas had been in it, they said. Well, I got all the details, and I came here as fast as I could. Oh, all right, all right, Carter. Now get your breath back and start to write this up. With luck, we'll scoop the other papers and have this in the first edition. Right, Gav. Oh, by the way, well done, lad. Sir. Bane, sir, tell the printers, hold the front page. So we got it. Front page, first edition. Scoop the lot of them we did. Billy Marks, pickpocket, set up by the police and killed by the four just men. My first big headline. Blimey, I thought my mum went off be proud. I didn't get much sleep that night. I went back to the flat, got my head down on the settee and dropped off around one o'clock. It was the noise of the crowd that woke me about up past five the next morning. I'd never seen anything like it. In Downing Street there was an army of policemen keeping the crowds back. I thought, blimey, they're taking no chances. It was the middle of the morning, about up past ten, when the car came through with the commissioner and Mr Falmouth in it. This was for the final briefing with Sir Philip Ramon. I beg you, Sir Philip. The day has come. We can do no more. And yet I am still fearful. I have a horrible dread that for all our precautions we have left something out of the reckoning. That we're leaving unguarded some avenue. I beg of you, sir. Truly. Think well. Is the passage of the bill so absolutely necessary? Is it worth your life, sir? Commissioner... Mr. Falmouth, I thank you for your efforts. I shall not, however, withdraw under any circumstances. It is now to me a question of justice. Am I right in introducing a law that will remove from this country colonies of dangerously intelligent criminals who, whilst enjoying immunity from arrest, urge men forward to commit acts of violence and treason abroad? Or are the four right? Is this measure an unjust thing, an act of tyranny, a a piece of barbarism, an anachronism. So it has come to this. I have to satisfy my mind as to the standard of right and wrong that I must accept, and I accept my own. So, thank you. You were wise to take the precautions that you have. I've been foolish to chafe under your protective care. The four have threatened to kill you at eight o'clock. Between six and half past eight, 
We wish you to remain in your study and not to open the door to a single person, even to Mr Falmouth or myself. During that time, you must keep your door locked. Now, if you would rather have one of us with you, I'm no, sure, Mr No, no, thank you. After the impersonation of yesterday, I should rather be alone. Uh, the room is anarchist-proof, is it not, Mr Falmouth? Yes, Commissioner. We've made a thorough inspection through the night. Floors, ceilings, the lot. We've even fixed steel shields to the shutters for you, Sir Philip. Oh, these are new, though. Well, the flowers. Mm. Yes, beautiful, aren't they? They were sent up from my house in Hereford this morning. Indeed, Foreign Secretary. <laughs> they look so real, they might almost be artificial. <laughs> <laughs> Very good, sir. Very good. <laughs> well, you want to be alone tonight, sir? We'll leave you alone. Come midday, the crowd, swelled by the stories that were in all the papers of Billy Marks's death, were fighting to get into Whitehall. It's like they'd come to watch an execution, which, in a way, I suppose they had. At two o'clock, the Commissioner of Police closed Westminster Bridge and the embankment to all traffic. By mid-afternoon, there was not a single space within 500 yards of Downing Street that wasn't occupied by a representative of the law. Then... At seven o'clock that evening, the angry hum of the crowd at last died down. Everyone knew it was almost time. One hour remained before the threatened assassination. London watched in silence, and with a quicker beating of the heart, the last hours crawl around the clock's great dial. Uh, just past seven, Sir Philip. Indeed, Commissioner. I am about to lock my door. I presume the arrangements we agreed upon will be carried out? Indeed, sir. Uh, I have been a just man, according to my lights, Commissioner. Whatever happens, I am satisfied I am doing the right thing. What's that? And the people. They are cheering you, sir. You'll be very disappointed if nothing happens, I think. The people, Superintendent. God save me from the people. Their sympathy, their applause, their insufferable pity. I hope to see you in an hour, gentlemen. Good night. Good night, sir. Good night, Sir Philip. Politicians. God help them. And us. Forty minutes, sir. That's all. We could none of us do anything now except wait. For even then, at the eleventh hour, we still had no idea of how or in what way the enemy would attempt to strike. In the house, as the time for the reading of the bill approached, the tension was unbearable. The detective Falmouth told me afterwards that those 40 minutes were the longest of his life. No doubt they passed more quickly for the four just men. Shh, Daddy! No mistakes, Daddy. It's very nearly time. Senores, why cannot I strike a match? I am nervous here in the dark. Don't be a fool, Terry. Do as you practice. Enough of that. Take this. Good. No. And here is the other. See. Come, tie them. See. Terry, go on. <laughs> Senores, he's done. <sighs> it is time. No, wait, wait. Are you ready? See. It is time. Now. <laughs> What has happened? Terry has bungled, my friends, and paid the consequence with his life. So, what of Ramon, then? I don't know. We can only wait and see. Impossible. Quite impossible. What is Felma? For those fellows to keep their promise, sir, nothing can happen. 
It's impossible. In my mind, the main question is, will they keep their other promise and give up the attempt if they fail? Less than a minute. Can you hear anything in there? No, nothing. It is time. Two. Three. Four. What's that? I heard nothing. Yes, I did hear yes. something. What's that? What? <laughs> Quick! This way, man! Quick! Come on! Quickly! Come on! Quick, Come on! 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 They'd done it. The four just men had brought off the impossible. But how? The room, the house, the street, all guarded, surrounded. And no way in or out by door, by cellar, by roof. There were two possible clues, although no one could make much of them at the time. There was a burn on Sir Philip Ramon's lifeless hand, and in the street below, three dead sparrows. A couple of days later, a note was received at the offices of the megaphone. It was passed at once to Detective Superintendent Falmouth at Scotland Yard. Sir, when you receive this, we who, for want of a better title, call ourselves the Four Just Men, will be scattered throughout Europe, and there is little likelihood of your ever tracing us. In no spirit of boastfulness, we say, we have accomplished that which we set ourselves to accomplish. In no sense of hypocrisy... We repeat our regret that such a step as we took was necessary. Sir Philip Ramon's death would appear to have been an accident. This much we confess. Terry bungled and paid the penalty. We depended too much on his technical knowledge. Perhaps by diligent search you will solve the mystery for yourselves in this instance. When your search is rewarded, you will understand the truth of all we say. Farewell. Tells us nothing, Falmouth. No, sir. Search, it says. We've searched Downing Street from end to end. What about his country house? Have we searched that? Oh, I don't see the point, sir. Important place, his London home. It was locked up at the time, sir. As soon as he moved to Downing Street. Hmm. I wonder. Well, maybe you should try Portland Place. We must begin somewhere. If you'd care to come this way, sir... That is the study in there, sir. Tell me, Perks, as butler to Sir Philip Ramon, where were you when he was killed? In the country, sir. Sir Philip sent us all away from Portland Place before it was locked up. So the house was empty? Absolutely empty, sir. And no evidence on your return that anyone had effected an entrance? No, sir, none. Ah. Right, let's go through. Yes. It's furnished, plainly enough. Very plain, sir. Sir Philip's taste was very plain. Mm, usual paraphernalia. Wait a minute. What's happened to the telephone? The cord's burnt and twisted. And there's a, a small pile of ash. Look. Good Lord. Gillespie! Yes, sir. Run to Bellows in Regent Street. Ask for an electrician. At once, man. Was careless. How do you mean? Well, linesman's been careless. Criminally so, I'd say. Machine's ruined, can't you see? Yes, that's why I sent for you, Miller. I want you to tell me why. Well, it looks to me like someone's attached an electric wire carrying a high voltage to this... My God! If anyone had been the other end... I... Are you all right? Good God. So that's how it happened. What happened? Yes, to Ramon. I don't know what you mean, sir. The Foreign Secretary, Miller. What? He was electrocuted. What? That's how the four just men killed him. You don't say. Yes, of course. The notebook was full of street names and symbols. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand it at the time. But it was the path of the telephone wires from here in Portland Place to number 44. <sighs> but the phone in Downing Street wasn't damaged. Now, how could that have been? Well, that's electricity for you, sir. Strange thing, electricity. Given up trying to account for it, eh? Could have been a short circuit, I suppose. That's it. 
If the man making the connection himself had bungled, mm -hmm. if he'd taken the full force of the current himself, mm -hmm. now would that have brought about this result? Well, yes, it might. I reckon it might. Ah, then that is it. Terry bungled and paid the penalty. That's what they said. Ramon got a slight shock, sufficient to frighten him. Yeah. He had a weak heart, and there was a burn on his hand. Shh. And we found some sparrows dead in the street, Mr God. Miller. Never accounted for those, we didn't. God. That's it. That's how they did it. Sir, sir. Gillespie? Uh, sir, we got a break, sir. They, they, they found a place in Carnaby Street where these four just men seem to have stayed. Oh, yes. Yes, sir. And, and the idiots have left some evidence, too, by all accounts. We found the counterfoil of a passage ticket to America, sir, on the Lucania. And the ship's still at sea. Well, so they're bound to be caught. Really, Gillespie? Really? Oh. oh. That is, unless you think it's a decoy, sir. I shall be very surprised if it's not, young man. No, we've not caught up with the four just men, I'm afraid. Not yet. And we've not heard the last of them, either. So, that was my first big story. The story of the four just men. Who made a promise and kept it. Who vowed to kill and killed. And no one knew how they could possibly do it until it was too late. That was the second and final part of The Four Just Men by Edgar Wallace, adapted for radio by Colin Davis. Carter, the reporter, was played by Mark Straker, and Sir Philip Ramon by Geoffrey Whitehead. The four just men were Manfred, David March, Poincar, David King, Gonzales, Donald G, and Terry, John Bull. Henry Stamper was Detective Superintendent Falmouth, Ken Cumberledge, the Commissioner, Christopher Scott, the Editor, Danny Schiller, Billy Marks, and Charles Simpson, Baines and Gillespie. Other parts were played by members of the cast. Technical presentation was by Keith Perrin.